Chapter One of the Stones of Venice, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pablo Gonzalez. The Stones of Venice, Volume Two, by John Ruskin. The Frame. In the olden days of travelling, now to return no more in which distance could not be vanquished with that toll, but in which that toll was rewarded, partly by the power of deliberate survey of the countries through which the journey lay, and partly by the happiness of the evening hours, when, from the top of the last hill he had surmounted, the traveller beheld the quiet village where he was to rest, scattered among the meadows beside its valley stream, all from the long hoped for turn, in the dusty perspective of the causeway, saw for the first time the towers of some famed city faint in the rays of sunset hours of peaceful and thoughtful pleasure for which the rush of the arrival in the railway station is perhaps not to always or to all men an equivalent in those days i say when there was something more to be anticipated and remembered in the first aspect of each successive halting place than the new arrangement of glass roofing and iron girder there were few moments at which the recollection was more fondly cherished by the traveller than that which, as I endeavoured to describe in the close of the last chapter, brought him within sight of Venice, as his gondola shot into the open lagoon from the canal of Mestre. Not but that the aspect of the city itself was generally the source of some slight disappointment, for, seen in this direction, its buildings are far less characteristic than those of other great towns of Italy, but of this inferiority was partly disguised by distance and more than atoned for by the strange rising of its walls and towers of the midst as it seemed of the deep sea for it was impossible that the mind of the eye could at once comprehend the shallowness of the vast sheet of water which stretched away in leagues of rippling lustre to the north and south or traced a narrow line of violets bounding it to the east the salt breeze the white moaning sea-beds the masses of black weed separating and disappearing gradually in knots of heaving shoal under the advance of the steady tide all proclaimed it to be indeed the ocean in whose bosom the great city rested so calmly not such blue soft lake like ocean as bathes the near port and promontories or sleeps beneath the marble rocks of genoa but a sea with the bleak power of our own northern waves yet subdued into a strange spacious rest and changed from his angry parlour into a field of burnished gold as the sun declined behind the belfry tower at the lonely island church fitly named st george the seaweed as the boat drew nearer to the city the coast which the traveller had just left sank behind him into a long low set coloured line tufted irregularly with brushwood and willows but i will see him its northern extremity the hills of aqua rose in a dark cluster of purple pyramids balance on the bright mirage of the lagoon two or three smooth surges of inferior hills extended themselves about the roots and beyond this beginning with the craggy peaks of Vicenza, and the chain the chain of the alps scattered the whole horizon to the north a wall of jagged blue he and there, showing for its cliffs a wilderness of misty precipices, fading far back into the recesses of Cadore, and is still rising and breaking away eastward, where the sun struck opposite upon its snow into mighty fragments of peaked light, standing up behind the barred clouds of evening, one after another, countless, the crown of the Aegean Sea, until the eye turned back from pursuing them to rest upon the nearer burning of the campaniles of Morano, and all the great city re magnified himself along the waves as the quick sound pacing of the gondola drew nearer and nearer and at last when its walls were reached and the utmost of its untrodden streets was entered not through towered gates or guarded ramparts but as a deep inlet between two rocks of coral in the indian sea when first upon a traveller's side opened the long ranges of column palaces each with its black boat moored at the portal, each with its image cast down beneath its feet, upon that green pavement which every breeze, 
broke into new fantasies of rich tessellation. When first, at the extremity of bright vista, the shadowy Rialto threw its colossal curves slowly forth from behind the palace of Camerlinghi. That strange curve, so delicate, so adamantine, strong as a mountain cavern, graceful as a bow which is bent, when first, before its mullah circumference was all risen, before its mullah circumference was all risen, the gondolier's cry. Ah, Stanley, struck sharp upon the ear, and the proud turned aside under the mighty cornices that half met over the narrow canal, with the plash of the water followed close and loud, ringing along the marble by the boat's side, and when at last the boat does it fall upon the breath of the silver sea, across which the floor of the ducal canal, flush with its sanguine veins, licks to the snowy dim of our lady of salvation. It was no marvel that the mind should be so deeply entranced with a visionary charm of a scene, so beautiful and so strange, as to forget the darker truth of its history and its being. Or might it seem that such a city had owed her existence rather to the right of the enchanter than the fear of the fugitive? that the waters which encircled her had been chosen for the mirror of her state, rather than the shelter of her nakedness, and that all which in nature was wild and merciless, time and decay, as well as the waves and tempests, had been worn to adorn her instead of destroy, and might still spare for ages to come that beauty which seemed to have fixed of its frame the sands of the hourglass as well as the sea. And although the last few eventful years fraught with change to the face of the whole earth, had been more fatal by the influence in Venice than five hundred that preceded them, though the noble landscape of page to her can now be seen no more, or seen only by glance, as the engine slackens its rushing to the iron line, and that many of her palaces are forever defaced, and many desecrated ruins, there is still so much of magic in her aspect, that to her a traveller, he must leave her before the wonder of that first aspect has been worn away, he shall be led to forget the humility of her origin, and to shut his eyes to the death of desolation. They, at least, a little to be envied, in whose hearts the great charities of imagination lie dead, and for whom the fancy has no power to repress the importunity of painful impressions, or to raise what is ignoble, and disguise what is discordant, in a scene so rich in his remembrances, so surpassing in his beauty, but for this work of the imagination there must be no permission during the task which is before us. The impotent feelings of romance, so singularly characteristic of this century, may indeed go, but never save the remains of those mightier ages to which they are attached like climbing flowers, and they must be torn away from the magnificent fragments if we would see them as she stood in their own strength. Those feelings, always as fruitless as they are formed, are in Venice, the tool incapable of protecting, but even of discerning the objects to which they ought to have been attached. The Venice of modern fiction and drama is a thing of yesterday, a more efflorescence of decay, a stage dream which the first day of daylight must dissipate into dust. No prisoner, whose name is worth remembering, but whose sorrow deserves sympathy, ever crossed the bridge of sight, which is the centre of the baronic ideal of Venice. No great imagination of Venice ever saw that Rialto, under which the traveller now passes to breathless interest. The statue that Byron makes Valiero address as one of his great ancestors was erected to a soldier of fortune a hundred and fifty years after Valiero's death, and the most conspicuous part of the city have been so entirely altered in the course of the last three centuries, that if Henry Dandolo or Francis Foscari could be summoned from the tombs, and stood each in the deck of his galley at the entrance of the Grand Canal, that renowned entrance, the painter's favourite subject, the novelist's favourite scene, where the water first narrows by the steps of the church of La Salute, the mighty doges who were not knowing what support of the world is stood allegedly not recognized when stones the great city, for whose sake, and by whose ingratitude, the grey hairs have been brought down with bitterness to the grave. The remains of the Venice lie hidden behind the cumbrous masses which were the delight of the nation in its dotage. 
hidden in many a grass-grown court and silent pathway and lightless canal where the slow waves have stepped the foundation for five hundred years and must soon prevail over them for ever it must be ever tasked to glean and gather them forth and restore out of him some faint image of the lost city more gorgeous a thousandfold than that which now exists yet not created in the day dreams the prince nor by the ostentation of the noble but built by iron hands and patient hearts contending against the adversity of nature and the fury of man so that its wonderfulness cannot be grasped by the indolence of imagination but only out of frank inquiry into the true nature of that wild and solitary scene whose restless ties and trembling sense did indeed shelter the birth of the city but long denied her dominion when the eye falls casually on the map of europe there is no feature by which it is more likely to be arrested than the strange sweeping route formed by the junction of the alps and the apennines and enclosing the great basin of lombardy this return of the mountain chain upon itself causes a vast difference in the character of distribution of its debris on opposite sides the rock fragments and sediments which the torrents on the north side of the alps bear into the plains distributed over a vast extent of country and though here and there lodged in beds of enormous thickness soon permit the firm substrata to appear from underneath them but all the torrents which descend from the southern side of the high alps and from the northern slope of the apennines meet concentrically in the recess of mountain bay which the two ridges enclose every fragment which thunder breaks out of the battlements and every grain of dust which in the summer rain washes from the pastures is at last laid at rest in the blue sea of lombardic plain and that plain must have risen with its rocky barriers as the cup fills the wine but for two contrary influences which continually depress or disperse from the surface the accumulation of the ruins of age i will not tax the reader's fate in modern science of insisting on the singular depression of the surface of lombardy which appears for many centuries to have taken place steadily and continually the main fact with which we have to do is the gradual transport by the Po and its great glacial rivers of as masses the finer sediment to the sea the character of the lombardic plains is most strikingly expressed by the ancient walls of its cities composed for the most part of large branded alpine pebbles alternating with narrow courses of brick and was curiously illustrated in eighteen forty eight by the ramparts of these same pebbles thrown at four or five feet high round every field to check the austrian cavalry into battle under the walls of verona the finer dust among which these pebbles are dispersed is taken up by the rivers fed into continual strength by the alpine snow so that however pure the waters may be when they issue from the lakes at the foot of the great chain they become the colour and opacity of clay before they reach the adriatic the sediment which they bear is at once thrown down as they enter the sea forming a vast belt of low land along the eastern coast of italy a powerful stream of war of course builds forward the fastest on each side of it in north and south there is a track of marsh fed by more feeble streams and less liable to rapid change in the delta of the central river in one of these tracks is built ravenna and in the other venice what circumstances directed a peculiar arrangement of this great belt of sediment in the earliest times it is not here the place to inquire it is enough for us to know that from the mouth of the adige to those of the piave the stretches as a variable distance of from three to five miles from the actual shore a bank of sand divided into long islands by narrow channels of sea the space between this bank and true shore consists the sedimentary deposits of these and other rivers a great plain of calcareous mud covered in the neighbourhood of venice by the sea at high water to the depth in most places of a foot or a foot and a half and nearly every rock exposed at low tide are divided by an intricate network of narrow and winding channels from which the sea never retires in some places according to the run of the currents the land has risen into marshy islets consolidated some by art and some by time into ground firm enough to be built upon or fruitful enough to be cultivated in others on the contrary it has not reached the sea level so that 
and the average low water shallow lakelets glitter among its irregular lakes paced fields of seaweed in the midst of the largest of these increased in importance by the confluence of several large river channels toward one of the openings in the sea bank the city of venice itself is built on a crowded cluster of islands the various spots of higher ground which appear to the northern side of this central cluster have at different periods been also thickly inhabited and now bear according to their size the remains of cities villages or isolated convents and churches scattered among spaces of open ground partly waste by encumbered by ruins partly under cultivation for the supply of the metropolis the average rise and fall of tide is about three feet varying considerably with the seasons but this fall and so flat ashore it is enough to cause continual movement in the waters and in the main canal to produce a reflux which frequently runs like a mill stream a high water no longer is visible for many miles to the north or south of venice except in the form of small islands crowned with towers or gleaming with villages there is a channel some three miles wide between the city and the mainland and some mile and a half wide between it and the sandy breakwater called the lido which divides the lagoon from the Adriatic, by which is so slow as hardly to disturb the impression of the city's having built in the midst of the ocean although the secret of its true position is partly yet not painfully betrayed by the clusters of piles set miles to the deep water channels which undulate far away in spotty chains like the studded bags of the huge sea snakes and rather quick glittering as the crests and crowded waves that flicker and dance before the strong winds upon the unlifted level of the shallow sea but the scene is rather different at low tide a fall of eighteen or twenty inches is enough to show ground over the greater part of the lagoon and at the complete ebb the city is seen standing in the midst of a dark plain of seaweed of gloomy green except only where the larger branches of Brenta and associated streams converge towards the port of the Lido. Through this salt and sombre plain of the gondola, and the fishing boat advanced by the tortuous channels, seldom more than four or five feet deep, and often so choked with slimes that the heavier kills furrow the bottom until the crossing tracks are seen through the clear sea water, like the reds upon a wintry road and the yaw leaves look gashes upon the ground at every stroke, or is entangled among the thick weed that fringes the banks with the weight of the sullen waves, leaning to and fro upon the uncertain sway of the exhausted tide. The scene is often like profoundly oppressive, and, even at this day, when the every plot of higher ground bears some fragment of fair building, but, in order to know what it was once, let the traveller follow in his boat at evening, the windings of some infrequented channel far into the midst of the melancholy plain let him remove in his imagination the brightness of great city that still extends itself in the distance and the walls and towers and the islands that are near and so wait until the bright investiture and sweet warmth the sunset are withdrawn from the waters and the black desert of the shore lies in the nakedness beneath the night pathless comfortless infirm lost in dark longer and fearful silence except where the salt runlets lash into the tireless balls and the sea-birds float from the margins with a questioning cry and he will be enabled to enter some sort into the horror of hearts with which this solitude is anciently chosen by man for his habitation though little thought who first drove the stakes into the sand and strew the ocean reeds for the rest tell the children that to be princes of that ocean and their palace is his pride and yet in the great natural laws that rule that sorrowful wilderness let it be remembered what strange preparation had been made for the things which no human imagination could have at all and how the whole existence and fortune of the venetian nation be anticipated or compelled by the setting of those bars and doors of the rivers and sea had deep occurrence divided the islands coastal navies would again and again have reduced the rising city to servitude had stronger surges beaten the shores all the richness and refinement of the venetian architecture must have been exchanged for the walls and bulwarks of an ordinary seaport had there been no tide as in other parts of the mediterranean the narrow canals of the city would have become noisome and the marsh in which it was built was different had the tide been only a foot or eighteen inches higher in its rise 
Lord's access to the doors of the palaces would have been impossible. Even as it is, there is sometimes a little difficulty at the yard, in landing without setting foot upon the lower and slippery steps, and the high strides sometimes enter the courtyards and overflow the entrance halls. Eighteen inches more difference between the level of the flood and ebb would have rendered the doorsteps of every palace at low water, and such as massive reeds and limpets, and the entire system of water carriage for the higher classes. In that easy and daily intercourse must have been done away with. The streets of the city would have been widened, its network of canals filled up, and all the peculiar character of the place and the people destroyed. The reader may perhaps have felt some pain in the contrast between this faithful view of the size of the Venetian frame, and the romantic conception of it, which we ordinarily form, but this pain, if he have felt it, ought to be more than counterbalanced by the value of the instance thus afforded to us at once of the inscrutable and the wisdom of the race of God. If two thousand years ago we have permitted to watch the slow settling of the slime of these turbid rivers into the polluted sea, and the gaining upon its deep and fresh waters is the lifeless, impassable, and voyageable plain. How little could we have understood the purpose with which these islands we shape out of the void, and the torpid waters enclosed with their desolate walls of sand? How little could we have known, any more than of what now seems to us most distressful, dark, and objectless? The glorious aim which was then in the mind of him in whose hand are all the corners of the earth. How to imagine that in the laws which were stretching forth the gloomy margins of these fruitless banks, and feeding the bitter grass among the shallows, there was indeed a preparation, and the only preparation possible with the founding of a city which was to be set like a golden cloth on the girdle of the earth, to write history, and white scrolls to sea surges, and to word it in the thunder, and to gather in good thought a moral pulsation, the glory of the west and of the east, from the burning heart of a fortitude and splendor. End of chapter one. The Frame. Recording by Pagons Alice in Cavita, Philippines. Chapter 2, Torcello of the Stones of Venice, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fanny. The Stones of Venice, Volume 2, by John Ruskin. Chapter 2, Torcello. Section 1. Seven miles to the north of Venice, the banks of sand which near the city rise little above low water mark, attain by degrees a higher level, and knit themselves at last into fields of salt morass, raised here and there into shapeless mounds, and intercepted by narrow creeks of sea. One of the feeblest of these inlets, after winding for some time among buried fragments of masonry and knots of sunburnt weeds, whitened with webs of fucus, stays itself in an utterly stagnant pool beside a plot of greener grass covered with ground ivy and violets. On this mount is built a rude brick campanile of the commonest Lombardic type, which, if we ascend towards evening, and there are none to hinder us, the door of its ruinous staircase swinging idly on its hinges, we may command from it one of the most notable scenes in this wide world of ours. Far as the eye can reach, a waste of wild sea moor of a lurid ashen grey, not like our northern moors with their jet black pools and purple peaths, but lifeless, the colour of sackcloth with the corrupted sea water soaking through the roots of its acrid weeds and gleaming hither and thither through its snaky channels. No gathering of fantastic mists, nor coursing of clouds across it, but melancholy clearness of space in the warm sunset, oppressive, reaching to the horizon of its level gloom. To the very horizon on the northeast, but to the north and west, there is a blue line of higher land along the border of it and above this 
but farther back a misty band of mountains touched with snow. To the east, the paleness and roar of the Adriatic, louder at momentary intervals as the surf breaks on the bars of sand. To the south, the widening branches of the calm lagoon, alternately purple and pale green, as they reflect the evening clouds or twilight sky. And almost beneath our feet, on the same field which sustains the tower we gaze from, a group of four buildings, two of them little larger than cottages, though built of stone and one adorned by a quaint belfry, the third an octagonal chapel, of which we can see but little more than the flat red roof with its red tiling, the fourth a considerable church with nave and aisles, but of which, in like manner, we can see little but the long central ridge and lateral slopes of roof, which the sunlight separates in one glowing mass from the green field beneath and grey moor beyond. There are no living creatures near the buildings, nor any vestige of village or city round about them. They lie like a little company of ships becalmed on a faraway sea. Section 2. Then look farther to the south, beyond the widening branches of the lagoon, and rising out of the bright lake into which they gather, there are a multitude of towers, dark and scattered among square-set shapes of clustered palaces, a long and irregular line fretting the southern sky. Mother and daughter, you behold them both in their widowhood, Torcello and Venice. Thirteen hundred years ago, the grey moorland looked as it does this day, and the purple mountains stood as radiantly in the deep distances of evening. But on the line of the horizon there were strange fires mixed with the light of sunset, and the lament of many human voices mixed with the fretting of the waves on the ridges of sand. The flames rose from the ruins of Altinum, the lament from the multitude of its people seeking like Israel of old a refuge from the sword in the paths of the sea. The cattle are feeding and resting upon the site of the city that they left. The moors' scythe swept this day at dawn over the chief street of the city that they built, and the swaths of soft grass are now sending up their scent into the night air, the only incense that fills the temple of their ancient worship. Let us go down into that little space of meadowland. Section 3. The inlet which runs nearest to the base of the Campanile is not that by which Torcello is commonly approached. Another, somewhat broader and overhung by alder cups, winds out of the main channel of the lagoon up to the very edge of the little meadow which was once the piazza of the city, and there, stayed by a few grey stones which present some semblance of a key, forms its boundary at one extremity. Hardly larger than an ordinary English farmyard, and roughly enclosed on each side by broken palings and hedges of honeysuckle and briar, the narrow field retires from the water's edge, traversed by a scarcely traceable footpath, for some forty or fifty paces, and then expanding into the form of a small square with buildings on three sides of it, the fourth being that which opens to the water. Two of these, that on our left and that in front of us, as we approach from the canal, are so small that they might well be taken for the outhouses of the farm, though the first is a conventual building, and the other aspires to the title of the Palazzo Publico, both dating as far back as the beginning of the 14th century. The third, the octagonal church of Santa Fosca, is far more ancient than either, yet hardly on a larger scale. Though the pillars of the portico which surrounds it are of pure Greek marble, and their capitals are enriched with delicate sculpture, they and the arches they sustain, together only raise the roof to the height of a cattle shed. And the first strong impression which the spectator receives from the whole scene is that whatever scene it may have been which has on this spot been visited with so utter a desolation, it could not at least have been ambition. Nor will this impression be diminished as we approach or enter the larger church to which the whole group of building is subordinate. It has evidently been built by men in flight and distress, who sought in the hairy direction of their island church 
such a shelter for their earnest and sorrowful worship as on the one hand could not attract the eyes of their enemies by its splendor and yet on the other might not awaken too bitter feelings by its contrast with the church which they had seen destroyed footnote date of the duomo of torcello the first flight to the lagoons for shelter was caused by the invasion of attila in the fifth century so that in endeavouring to throw back the thought of the reader to the former solitude of the islands i spoke of them as they must have appeared one thousand three hundred years ago altinum however was not finally destroyed till the lombard invasion in six hundred forty one when the episcopal seat was removed to torcello and the inhabitants of the mainland city giving up all hope of returning to their former homes built their duomo there it is a disputed point among venetian antiquarians whether the present church be that which was built in the seventh century partially restored in one thousand eight or whether the words of sagornino ecclesiam iam vetustate consumptam recreare justify them in assuming an entire rebuilding of the fabric i quite agree with the marchese selvatico in believing the present church to be the earlier building variously strengthened refitted and modified by subsequent care but in all its main features preserving its original aspect except perhaps in the case of the pulpit and chancel screen which if the chevalier Bonson's conclusion respecting early pulpits in the roman basilicas be correct may possibly have been placed in their present position in the tenth century and the fragmentary character of the workmanship of the latter noticed in sections ten and eleven would in that case have been the result of innovation rather than of haste the question however whether they are of the seventh or eleventh century does not in the least affect our conclusions drawn from the design of these portions of the church respecting pulpits in general End footnote. there is visible everywhere a simple and tender effort to recover some of the form of the temples which they had loved and to do honour to god by that which they were erecting while distress and humiliation prevented the desire and prudence precluded the admission either of luxury of ornament or magnificence of plan the exterior is absolutely devoid of decoration with the exception only of the western entrance and the lateral door of which the former has carved side posts and architrave and the latter crosses of rich sculpture while the massy stone shutters of the windows turning on huge rings of stone which answer the double purpose of stanchions and brackets cause the whole building rather to resemble a refuge from alpine storm than the cathedral of a populous city and internally the two solemn mosaics of the eastern and western extremities one representing the last judgment the other the madonna her tears falling as her hands are raised to bless and the noble range of pillars which enclose the space between terminated by the high throne for the pastor and the semicircular raised seats for the superior clergy are expressive at once of the deep sorrow and the sacred courage of men who had no home left them upon earth but who looked for one to come of men persecuted but not forsaken cast down but not destroyed section four i am not aware of any other early church in italy which has this peculiar expression in so marked a degree and it is so consistent with all that christian architecture ought to express in every age for the actual condition of the exiles who built the cathedral of torcello is exactly typical of the spiritual condition which every christian ought to recognize in himself a state of homelessness on earth except so far as he can make the most high his habitation that i would rather fix the mind of the reader on this general character than on the separate details however interesting of the architecture itself i shall therefore examine these only so far as is necessary to give a clear idea of the means by which the peculiar expression of the building is attained section five on the opposite page the uppermost figure one is a rude plan of the church i do not answer for the thickness and external disposition of the walls which are not to our present purpose 
and which I have not carefully examined, but the interior arrangement is given with sufficient accuracy. The church is built on the usual plan of the basilica, that is to say, its body divided into a nave and aisles by two rows of massive shafts, the roof of the nave being raised high above the aisles by walls sustained on two ranks of pillars and pierced with small arched windows. Footnote. For a full account of the form and symbolical meaning of the basilica, see Lord Lindsay's Christian Art, Volume 1, page 12. It is much to be regretted that the Chevalier Bonson's work on the Basilicas of Rome is not translated into English. End footnote. At Torcello the aisles are also lighted in the same manner, and the nave is nearly twice their breadth. Footnote. The entire breadth of the church within the walls is 70 feet, of which the square bases of the pillars, 3 feet on each side, occupy 6 feet and the nave from base to base measures 31 feet 1 inch. The aisles from base to wall 16 feet odd inches, not accurately ascertainable on account of the modern wainscot fittings. The intervals between the bases of the pillars are 8 feet each, increasing towards the altar to 8 feet 3 inches in order to allow for a corresponding diminution in the diameter of the bases from 3 feet to 2 feet 11 inches or 2 feet 10 inches. This subtle diminution of the bases is in order to prevent the eye from feeling the greater narrowness of the shafts in that part of the nave, their average circumference being 6 feet 10 inches and one, the second on the north side, reaching seven feet, while those at the upper end of the nave vary from six feet eight inches to six feet four inches. It is probable that this diminution in the more distant pillars adds slightly to the perspective effect of length in the body of the church, as it is seen from the great entrance. But whether this was the intention or not, the delicate adaptation of this diminished base to the diminished shaft is a piece of fastidiousness in proportion which I rejoice in having detected, and this the more because the rude contours of the bases themselves would little induce a spectator to anticipate any such refinement. End footnote. The capitals of all the great shafts are of white marble, and are among the best I have ever seen as examples of perfectly calculated effect from every touch of the chisel. Mr. Hope calls them indifferently imitated from the Corinthian. Footnote. Hope's Historical Essay on Architecture, 3rd edition, 1840. Chapter 9, page 95. In other respects, Mr. Hope has done justice to this building and to the style of the early Christian churches in general. End footnote. But the expression is as inaccurate as it is unjust. Every one of them is different in design, and their variations are as graceful as they are fanciful. I could not expect by an elaborate drawing give any idea of the sharp, dark, deep penetrations of the chisel into their snowy marble, but a single example is given in the opposite plate figure 1 of the nature of the changes effected in them from the Corinthian type. In this capital, although a kind of acanthus, only with rounded lobes, is indeed used for the upper range of leaves, the lower range is not acanthus at all, but a kind of vine, or at least that species of plant which stands for vine in all early Lombardic and Byzantine work. The leaves are trefoiled and the stalks cut clear, so that they might be grasped with a hand and cast sharp dark shadows perpetually changing across the bell of the capital behind them. I have drawn one of these vine plants, larger in figure two, that the reader may see how little imitation of the Corinthian there is in them, and how boldly the stems of the leaves are detached from the ground. But there is another circumstance in this ornament still more noticeable. The band which encircles the shaft beneath the spring of the leaves is copied from the common classical wreathed or braided fillet, of which the reader may see examples on almost every building of any pretensions in modern London. But the medieval builders could not be content with a dead and meaningless scroll. 
the Gothic energy and love of life mingled with the early Christian religious symbolism were struggling daily into more vigorous expression and they turned the wrist band into a serpent of three times the length necessary to undulate round the shaft which knotting itself into a triple chain shows at one side of the shaft its tail and head as if perpetually gliding round it beneath the stalks of the vines the vine as is well known was one of the early symbols of christ and the serpent is here typical either of the eternity of his dominion or of the satanic power subdued section six nor even when the builder confines himself to the acanthus leaf or to that representation of it hereafter to be more particularly examined constant in romanesque work can his imagination allow him to rest content with its accustomed position in a common corinthian capital the leaves nod forward only thrown out on every side from the bell which they surround but at the base of one of the capitals on the opposite side of the nave from this of the vines two leaves are introduced set with their sides outwards forming spirals by curling back half closed in the position shown in figure four in plate two featuring the acanthus of torcello there represented as in a real acanthus leaf for it will assist our future inquiries into the ornamentation of capitals that the reader should be acquainted with the form of the acanthus leaf itself i have drawn it therefore in the two positions figures three and four in plate two while figure five is the translation of the latter form into marble by the sculptor of torcello footnote a sketch has been given of this capital in my folio work and footnote it is not very like the acanthus but much liker than any greek work though still entirely conventional in its zinc foiled lobes but these are disposed with the most graceful freedom of line separated at the roots by deep drill holes which tell upon the eye far away like bits of jet and changed before they become too crowded to be effective into a vigorous and simple zigzag edge which saves the designer some embarrassment in the perspective of the terminating spiral but his feeling of nature was greater than his knowledge of perspective and it is delightful to see how he has rooted the whole leaf in the strong rounded under stem the indication of its closing with its face inwards and has thus given organization and elasticity to the lovely group of spiral lines a group of which even in the lifeless seashell we are never weary but which becomes yet more delightful when the ideas of elasticity and growth are joined to the sweet succession of its involution section seven it is not however to be expected that either the mute language of early christianity however important a part of the expression of the building at the time of its erection or the delicate fences of the gothic leafage springing into new life should be read or perceived by the passing traveller who has never been taught to expect anything in architecture except five orders yet he can hardly fail to be struck by the simplicity and dignity of the great shafts themselves by the frank diffusion of light which prevents their severity from becoming oppressive by the delicate forms and lovely carving of the pulpit and chancel screen and above all by the peculiar aspect of the eastern extremity of the church which instead of being withdrawn as in later cathedrals into a chapel dedicated to the virgin or contributing by the brilliancy of its windows to the splendor of the altar and theatrical effect of the ceremonies performed there is a simple and stern semicircular recess filled beneath by three ranks of seats raised one above the other for the bishop and presbyters that they might watch as well as guide the devotions of the people and discharge literally in the daily service the functions of bishops or overseers of the flock of god section eight let us consider a little each of these characters in succession and first for of the shafts enough has been said already what is very peculiar to this church its luminousness 
This perhaps strikes the traveller more from its contrast with the excessive gloom of the church of St. Mark's, but it is remarkable when we compare the cathedral of Torcello with any of the contemporary basilicas in South Italy or Lombardic churches in the north. St. Tabrogi at Milan, St. Michele at Pavia, St. Zeno at Verona, St. Frediano at Luca, St. Mignato at Florence, are all like sepulchral caverns compared with Torcello, where the slightest details of the sculptures and mosaics are visible, even when twilight is deepening. And there is something especially touching in our finding the sunshine thus freely admitted into a church built by men in sorrow. They did not need the darkness. They could not perhaps bear it. There was fear and depression upon them enough without a material gloom. They sought for comfort in their religion for tangible hopes and promises, not for threatenings or mysteries. And though the subjects chosen for the mosaics on the walls are of the most solemn character, there are no artificial shadows cast upon them, nor dark colors used in them. All is fair and bright, and intended evidently to be regarded in hopefulness and not with terror. Section 9 For observe this choice of subjects. It is indeed possible that the walls of the nave and aisles, which are now whitewashed, may have been covered with fresco or mosaic, and thus have supplied a series of subjects on the choice of which we cannot speculate. I do not, however, find a record of the destruction of any such works, and I am rather inclined to believe that at any rate the central division of the building was originally decorated, as it is now, simply by mosaics representing Christ, the Virgin, and the Apostles at one extremity, and Christ coming to judgment at the other. And if so, I repeat, observe the significance of this choice. Most other early churches are covered with imagery sufficiently suggestive of the vivid interest of the builders in the history and occupations of the world. Symbols or representations of political events, portraits of living persons and sculptures of satirical, grotesque or trivial subjects are of constant occurrence, mingled with the more strictly appointed representations of scriptural or ecclesiastical history. But at Orcello even these usual and one should have thought almost necessary successions of Bible events do not appear. The mind of the worshipper was fixed entirely upon two great facts. To him the most precious of all facts, the present mercy of Christ to his church and his future coming to judge the world. That Christ's mercy was at this period supposed chiefly to be attainable through the pleading of the Virgin and that therefore beneath the figure of the Redeemer is seen that of the weeping Madonna in the act of intercession may indeed be matter of sorrow to the Protestant beholder but ought not to blind him to the earnestness and singleness of the faith with which these men sought their sea solitudes, not in hope of founding new dynasties or entering upon new epochs of prosperity, but only to humble themselves before God and to pray that in his infinite mercy he would hasten the time when the sea should give up the dead which were in it, and death and hell give up the dead which were in them, and when they might enter into the better kingdom where the wicked cease from troubling and the weary are at rest. Section 10 nor were the strength and elasticity of their minds even in the least matters diminished by thus looking forward to the close of all things on the contrary nothing is more remarkable than the finishing beauty of all the portions of the building which seem to have been actually executed for the place they occupy in the present structure the rudest are those which they brought with them from the mainland the best and most beautiful those which appear to have been carved for their island church. Of these the new capitals already noticed, and the exquisite panel ornaments of the chancel screen are the most conspicuous. The latter form a low wall across the church, between the six small shafts whose places are seen in the plan, and serve to enclose a space raised two steps above the level of the nave, destined for the singers and indicated also in the plan by an open line a b c d the best reliefs on this low screen are groups of peacocks and lions 
two face to face on each panel rich and fantastic beyond description though not expressive of very accurate knowledge either of leonine or pavonine forms and it is not until we pass to the back of the stair of the pulpit which is connected with the northern extremity of this screen that we find evidence of the haste with which the church was constructed section eleven the pulpit however is not among the least noticeable of its features it is sustained on the four small detached shafts marked at p in the plan between the two pillars at the north side of the screen both pillars and pulpits studiously plain while the staircase which ascends to it is a compact mass of masonry shaded in the plan faced by carved slabs of marble the parapet of the staircase being also formed of solid blocks like paving stones lightened by rich but not deep exterior carving now these blocks or at least those which adorn the staircase towards the aisle have been brought from the mainland and being of size and shape not easily to be adjusted to the proportions of the stair the architect has cut out of them pieces of the size he needed utterly regardless of the subject of symmetry of the original design the pulpit is not the only place where this rough procedure has been permitted at the lateral door of the church are two crosses cut out of slabs of marble formerly covered with rich sculpture over their whole surfaces of which portions are left on the surface of the crosses the lines of the original design being of course just as arbitrarily cut by the incisions between the arms as the patterns upon a piece of silk which has been shaped anew the fact is that in all early romanesque work large surfaces are covered with sculpture for the sake of enrichment only sculpture which indeed had always meaning because it was easier for the sculptor to work with some chain of thought to guide his chisel than without any but it was not always intended or at least not always hoped that this chain of thought might be traced by the spectator all that was proposed appears to have been the enrichment of surface so as to make it delightful to the eye and this being once understood a decorated piece of marble became to the architect just what a piece of lace or embroidery is to a dressmaker who takes of it such portions as she may require with little regard to the places where the patterns are divided and though it may appear at first sight that the procedure is indicative of bluntness and rudeness of feeling we may perceive upon reflection that it may also indicate the redundance of power of which sets little price upon its own exertion when a barbarous nation builds its fortress walls out of fragments of the refined architecture it has overthrown we can read nothing by its savageness in the vestiges of art which may thus chance to have been preserved but when the new work is equal if not superior in execution to the pieces of the older art which are associated with it we may justly conclude that the rough treatment to which the latter have been subjected is rather a sign of the hope of doing better things than of want of feeling for those already accomplished and in general this careless fitting of ornament is in very truth an evidence of life in the school of builders and of their making a due distinction between work which is to be used for architectural effect and work which is to possess an abstract perfection and it commonly shows also that the exertion of design is so easy to them and their fertility so inexhaustible that they feel no remorse in using somewhat injuriously what they can replace with so slight an effort section twelve it appears however questionable in the present instance whether if the marbles had not been carved to his hand the architect would have taken the trouble to enrich them for the execution of the rest of the pulpit is studiously simple and it is in this respect that its design possesses it seems to me an interest to the religious spectator greater than he will take in any other portion of the building it is supported as i said on a group of four slender shafts itself of a slightly oval form extending nearly from one pillar of the nave to the next so as to give the preacher free room for the action of the entire person which always gives an unaffected impressiveness to the eloquence of the southern nations in the centre of its curved front a small bracket and detached shaft sustained the projection of a narrow marble desk 
occupying the place of a cushion in a modern pulpit which is hollowed out into a shallow curve on the upper surface leaving a ledge at the bottom of the slab so that the book laid upon it or rather into it settles itself there opening as if by instinct but without the least chance of slipping to the side or in any way moving beneath the preacher's hands footnote there is no character of an ordinary modern english church which appears to me more to be regretted than the peculiar pompousness of the furniture of the pulpits contrasted as it generally is with great meagerness and absence of color in the other portions of the church a pompousness besides altogether without grace or meaning and dependent merely on certain applications of upholstery which curiously enough are always in worse taste than even those of our drawing-rooms nor do i understand how our congregations can endure the aspect of the wooden sounding-board attached only by one point of its circumference to an upright pillar behind the preacher and looking as if the weight of its enormous leverage must infallibly before the sermon is concluded tear it from its support and bring it down upon the preacher's head these errors in taste and feeling will however i believe be gradually amended as more gothic churches are built but the question of the position of the pulpit presents a more disputable ground of discussion i can perfectly sympathize with the feeling of those who wish the eastern extremity of the church to form a kind of holy place for the communion table nor have i often received a more painful impression than on seeing the preacher at the scott church in george street potman square taking possession of a perfect apse and occupying therein during the course of the service very nearly the same position which the figure of christ does in that of the cathedral of pisa but i nevertheless believe that the scotch congregation are perfectly right and have restored the real arrangement of the primitive churches the chevalier bonson informed me very lately that in all the early basilicas he has examined the lateral pulpits are of more recent date than the rest of the building that he knows of not placed in the position which they now occupy both in the basilicas and gothic cathedrals before the ninth century and that there can be no doubt that the bishop always preached or exhorted in the primitive times from his throne in the centre of the apse the altar being always set at the centre of the church in the crossing of the transepts his excellency found by experiment in santa maria maggiore the largest of the roman basilicas that the voice could be heard more plainly from the centre of the apse than from any other spot in the whole church and if this be so it will be another very important reason for the adoption of the romanesque or norman architecture in our churches rather than of the gothic the reader will find some farther notice of this question in the concluding chapter of the third volume before leaving this subject however i must be permitted to say one word to those members of the scotch church who are severe in their requirement of the nominal or apparent extemporization of all addresses delivered from the pulpit whether they do right in giving those among their ministers who cannot preach extempore the additional and useless labor of committing their sermons to memory may be a disputed question but it can hardly be so that the now not unfrequent habit of making a desk of the bible and reading the sermon stealthily by slipping the sheets of it between the sacred leaves so that the preacher consults his own notes on pretense of consulting the scriptures is a very unseemly consequence of their over strictness End footnote. six balls or rather almonds of purple marble veined with white are set round the edge of the pulpit and form its only decoration perfectly graceful but severe and almost cold in its simplicity built for permanence and service so that no single member no stone of it could be spared and yet all are firm and uninjured as when they were first set together it stands in venerable contrast both with the fantastic pulpits of medieval cathedrals and with the rich furniture of those of our modern churches it is worth while pausing for a moment to consider how far the manner of decorating a pulpit may have influence on the efficiency of its service 
and whether our modern treatment of this to us all-important feature of a church be the best possible. Section 13. When the sermon is good, we need not much concern ourselves about the form of the pulpit, but sermons cannot always be good, and I believe that the temper in which the congregation set themselves to listen may be in some degree modified by their perception of fitness or unfitness, impressiveness or vulgarity, in the disposition of the place appointed for the speaker, not to the same degree but somewhat in the same way, that they may be influenced by his own gestures or expression, irrespective of the sense of what he says. I believe, therefore, in the first place, that pulpits ought never to be highly decorated. The speaker is apt to look mean or diminutive if the pulpit is either on a very large scale or covered with splendid ornament, and if the interest of the sermon should flag, the mind is instantly tempted to wander. I have observed that in almost all cathedrals, when the pulpits are peculiarly magnificent, sermons are not often preached from them, but rather and especially for any important purpose from some temporary erection in other parts of the building. And though this may often be done because the architect has consulted the effect upon the eye more than the convenience of the ear in the placing of his larger pulpit, I think it also proceeds in some measure from a natural dislike in the preacher to match himself with the magnificence of the rostrum, lest the sermon should not be thought worthy of the place. Yet this will rather hold of the colossal sculptures and pyramids of fantastic tracery which encumber the pulpits of Flemish and German churches than of the delicate mosaics and ivory-like carving of the Romanesque basilicas, for when the form is kept simple, much loveliness of color and costliness of work may be introduced, and yet the speaker not be thrown into the shade by them. Section 14. But in the second place, whatever ornaments we admit, ought clearly to be of a chaste, grave, and noble kind, and what virtue we employ, evidently more for the honoring of God's word than for the ease of the preacher. For there are two ways of regarding a sermon, either as a human composition or a divine message. If we look upon it entirely as a first and require our clergymen to finish it with their utmost care and learning, for our better delight whether of ear or intellect, we shall necessarily be led to expect much formality and stateliness in its delivery, and to think that all is not well if the pulpit have not a golden fringe round it and a goodly cushion in front of it, and if the sermon be not fairly written in a black book, to be smoothed upon the cushion in a majestic manner before beginning. All this we shall duly come to expect, but we shall at the same time consider the treatise thus prepared as something to which it is our duty to listen without restlessness for half an hour or three quarters, but which, when that duty has been decorously performed, we may dismiss from our minds in happy confidence of being provided with another when next it shall be necessary. But if once we begin to regard the preacher, whatever his fault, as a man sent with a message to us, which it is a matter of life or death whether we hear or refuse, if we look upon him as set in charge over many spirits in danger of ruin, and having allowed to him but an hour or two in the seven days to speak to them, if we make some endeavor to conceive how precious these hours ought to be to him, a small vantage on the side of God after his flock have been exposed for six days together to the full weight of the world's temptation, and he has been forced to watch the thorn and the thistle springing in their hearts, and to see what wheat had been scattered there snatched from the wayside by this wild bird and the other, and at last, when breathless and weary, with a week's labor, they give him this interval of imperfect and languid hearing, he has but thirty minutes to get at the separate hearts of a thousand men, to convince them of all their weakness, to shame them for all their sins, to warn them of all their dangers, to try by this way and that to stir the hard fastenings of those doors where the master himself has stood and knocked, yet none opened, and to call at the openings of those dark streets, where wisdom herself hath stretched forth her hands, and no man regarded, thirty minutes to raise the dead in, 
let us but once understand and feel this and we shall look with changed eyes upon that frippery of gay furniture about the place from which the message of judgment must be delivered which either breathes upon the dry bones that they may leave or if ineffectual remains recorded in condemnation perhaps against the utterer and listener alike but assuredly against one of them we shall not so easily bear with the silk and gold upon the seat of judgment nor with ornament of oratory in the mouth of the messenger we shall wish that his words may be simple even when they are sweetest and the place from which he speaks like a marble rock in the desert about which the people have gathered in their thirst section fifteen but the severity which is so marked in the pulpit at torcello is still more striking in the raised seats and episcopal throne which occupy the curve of the apse the arrangement at first somewhat recalls to the mind that of the roman amphitheatres the flight of steps which lead up to the central throne divides the curve of the continuous steps or seats it appears in the first three ranges questionable which were intended for they seem too high for the one and too low and close for the other exactly as in an amphitheatre the stairs for access intersect the sweeping ranges of seats but in the very rudeness of this arrangement and especially in the want of all appliances of comfort for the hall is of marble and the arms of the central throne are not for convenience but for distinction and to separate it more conspicuously from the undivided seats there is a dignity which no furniture of stalls nor carving of canopies ever could attain and well worth the contemplation of the protestant both as sternly significative of an episcopal authority which in the early days of the church was never disputed and as dependent for all its impressiveness on the utter absence of any expression either of pride or self-indulgence section sixteen but there is one more circumstance which we ought to remember as giving peculiar significance to the position which the episcopal throne occupies in this island church namely that in the minds of all early christians the church itself was most frequently symbolized under the image of a ship of which the bishop was the pilot consider the force which this symbol would assume in the imaginations of men to whom the spiritual church had become an ark of refuge in the midst of a destruction hardly less terrible than that from which the eight souls were saved of old a destruction in which the wrath of man had become as broad as the earth and as merciless as the sea and who saw the actual and literal edifice of the church raised up itself like an ark in the midst of the waters no marvel if with the surf of the adriatic rolling between them and the shores of their birth from which they were separated for ever they should have looked upon each other as the disciples did when the storm came down on the tiberius lake and have yielded ready and loving obedience to those who ruled them in his name who had there rebuked the winds and commanded stillness to the sea and if the stranger would yet learn in what spirit it was that the dominion of venice was begun and in what strength she went forth conquering and to conquer let him not seek to estimate the wealth of her arsenals or number of her armies nor look upon the pageantry of her palaces nor enter into the secrets of her councils but let him ascend the highest tier of the stern ledges that sweep round the altar of torcello and then looking as the pilot did of old along the marble ribs of the goodly temple ship let him repeople its faint deck with the shadows of its dead mariners and strive to feel in himself the strength of heart that was kindled within them when first after the pillars of it had settled in the sand and the roof of it had been closed against the angry sky that was still red and by the fires of their homesteads first within the shelter of its needed walls amidst the murmur of the waste of waves and the beating of the wings of the sea-birds round the rock that was strange to them rose that ancient hymn in the power of their gathered voices the sea is his and he made it and his hands prepared the dry land end of chapter two torcello of the stones of venice recording by fanny thessaloniki greece chapter three part one 
of the Stones of Venice, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Brown. The Stones of Venice, Volume 2 by John Ruskin. Chapter 3 Murano. 1. The decay of the city of Venice is in many respects like that of an outwearied and aged human frame. The cause of its decrepitude is indeed at the heart, but the outward appearances of it are first at the extremities. In the center of the city there are still places where some evidence of vitality remains, and where, with kind closing of the eyes to signs, too manifest even there, of distress and declining fortune, the stranger may succeed in imagining, for a little while, what must have been the aspect of Venice in her prime. But this lingering pulsation has not force enough any more to penetrate into the suburbs and outskirts of the city. The frost of death has there seized upon it irrevocably, and the grasp of mortal disease is marked daily by the increasing breadth of its belt of ruin. Nowhere is this seen more grievously than along the great northeastern boundary, once occupied by the smaller palaces of the Venetians, built for pleasure or repose, the nobler piles along the Grand Canal being reserved for the pomp and business of daily life. To such smaller palaces some garden ground was commonly attached, opening to the water side, and, in front of these villas and gardens, the lagoon was wont to be covered in the evening by gondolas. The space of it between this part of the city and the island group of Murano being to Venice, in her time of power, what its parks are to London. Only gondolas were used instead of carriages, and the crowd of the population did not come out till towards sunset, and prolonged their pleasures far into the night, company answering to company with alternate singing. 2. If, knowing this custom of the Venetians, and with a vision in his mind of summer palaces lining the shore, and myrtle gardens sloping to the sea, the traveller now seeks this suburb of Venice, he will be strangely and sadly surprised to find a new but perfectly desolate quay about a mile in length, extending from the arsenal to the Sacca della Misericordia, in front of a line of miserable houses built in the course of the last sixty or eighty years, yet already tottering to their ruin, and not less to find that the principal object in the view which these houses, built partly in front and partly on the ruins of the ancient palaces, now command is a dead brick wall, about a quarter of a mile across the water, interrupted only by a kind of white lodge, the cheerfulness of which prospect is not enhanced by its finding that this wall encloses the principal public cemetery of Venice. He may perhaps marvel for a few moments at the singular taste of the old Venetians in taking their pleasure under a churchyard wall, but on further inquiry he will find that the building on the island, like those on the shore, is recent, that it stands on the ruins of the church of saint cristoforo de la pace and that with a singular because unintended moral the modern venetians have replaced the peace of the christ-bearer by the peace of death and where they once went as the sun set daily to their pleasure now go as the sun sets to each of them for ever to their graves three yet the power of nature cannot be shortened by the folly nor her beauty altogether saddened by the misery of man. The broad tides still ebb and flow brightly about the island of the dead, and the linked conclave of the Alps know no decline from their old preeminence, nor stoop from their golden thrones in the circle of the horizon. So lovely is the scene still, in spite of all its injuries, that we shall find ourselves drawn there again and again at evening, 
out of the narrow canals and streets of the city to watch the wreaths of the sea mists weaving themselves like morning veils around the mountains far away and listen to the green waves as they fret and sigh along the cemetery shore for but it is morning now we have a hard day's work to do at murano and our boat shoots swiftly from beneath the last bridge of venice and brings us out into the open sea and sky the pure cumuli of cloud lie crowded and leaning against one another rank beyond rank far over the shining water each cut away at its foundation by a level line trenchant and clear till they sink to the horizon like a flight of marble steps except where the mountains meet them and are lost in them barred across by the grey terraces of those cloud foundations and reduced into one crestless bank of blue spotted here and there with strange flakes of wan aerial greenish light strewed upon them like snow and underneath is the long dark line of the mainland fringed with low trees and then the wide waving surface of the burnished lagoon trembling slowly and shaking out into forked bands of lengthening light the images of the towers of cloud above to the north there is first the great cemetery wall then the long stray buildings of murano and the island villages beyond glittering in intense crystalline vermilion like so much jewelry scattered on a mirror their towers poised apparently in the air a little above the horizon and their reflections as sharp and vivid and substantial as themselves thrown on the vacancy between them and the sea and thus the villages seem standing on the air and to the east there is a cluster of ships that seem sailing on the land for the sandy line of the lido stretches itself between us and them and we can see the tall white sails moving beyond it but not the sea only there is a sense of the great sea being indeed there and a solemn strength of gleaming light in sky above five the most discordant feature in the whole scene is the cloud which hovers above the glass furnaces of murano but this we may not regret as it is one of the last signs left of human exertion among the ruinous villages which surround us the silent gliding of the gondola brings it nearer to us every moment we pass the cemetery and a deep sea channel which separates it from murano and finally enter a narrow water street with a paved footpath on each side raised three or four feet above the canal and forming a kind of key between the water and the doors of the houses these latter are for the most part low but built with massy doors and windows of marble or istrian stone square set and barred with iron buildings evidently once of no mean order though now inhabited only by the poor here and there an ogee window of the fourteenth century or a doorway deeply enriched with cable mouldings shows itself in the midst of more ordinary features and several houses consisting of one story only carried on square pillars forming a short arcade along the quay have windows sustained on shafts of red verona marble of singular grace and delicacy all now in vain little care is there for their delicacy or grace among the rough fishermen sauntering on the quay with their jackets hanging loose from their shoulders jacket and cap and hair all of the same dark greenish sea gray but there is some life in the scene more than is usual in venice the women are sitting at their doors knitting busily and various workmen of the glass houses sifting glass dust upon the pavement and strange cries coming from one side of the canal to the other and ringing far along the crowded water from the vendors of figs and grapes and gourds and shellfish 
cries partly descriptive of the eatables in question, but interspersed with others of a character unintelligible in proportion to their violence. And fortunately so, if we may judge by a sentence, which is stenciled in black within a garland on the whitewashed walls of nearly every other house in the street, but which, how often soever written, no one seems to regard. Vestemme non più, laudate Gesù. 6. We push our way on between large barges laden with fresh water from Fusina in round white tubs seven feet across and complicated boats full of all manner of nets that look as if they could never be disentangled hanging from their masts and over their sides and presently pass under a bridge with the lion of st mark on his archivolt and another on a pillar at the end of the parapet a small red lion with much of the puppy in his face looking vacantly up into the air in passing we may note that instead of feathers his wings are covered with hair and in several other points the manner of his sculpture is not uninteresting presently the canal turns a little to the left and thereupon becomes more quiet the main bustle of the water street being usually confined to the first straight reach of it some quarter of a mile long the cheap side of murano we pass a considerable church on the left st pietro and a little square opposite to it with a few acacia trees and then find our boat suddenly seized by a strong green eddy and whirled into the tideway of one of the main channels of the lagoon which divides the town of murano into two parts by a deep stream some fifty yards over crossed only by one wooden bridge we let ourselves drift some way down the current looking at the low line of cottages on the other side of it hardly knowing if there be more cheerfulness or melancholy in the way the sunshine glows on their ruinous but whitewashed walls and sparkles on the rushing of the green water by the grass-grown quay it needs a strong stroke of the oar to bring us into the mouth of another quiet canal on the farther side of the tideway and we are still somewhat giddy when we run the head of the gondola into the sand on the left-hand side of this more sluggish stream and land under the east end of the church of san donato the matrice our mother church of murano seven it stands it and the heavy campanile detached from it a few yards in a small triangular field of somewhat fresher grass than is usual near venice traversed by a paved walk with green mosaic of short grass between the rude squares of its stones bounded on one side by ruinous garden walls on another by a line of low cottages on the third the base of the triangle by the shallow canal from which we have just landed near the point of the triangular space is a simple well bearing date fifteen o two in its widest part between the canal and campanile is a four-square hollow pillar each side formed by a separate slab of stone to which the iron hasps are still attached that once secured the venetian standard the cathedral itself occupies the northern angle of the field encumbered with modern buildings small outhouse like chapels and wastes of white wall with blank square windows and itself utterly defaced in the whole body of it nothing but the apse having been spared the original plan is only discoverable by careful examination and even then but partially the whole impression and effect of the building are irretrievably lost but the fragments of it are still most precious we must first briefly state what is known of its history eight the legends of the romish church though generally more insipid and less varied than those of paganism deserve audience from us on this ground if on no other that they have once been sincerely believed by good men and have had no ineffective agency in the foundation of the existent european mind 
the reader must not therefore accuse me of trifling when i record for him the first piece of information i have been able to collect respecting the cathedral of murano namely that the emperor otho the great being overtaken by a storm on the adriatic vowed if he were preserved to build and dedicate a church to the virgin in whatever place might be most pleasing to her that the storm thereupon abated and the virgin appearing to otho in a dream showed him covered with red lilies that very triangular field on which we were but now standing amidst the ragged weeds and shattered pavement the emperor obeyed the vision and the church was consecrated on the fifteenth of august nine fifty seven nine whatever degree of credence we may feel disposed to attach to this piece of history there is no question that a church was built on this spot before the close of the tenth century since in the year nine ninety nine we find the incumbent of the basilica note this word it is of some importance di santa maria plebania di murano taking an oath of obedience to the bishop of the altinat church and engaging at the same time to give the said bishop his dinner on the dominica in albis when the prelate held a confirmation in the mother church as it was then commonly called of murano from this period for more than a century i can find no records of any alterations made in the fabric of the church but there exist very full details of the quarrels which arose between its incumbents and those of san stefano san cipriano san salvatore and the other churches of murano touching the due obedience which their less numerous and less ancient brotherhoods owed to st mary's these differences seem to have been renewed at the election of every new abbot by each of the fraternities and must have been growing serious when the patriarch of grado henry dandolo interfered in eleven o two and in order to seal a peace between the two principal opponents ordered that the abbot of st stephen's should be present at the service in st mary's on the night of the epiphany and that the abbot of st mary's should visit him of st stephen's on st stephen's day and that then the two abbots should eat apples and drink good wine together in peace and charity ten but even this kindly effort seems to have been without result the irritated pride of the antagonists remained unsoothed by the love feast of st stephen's day and the breach continued to widen until the abbot of st mary's obtained a timely accession to his authority in the year eleven twenty five the doge domenico michele having in the second crusade secured such substantial advantages for the phoenicians as might well counterbalance the loss of part of their trade with the east crowned his successes by obtaining possession in cephalonia of the body of saint donato bishop of Eria which treasure he having presented on his return to the murano basilica that church was thenceforward called the church of saints mary and donato nor was the body of the saint its only acquisition saint donato's principal achievement had been the destruction of a terrible dragon in epirus michele brought home the bones of the dragon as well as of the saint the latter were put in a marble sarcophagus and the former hung up over the high altar. 11. But the clergy of San Stefano were indomitable. At the very moment when their adversaries had received this formidable accession of strength, they had the audacity ad onte de replicati giuramenti e dell'inveterata consuetudine to refuse to continue in the obedience which they had vowed to their mother church the matter was tried in a provincial council the votaries of st stephen were condemned and remained quiet for about twenty years in wholesome dread of the authority conferred on the abbot of st donate by the pope's legate to suspend any of the clergy of the island from their office if they 
refused submission. In 1172, however, they appealed to Pope Alexander III and were condemned again, and we find the struggle renewed at every promising opportunity. During the course of the twelfth and thirteenth centuries, until at last, finding St. Donate and the dragon together too strong for him, the abbot of St. Stefano discovered in his church the bodies of two hundred martyrs at once. A discovery, it is to be remembered, in some sort equivalent in those days to that of California in ours. The inscription, however, on the façade of the church recorded it with quiet dignity. Mille trecento setanta quattro adi quattordici di aprile furono trovati nella presente chiesa del protomartire San Stefano duecento e più corpi di santi martiri dal Venizi prete Matteo fratello Piovano della chiesa corner who gives this inscription which no longer exists goes on to explain with infinite gravity that the bodies in question being of infantile form and stature are reported by tradition to have belonged to those fortunate innocents who suffered martyrdom under king herod but that when or by whom the church was enriched with so vast a treasure is not manifested by any document twelve the issue of the struggle is not to our present purpose we have already arrived at the fourteenth century without finding record of any effort made by the clergy of st mary's to maintain their influence by restoring or beautifying their basilica which is the only point at present of importance to us that great alterations were made in it at the time of the acquisition of the body of san donato is however highly probable the mosaic pavement of the interior which bears its date inscribed eleven forty being probably the last of the additions. I believe that no part of the ancient church can be shown to be of more recent date than this, and I shall not occupy the reader's time by any inquiry respecting the epochs or authors of the destructive modern restorations. The wreck of the old fabric breaking out beneath them here and there is generally distinguishable from them at a glance, and it is enough for the reader to know that none of these truly ancient fragments can be assigned to a more recent date than 1140, and that some of them may with probability be looked upon as remains of the shell of the first church, erected in the course of the latter half of the tenth century. We shall perhaps obtain some further reason for this belief as we examine these remains themselves. 13. Of the body of the church, unhappily, they are few and obscure, but the general form and extent of the building, as shown in the plan, plate one, figure two, are determined first by the breadth of the uninjured east end d e, secondly by some remains of the original brickwork of the clear story, and in all probability of the side walls also, though these have been refaced and finally by the series of nave shafts which are still perfect the doors a and b may or may not be in their original positions there must of course have been always as now a principal entrance at the west end the ground plan is composed like that of torcello of nave and aisles only but the clear story has transepts extending as far as the outer wall of the aisles the semicircular apse thrown out in the center of the east end is now the chief feature of interest in the church, though the nave shafts and the eastern extremities of the aisles outside are also portions of the original building, the latter having been modernized in the interior. It cannot now be ascertained whether, as is probable, the aisles had once round ends as well as the choir. The spaces F, G form small chapels, of which G has a straight terminal wall behind its altar, and F a curved one, marked by the dotted line. The partitions which divide these chapels from the presbytery are also indicated by dotted lines, being modern work. 14. The plan is drawn carefully to scale. 
but the relation in which its proportions are disposed can hardly be appreciated by the eye. The width of the nave from shaft to opposite shaft is thirty-two feet eight inches, of the aisles from the shaft to the wall sixteen feet two inches, or allowing two inches for the thickness of the modern wainscot sixteen feet four inches, half the breadth of the nave exactly. The intervals between the shafts are exactly one-fourth of the width of the nave, or eight feet two inches, the distance between the great piers, which form the pseudo-transept, is twenty-four feet six inches, exactly three times the interval of the shafts. So the four distances are accurately in arithmetical proportion, that is, interval of shafts, eight feet two inches, width of aisle, sixteen feet four inches, width of transept, twenty-four feet six inches, width of nave, thirty-two feet eight inches. The shafts average five feet four inches in circumference, as near the base as they can be got at, being covered with wood, and the broadest sides of the main piers are four feet seven inches wide, their narrowest sides three feet six inches. The distance AC from the outermost angle of these piers to the beginning of the curve of the apse is twenty-five feet and from that point the apse is nearly semicircular, but it is so encumbered with Renaissance fittings that its form cannot be ascertained with perfect accuracy. It is roofed by a conca, or semi-dome, and the external arrangement of its walls provides for the security of this dome by what is, in fact, a system of buttresses as effective and definite as that of any of the northern churches although the buttresses are obtained entirely by adaptations of the Roman shaft and arch. The lower story being formed by a thick mass of wall, lightened by ordinary semicircular round-headed niches, like those used so extensively afterwards in Renaissance architecture, each niche flanked by a pair of shafts standing clear of the wall and bearing deeply molded arches, thrown over the niche. The wall with its pillars thus forms a series of massy buttresses, as seen in the ground plan, on top of which is an open gallery backed by a thinner wall, and roofed by arches whose shafts are set above the pairs of shafts below. On the heads of these arches rests the roof. We have, therefore, externally a heptagonal apse, roughly of rough and common brick, only with marble shafts and a few marble ornaments, but for that very reason all the more interesting, because it shows us what may be done and what was done with materials such as are now at our own command, and because in its proportions and in the use of the few ornaments it possesses, it displays a delicacy of feeling rendered doubly notable by the roughness of the work in which laws so subtle are observed and with which so thoughtful ornamentation is associated. 15. First, for its proportions, I shall have occasion in Chapter 5 to dwell at some length on the peculiar subtlety of the early Venetian perception for ratios of magnitude. The relations of the sides of this heptagonal apse supply one of the first and most curious instances of it. The proportions above given of the nave and aisles might have been dictated by a mere love of mathematical precision, but those of the apse could only have resulted from a true love of harmony. In figure 6, plate 1, the plan of this part of the church is given on a large scale, showing that its seven external sides are arranged on a line less than a semicircle, so that if the figure were completed, it would have sixteen sides, and it will be observed also that the seven sides are arranged in four magnitudes, the widest being the central one. 
the brickwork is so much worn away that the measures of the arches are not easily ascertainable but those of the plinth on which they stand which is nearly uninjured may be obtained accurately this plinth is indicated by the open line in the ground plan and its sides measure respectively first a b in plan six feet seven inches second b c seven feet seven inches third c d seven feet five inches fourth d e central seven feet ten inches fifth e f seven feet five inches sixth f g seven feet eight inches seventh g h six feet ten inches sixteen now observe what subtle feeling is indicated by this delicacy of proportion how fine must the perceptions of grace have been in those builders who could not be content without some change between the second and third the fifth and sixth terms of proportion such as should oppose the general direction of its cadence and yet were content with a diminution of two inches on a breadth of seven feet and a half for i do not suppose that the reader will think the curious lessening of the third and fifth arch a matter of accident and even if he did so i shall be able to prove to him hereafter that it was not but that the early builders were always desirous of obtaining some alternate proportion of this kind the relations of the numbers are not easily comprehended in the form of feet and inches but if we reduce the first four of them into inches and then subtract some constant number suppose seventy five from them all the remainders four sixteen fourteen nineteen will exhibit the ratio of proportion in a clearer though exaggerated form seventeen the pairs of circular spots at b c d etc on the ground plan figure six represent the bearing shafts which are all of solid marble as well as their capitals their measures and various other particulars respecting them are given in appendix six apse of murano here i only wished the reader to note the colouring of their capitals those of the two single shafts in the angles a h are both of deep purple marble the next two pairs b and g are of white marble the pairs c and f are of purple and d and e are of white thus alternating with each other on each side two white meeting in the centre now observe the purple capitals are all left plain the white are all sculptured for the old builders knew that by carving the purple capitals they would have injured them in two ways first they would have mixed a certain quantity of grey shadow with the surface hue and so adulterated the purity of the colour secondly they would have drawn away the thoughts from the colour and prevented the mind from fixing upon it or enjoying it by the degree of attention which the sculpture would have required so they left their purple capitals full broad masses of colour and sculptured the white ones which would otherwise have been devoid of interest eighteen but the feature which is most to be noted in this apse is a band of ornament which runs round it like a silver girdle composed of sharp wedges of marble preciously inlaid and set like jewels into the brickwork above it there is another band of triangular recesses in the bricks of nearly similar shape and it seems equally strange that all the marbles should have fallen from it or that it should have been originally destitute of them the reader may choose his hypothesis but there is quite enough left to interest us in the lower band which is fortunately left in its original state as is sufficiently proved by the curious niceties in the arrangement of its colours which are assuredly to be attributed to the care of the first builder a word or two in the first place respecting the means of colour at his disposal nineteen i stated that the building was for the most part composed of yellow brick this yellow is very nearly pure much more positive and somewhat darker than that of our english light brick 
and the material of the brick is very good and hard, looking in places almost vitrified and so compact as to resemble stone. Together with this brick occurs another of a deep full red and more porous substance, which is used for decoration chiefly, while all the parts requiring strength are composed of the yellow brick. Both these materials are cast into any shape and size the builder required, either into curved pieces for the arches or flat tiles for filling the triangles. And what is still more curious, the thickness of the yellow bricks used for the walls varies considerably, from two inches to four, and their length also, some of the larger pieces used in important positions being a foot and a half long. With these two kinds of brick, the builder employed five or six kinds of marble, pure white and white veined with purple, a brecciated marble of white and black, a brecciated marble of white and deep green, another deep red or nearly of the color of Egyptian porphyry, and a gray and black marble in fine layers. 20. The method of employing these materials will be understood at once by a reference to the opposite plate, plate 3, which represents two portions of the lower band. I could not succeed in expressing the variation and checkering of color in marble by real tints in the print, and have been content therefore to give them in line engraving. The different triangles are altogether of ten kinds. A. Pure white marble with sculptured surface, as the third and fifth in the upper series of plate three, b cast triangle of red brick with a sculptured round-headed piece of white marble inlaid as the first and seventh of the upper series plate three c a plain triangle of greenish black marble now perhaps considerably paler in color than when first employed as the second and sixth of the upper series of plate three d cast red brick triangle with a diamond inlaid of the above-mentioned black marble as the fourth in the upper series of plate three e cast white brick with an inlaid round-headed piece of marble variegated with black and yellow or white and violet not seen in the plate f occurs only once a green-veined marble forming the upper part of the triangle with a white piece below g only occurs once a brecciated marble of intense black and pure white the center of the lower range in plate three h sculptured white marble with a triangle of veined purple marble inserted is the first third fifth and seventh of the lower range in plate three i yellow or white marble veined with purple as the second and sixth of the lower range in plate three k pure purple marble not seen in this plate twenty one the band then composed of these triangles set close to each other in varied but not irregular relations is thrown like a necklace of precious stones round the apse and along the ends of the aisles each side of the apse taking of course as many triangles as its width permits if the reader will look back to the measures of the sides of the apse, given before, page 42, he will see that the first and seventh of the series, being much narrower than the rest, cannot take so many triangles in their band. Accordingly, they have only six each, while the other five sides have seven. Of these groups of seven triangles each, that used for the third and fifth sides of the apse is the uppermost in plate three and that used for the centre of the apse and of the whole series is the lowermost in the same plate the piece of black and white marble being used to emphasize the centre of the chain exactly as a painter would use a dark touch for a similar purpose twenty two and now with a little trouble we can set before the reader at a glance the arrangement of the groups along the entire extremity of the church. There are thirteen recesses, indicative of thirteen arches, seen in the ground plan, figure two, plate one. Of these, 
the second and twelfth arches rise higher than the rest so high as to break the decorated band and the groups of triangles we have to enumerate are therefore only eleven in number one above each of the eleven low arches and of these eleven the first and second tenth and eleventh are at the ends of the aisles while the third to the ninth inclusive go round the apse thus in the following table the numerals indicate the place of each entire group counting from the south to the north side of the church or from left to right and the letters indicate the species of triangle of which it is composed as described in the list given above six h i h g h i h five b c a d a c b seven b c a d a c b four b a b c a e a eight a e a c b a b three b a b e b a nine a b e b a b two a b c ten a b c b one a b c b a eleven b a c f a a the central group is first put that it may be seen how the series on the two sides of the apse answer each other it was a very curious freak to insert the triangle e in the outermost place but one of both the fourth and eighth sides of the apse and in the outermost but two in the third and ninth in neither case having any balance to it in its own group and the real balance being only affected on the other side of the apse which it is impossible that any one should see at the same time this is one of the curious pieces of system which so often occur in medieval work of which the key is now lost the groups at the ends of the transepts correspond neither in number nor arrangement we shall presently see why but must first examine more closely the treatment of the triangles themselves and the nature of the floral sculpture employed upon them twenty three as the scale of plate three is necessarily small i have given three of the sculptured triangles on the larger scale in plate four opposite figure three is one of the four in the lower series of plate four and figures four and five from another group the forms of the trefoils are here seen more clearly they and all other portions of the design are thrown out in low and flat relief the intermediate spaces being cut out to the depth of about a quarter of an inch i believe these vacant spaces were originally filled with a black composition which is used in similar structures at st mark's and of which i found some remains in an archivolt moulding here though not in the triangles the surface of the whole would then be perfectly smooth and the ornamental form relieved by a ground of dark gray but even though this ground is lost the simplicity of the method ensures the visibility of all its parts at the necessary distance seventeen or eighteen feet and the quaint trefoils have a crispness and freshness of effect which i found it almost impossible to render in a drawing nor let us fail to note in passing how strangely delightful to the human mind the trefoil always is we have it here repeated five or six hundred times in the space of a few yards and yet are never weary of it in fact there are two mystical feelings at the root of our enjoyment of this decoration the one is the love of trinity in unity the other that of the sense of fullness with order of every place being instantly filled and yet filled with propriety and ease the leaves do not push each other nor put themselves out of their own way and yet whenever there is a vacant space a leaf is always ready to step in and occupy it twenty four 
I said the trefoil was five or six hundred times repeated. It is so, but observe, it is hardly ever twice of the same size, and this law is studiously and resolutely observed in the carvings A and B of the upper series, plate three, the diminution of the leaves might indeed seem merely representative of the growth of the plant, but look at the lower. The triangles of inlaid purple marble are made much more nearly equilateral than those of white marble, into whose centers they are set, so that the leaves may continually diminish in size as the ornament descends at the sides. The reader may perhaps doubt the accuracy of the drawing on the smaller scale, but in that given larger, figure 3, plate 4, the angles are all measured, and the purposeful variation of width in the border therefore admits of no dispute. Remember how absolutely this principle is that of nature, the same leaf continually repeated, but never twice of the same size. Look at the clover under your feet, and then you will see what this Murano builder meant, and that he was not altogether a barbarian. End of chapter 3, part 1「Chapter 3, Murano, Part 2 of the Stones of Venice, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fanny. The Stones of Venice, Volume 2, by John Ruskin. Chapter 3, Murano, Part 2. Section 25. Another point I wish the reader to observe is the importance attached to color in the mind of the designer. Note especially, for it is of the highest importance to see how the great principles of art are carried out through the whole building, that as only the white capitals are sculptured below, only the white triangles are sculptured above. No color triangle is touched with sculpture. Note also that in the two principal groups of the apse, given in plate 3, featuring inlaid bands of Murano, the center of the group is color, not sculpture, and the eye is evidently intended to be drawn as much to the checkers of the stone as to the intricacies of the chiseling. It will be noticed also how much more precious the lower series which is central in the apse is rendered than the one above it in the plate which flanks it. There is no brick in the lower one, and three kinds of variegated marble are used in it, whereas the upper is composed of brick with black and white marble only, and lastly, for this is especially delightful, see how the workman made his chiseling finer where it was to go with the variegated marbles, and used a bolder pattern with a coarser brick and dark stone. The subtlety and perfection of artistical feeling in all this are so redundant that in the building itself the eye can rest upon this colored chain with the same kind of delight that it has in a piece of the embroidery of Paul Veronese. Section 26. Such being the construction of the lower band, that of the upper is remarkable only for the curious change in its proportions. The two are separated, as seen in the little woodcut here at the side, by a string course composed of two layers of red bricks, of which the uppermost projects as a cornice and is sustained by an intermediate course of irregular brackets obtained by setting the thick yellow bricks edgeways in the manner common to this day but the wall above is carried up perpendicularly from this projection so that the whole upper band is advanced to the thickness of a brick over the lower one the result of this is of course that each side of the apse is four or five inches broader above than below so that the same number of triangles which fill the whole side of the lower band leave an inch or two blank at each angle in the upper this would have looked awkward if there had been the least appearance of its being an accidental error, so that, in order to draw the eye to it and show that it is done on purpose, 
The upper triangles are made about two inches higher than the lower ones, so as to be much more acute in proportion and effect, and actually to look considerably narrower, though of the same width at the base. By this means they are made lighter in effect and subordinated to the richly decorated series of the lower band, and the two courses, instead of repeating, unite with each other and become a harmonious whole. In order, however, to make still more sure that this difference in the height of the triangles should not escape the eye, another course of plain bricks is added above their points, increasing the width of the band by another two inches. There are five courses of bricks in the lower band, and it measures one foot six inches in height. There are seven courses in the upper, of which six fall between the triangles, and it measures one foot ten inches in height, except at the extremity of the northern aisle, where for some mysterious reason the intermediate cornice is sloped upwards so as to reduce the upper triangles to the same height as those below. And here, finally, observe how determined the builder was that the one series should not be a mere imitation of the other. He could not now make them acute by additional height. So he here and here only narrowed their bases and we have seven of them above to six below. Section 27. We come now to the most interesting portion of the whole East End, the archivolt at the end of the Northern Nile. It was above stated that the band of triangles was broken by two higher arches at the ends of the aisles. That, however, on the northern side of the apse does not entirely interrupt, but lifts it, and thus forms a beautiful and curious archivolt drawn opposite in plate 5, featuring an archivolt in the Duomo of Murano. The upper band of triangles cannot rise together with the lower, as it would otherwise break the cornice prepared to receive the second story, and the curious zigzag with which its triangles die away against the sides of the arch, exactly as waves break upon the sand, is one of the most curious features in the structure. It will also be seen that there is a new feature in the treatment of the band itself when it turns the arch. Instead of leaving the bricks projecting between the sculptured or colored stones, reverse triangles of marble are used, inlaid to an equal depth with the others in the brickwork, but projecting beyond them so as to produce a sharp dark line of zigzag at their junctions. Three of these supplementary stones have unhappily fallen out, so that it is now impossible to determine the full harmony of color in which they were originally arranged. The central one, corresponding to the keystone in a common arch, is however most fortunately left with two lateral ones on the right hand and one on the left. Section 28 The keystone, if it may be so called, is of white marble, the lateral voussoirs of purple and these are the only colored stones in the whole building which are sculptured, but they are sculptured in a way which more satisfactorily proves that the principle above stated was understood by the builders than if they had been left blank. The object, observe, was to make the archivolt as rich as possible. Eight of the white sculptured marbles were used upon it in juxtaposition. Had the purple marbles been left altogether plain, they would have been out of harmony with the elaboration of the rest. It became necessary to touch them with sculpture as a mere sign of carefulness and finish, but at the same time destroying their colored surface as little as possible. The ornament is merely outlined upon them with a fine incision, as if it had been etched out on their surface preparatory to being carved. In two of them it is composed merely of three concentric lines, parallel with the sides of the triangle. In the third, it is a wreath of beautiful design, which I have drawn of larger size in figure 2, plate 5, featuring an archivolt in the Duomo of Murano, that the reader may see how completely the surface is left undestroyed by the delicate incisions of the chisel, and may compare the method of working with that employed on the white stones, two of which are given in that plate, figures 4 and 5. The keystone of which we have not yet spoken is the only white stone worked with a light incision. 
its design not being capable of the kind of workmanship given to the floral ornaments and requiring either to be carved in complete relief or left as we see it it is given at figure one of plate four featuring sculptures of murano the sun and moon on each side of the cross are as we shall see in the fifth chapter constantly employed on the keystones of byzantine arches section twenty nine we must not pass without notice the grey and green pieces of marble inserted at the flanks of the arch for observe there was a difficulty in getting the forms of the triangle into anything like reconciliation at this point and the medieval artist always delights in a difficulty instead of concealing it he boasts of it and just as we saw above that he directed the eye to the difficulty of filling the expanded sides of the upper band by elongating his triangles so here having to put in a piece of stone of awkward shape he makes that very stone the most conspicuous in the whole arch on both sides by using in one case a dark cold grey in the other a vigorous green opposed to the warm red and purple red and white of the stones above it and beside it the green and white piece on the right is of a marble as far as i know exceedingly rare i at first thought the white fragments were inlaid so sharply are they defined upon their ground they are indeed inlaid but i believe it is by nature and that the stone is a calcareous breccia of great mineralogical interest the white spots are of singular value in giving piquancy to the whole range of more delicate transitional hues above the effect of the whole is however generally injured by the loss of the three large triangles above i have no doubt they were purple like those which remain and that the whole arch was thus one zone of white relieved on a purple ground encircled by the scarlet cornices of brick and the whole cord of colour contrasted by the two precious fragments of grey and green at either side section thirty the two pieces of carved stone inserted at each side of the arch is seen at the bottom of plate five featuring an archivolt in the duomo of murano are of different workmanship from the rest they do not match each other and form part of the evidence which proves that portions of the church had been brought from the mainland one bears an inscription which as its antiquity is confirmed by the shapelessness of its letters i was much gratified by not being able to read but m lazari the intelligent author of the latest and best venetian guide with better skill has given as much of it as remains thus i have printed the letters as they are placed in the inscription in order that the reader may form some idea of the difficulty of reading such legends when the letters thus thrown into one heap are themselves of strange forms and have worn away any gaps which at all occur between them coming in their own places there is no doubt however as to the reading of this fragment t dot 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 sancte marie domini genetricis et beati stefani martyri ego indignus et peccator domenicus t on these two initial and final t's expanding one into templum the other into torcellanus m lazari founds an ingenious conjecture that the inscription records the elevation of the church under a certain bishop dominic of torcello named in the alternate chronicle who flourished in the middle of the ninth century if this were so as the inscription occurs broken off on a fragment inserted scornfully in the present edifice this edifice must be of the twelfth century worked with fragments taken from the ruins of that built in the ninth the two t's are however hardly a foundation large enough to build the church upon a hundred years before the date assigned to it both by history and tradition see above section eight and the reader has yet to be made aware of the principal fact bearing on the question section thirty one above the first story of the apse runs as he knows already a gallery under open arches protected by a light balustrade this balustrade is worked on the outside with mouldings of which i shall only say at present that they are of exactly the same school as the greater part of the work of the existing church 
but the great horizontal pieces of stone which form the top of this balustrade are fragments of an older building turned inside out. They are covered with sculptures on the back, only to be seen by mounting into the gallery. They have once had an arcade of low white arches traced on their surface, the spandrels filled with leafage, and archivolts enriched with studded chain work and with crosses in their centers. These pieces have been used as waste marble by the architects of the existing apse. The small arches of the present balustrade are cut mercilessly through the old work, and the profile of the balustrade is cut out of what was once the back of the stone. Only some respect is shown for the crosses in the old design. The blocks are cut so that they shall be not only left uninjured, but come in the center of the balustrades. Section 32 now let the reader observe carefully that this balustrade of Murano is a fence of other things than the low gallery round the deserted apse. It is a barrier between two great schools of early architecture. On one side it was cut by Romanesque workmen of the early Christian ages and furnishes us with a distinct type of a kind of ornament which as we meet with other examples of it we shall be able to describe in generic terms and to throw back behind this balustrade out of our way. The front of the balustrade presents us with a totally different condition of design, less rich, more graceful, and here shown in its simplest possible form. From the outside of this bar of marble, we shall commence our progress in the study of existing Venetian architecture. The only question is, do we begin from the 10th or from the 12th century? Section 33 I was in great hopes once of being able to determine this positively, but the alterations in all the early buildings of Venice are so numerous and the foreign fragments introduced so innumerable that I was obliged to leave the question doubtful, but one circumstance must be noted bearing upon it closely. In the woodcut on page 50, figure 3, B is an archivolt of Murano, A, one of St. Mark's the latter acknowledged by all historians and all investigators to be of the 12th century. All the 12th century archivolts in Venice, without exception, are on the model of A, differing only in their decorations and sculpture. There is not one which resembles that of Murano. But the deep mouldings of Murano are almost exactly similar to those of St. Michele of Pavia, and other Lombard churches built some as early as the 7th, others in the 8th, 9th and 10th centuries. On this ground it seems to me probable that the existing apse of Murano is part of the original earliest church and that the inscribed fragments used in it have been brought from the mainland. The balustrade, however, may still be later than the rest. It will be examined hereafter more carefully. Footnote, its elevation is given to scale in figure 4, plate 13 below. End footnote. I have not space to give any farther account of the exterior of the building, though one half of what is remarkable in it remains untold. We must now see what is left of interest within the walls. Section 34. All hope is taken away by our first glance for it falls on a range of shafts whose bases are concealed by wooden panelling and which sustain arches decorated in the most approved style of Renaissance upholstery with stucco roses in squares under the soffits and egg and arrow mouldings on the architraves gilded on a ground of spotty black and green with a small pink-faced and black-eyed cherub on every keystone. The rest of the church being for the most part concealed either by dirty hangings or dirtier whitewash or dim pictures on warped and wasting canvas, all vulgar, vain and foul. Yet let us not turn back, for in the shadow of the apse our more careful glance shows us a Greek Madonna pictured on a field of gold, and we feel giddy at the first step we make on the pavement, for it also is of Greek mosaic, waved like the sea and died like a dove's neck. Section 35 Nor are the original features of the rest of the edifice altogether indecipherable. The entire series of shafts marked in the ground plan on each side of the nave 
from the western entrance to the apse are nearly uninjured, and I believe the stilted arches they sustain are those of the original fabric, though the masonry is covered by the Renaissance stucco mouldings. Their capitals for a wonder are left bare, and appear to have sustained no further injury than has resulted from the insertion of a large brass chandelier into each of their abbacy, each chandelier carrying a sublime wax candle two inches thick, fastened with wire to the wall above. The due arrangement of these appendages, previous to festal days, can only be effected from a ladder set against the angle of the abacus, and ten minutes before I wrote this sentence, I had the privilege of watching the candle lighter at his work, knocking his ladder about the heads of the capitals as if they had given him personal offence. He at last succeeded in breaking away one of the lamps altogether with a bit of the marble of the abacus, the whole falling in ruin to the pavement and causing much consultation and clamour among a tribe of beggars who were assisting the sacristan with their wisdom respecting the festal arrangements. Section 36. It is fortunate that the capitals themselves being somewhat rudely cut can bear this kind of treatment better than most of those in Venice. They are all founded on the Corinthian type, but the leaves are in every one different. Those of the easternmost capital of the southern range are the best and very beautiful, but presenting no feature of much interest their workmanship being inferior to most of the imitations of Corinthian common at the period, much more to the rich fantasies which we have seen at Orcello. The apse itself today, 12 September 1851, is not to be described, for just in front of it, behind the altar, is a magnificent curtain of new red velvet with a gilt edge and two golden tassels, held up in a dainty manner by two angels in the upholsterer's service. And above all, for concentration of effect, a star or sun some five feet broad, the spikes of which conceal the whole of the figure of the Madonna, except the head and hands. Section 37 the pavement is, however, still left open, and it is of infinite interest, although grievously distorted and defaced. For whenever a new chapel has been built, or a new altar erected, the pavement has been broken up and readjusted, so as to surround the newly inserted steps or stones with some appearance of symmetry. Portions of it either covered or carried away, others mercilessly shattered or replaced by modern imitations, and those of very different periods, with pieces of the old floor left here and there in the midst of them, and worked round so as to deceive the eye into acceptance of the whole as ancient. The portion, however, which occupies the western extremity of the nave, and the parts immediately adjoining it in the aisles, are, I believe, in their original positions, and very little injured. They are composed chiefly of groups of peacocks, lions, stags, and griffins, two of each in a group, drinking out of the same vase or shaking claws together, enclosed by interlacing bands and alternating with checker or stamp patterns, and here and there an attempted representation of architecture, all worked in marble mosaic. The floors of Torcello and of St. Mark's are executed in the same manner, but what remains at Murano is finer than either in the extraordinary play of color obtained by the use of variegated marbles. At St. Mark's the patterns are more intricate and the pieces far more skillfully set together, but each piece is there commonly of one color. At Murano every fragment is itself variegated, and all are arranged with a skill and feeling not to be caught and to be observed with deep reverence, for that pavement is not dateless like the rest of the church. It bears its date on one of its central circles, 1140, and is in my mind one of the most precious monuments in Italy, showing thus early and in those root checkers which the bared knee of the Murano fisher wears in its daily bending, the beginning of that mighty spirit of Venetian color which was to be consummated in Titian. Section 38. But we must quit the church for the present, for its garnishings are completed. The candles are all upright in their sockets, and the curtains drawn into festoons, and the pasteboard crescent, 
gay with artificial flowers, has been attached to the capital of every pillar in order, together with the gilt angels, to make the place look as much like paradise as possible. If we return tomorrow, we shall find it filled with woeful groups of aged men and women, wasted and fever-struck, fixed in paralytic supplication, half kneeling, half couched upon the pavement, bowed down partly in feebleness, partly in a fearful devotion, with their grey clothes cast far over their faces, ghastly and settled into a gloomy animal misery, all but the glittering eyes and muttering lips. Fit inhabitant this for what was once the Garden of Venice, a terrestrial paradise, a place of nymphs and demigods. Footnote Luogo de Nymphe de Semidei M. Andrea Calmo Quoted by Mutinelli Annali Urbani di Venezia Venice, 1841 Page 362 End footnote Section 39 We return yet once again on the following day. Worshippers and objects of worship, the sickly crowd and gilded angels, all are gone and there far in the apse is seen the sad Madonna standing in her folded robe, lifting her hands in vanity of blessing. There is little else to draw away our thoughts from the solitary image. An old wooden tablet carved into a rude effigy of San Donato, which occupies a central niche in the lower part of the tribune, has an interest of its own, but is unconnected with the history of the older church. The faded frescoes of saints which cover the upper tier of the wall or the apse are also of comparatively recent date, much more the piece of Renaissance workmanship shaft and entablature above the altar which has been thrust into the midst of all and has cut away part of the feet of the Madonna. Nothing remains of the original structure but the semi-dome itself, the cornice whence it springs, which is the same as that used on the exterior of the church, and the border and face arch which surround it. The ground of the dome is of gold, unbroken except by the upright Madonna, and usual inscription M R Theta V. The figure wears a robe of blue deeply fringed with gold, which seems to be gathered on the head and thrown back on the shoulders, crossing the breast and falling in many folds to the ground. The under robe shown beneath it, where it opens at the breast, is of the same colour the whole except the deep gold fringe being simply the dress of the women of the time. Le donne, anco elle del mille cento, vestivano di turchino con manti in spala, che le coprivano dinanzi e di dietro, which means the women, even as far back as 1100, wore dresses of blue with mantles on the shoulder which clothed them before and behind. Sansorino it would be difficult to imagine a dress more modest and beautiful. Footnote Early Venetian Dress Sansorino's account of the changes in the dress of the Venetians is brief, masterly, and full of interest. One or two passages are deserving of careful notice, especially the introductory sentence. For the Venetians, from their first origin, having made it their aim to be peaceful and religious, and to keep on an equality with one another, that equality might induce stability and concord as disparity produces confusion and ruin, made their dress a matter of conscience. And our ancestors, observant lovers of religion, upon which all their acts were founded, and desiring that their young men should direct themselves to virtue, the true soul of all human action, and above all to peace, invented a dress conformable to their gravity, such that in clothing themselves with it, they might clothe themselves also with modesty and honour. And because their mind was bent upon giving no offence to anyone, and living quietly as far as might be permitted them, it seemed good to them to show to everyone, even by external signs, this their endeavour by wearing a long dress which was in no wise convenient for persons of a quick temperament or of eager and fierce spirits. Respecting the colour of the women's dress, it is noticeable that blue is called Venetian colour by Cassiodorus, translated Turchino by Filiasi, 
volume five chapter four it was a very pale blue as the place in which the word occurs is the description by cassiodorus of the darkness which came over the sun's disk at the time of the belisarian wars and desolation of the gothic kingdom End footnote. round the dome there is a colored mosaic border and on the edge of its arch legible by the whole congregation this inscription quos eva contrivit pia virgo maria redemit hanc cuncti laudent cui christi munere gaudent which means whom eve destroyed the pious virgin mary redeemed all praise her who rejoice in the grace of christ footnote inscriptions at murano there are two other inscriptions on the border of the concha but these being written on the soffit of the face arch which as before noticed is supported by the last two shafts of the chancel could not be read by the congregation and only with difficulty by those immediately underneath them one of them is in black the other in red letters the first mutat quod sumsit quod solat crimina tandit et quod sumsit vultus vestis refulsit the second discipuli testes profete certa videntes et cernun purum sibi credunt esse futurum i have found no notice of any of these inscriptions in any italian account of the church of murano and have seldom seen even monkish latin less intelligible there is no mistake in the letters which are large and clear but wrong letters may have been introduced by ignorant restorers as has often happened in st mark's End footnote. the whole edifice is therefore simply a temple to the virgin to her is ascribed the fact of redemption and to her its praise section forty and is this it will be asked of me the time is this the worship to which you would have us look back with reverence and regret inasmuch as redemption is ascribed to the virgin no inasmuch as redemption is a thing desired believed rejoiced in yes and yes a thousand times as far as the virgin is worshipped in place of god no but as far as there is the evidence of worship itself and of the sense of a divine presence yes for there is a wider division of man than that into christian and pagan before we ask what a man worships we have to ask whether he worships at all observe christ's own words on this head god is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth the worshipping in spirit comes first and it does not necessarily imply the worshipping in truth therefore there is first the broad division of men into spirit worshippers and flesh worshippers and then of the spirit worshippers the father division into christian and pagan worshippers in falsehood or in truth i therefore for the moment omit all inquiry how far the mariolatry of the early church did indeed eclipse christ or what measure of deeper reverence for the son of god was still felt through all the grosser forms of madonna worship let that worship be taken at its worst let the goddess of this dome of murano be looked upon as just in the same sense an idol as the athene of the acropolis or the syrian queen of heaven and then on this darkest assumption balance well the difference between those who worship and those who worship not that difference which there is in the sight of god in all ages between the calculating smiling self-sustained self-governed man and the believing weeping wandering struggling heaven governed men between the men who say in their hearts there is no god and those who acknowledge a god at every step if happily they might feel after him and find him for that is indeed the difference which you shall find in the end between the builders of this day and the builders on that sand island long ago they did honor something out of themselves they did believe in spiritual presence judging animating redeeming them they built to its honor and for its habitation 
and were content to pass away in nameless multitudes so only that the labor of their hands might fix in the sea wilderness a throne for their guardian angel in this was their strength and there was indeed a spirit walking with them on the waters though they could not descend the form thereof though the master's voice came not to them it is i what their error cost them we shall see hereafter for it remained when the majesty and the sincerity of their worship had departed and remains to this day mariolatry is no special characteristic of the twelfth century on the outside of the very tribune of san donato in its central recess is an image of the virgin which receives the reverence once paid to the blue vision upon the inner dome with rouged cheeks and painted brows the frightful doll stands in wretchedness of rags blackened with the smoke of the votive lamps at its feet and if we would know what has been lost or gained by italy in the six hundred years that have worn the marbles of murano let us consider how far the priests who set up this to worship the populace who have this to adore may be nobler than the men who conceived that lonely figure standing on the golden field or than those to whom it seemed to receive their prayer at evening far away where they only saw the blue clouds rising out of the burning sea end of chapter three murano part two recording by fanny thessaloniki greece Chapter 4, Part 1 of The Stones of Venice, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Wayman. The Stones of Venice, Volume 2, by John Ruskin. Chapter 4, St. Mark's, Part 1 and so barnabas took mark and sailed unto cyprus if as the shores of asia lessened upon his sight the spirit of prophecy had entered into the heart of the weak disciple who had turned back when his hand was on the plough and who had been judged by the chiefest of christ's captains unworthy thenceforward to go forth with him to the work how wonderful would he have thought it that by the lion symbol in future ages he was to be represented among men how woeful that the war cry of his name should so often reanimate the rage of the soldier on those very plains where he himself had failed in the courage of the christian and so often die with fruitless blood that very cypriot sea over whose waves in repentance and shame he was following the son of consolation that the venetians possessed themselves of his body in the ninth century there appears no sufficient reason to doubt nor that it was principally in consequence of their having done so that they chose him for their patron saint there exists however a tradition that before he went into egypt he had founded the church at aquileia and was thus in some sort the first bishop of the venetian isles and people i believe that this tradition stands on nearly as good grounds as that of st peter having been the first bishop of rome but as usual it is enriched by various later additions and embellishments much resembling the stories told respecting the church of murano thus we find it recorded by the santo padre who compiled the vite dei santi spettanti alle chiese di venezia that st mark having seen the people of aquileia well grounded in religion and being called to rome by st peter before setting off took with him the holy bishop hermagoras and went in a small boat to the marshes of venice there were at that period some houses built upon a certain high bank called rialto and the boat being driven by the wind was anchored in a marshy place when st mark snatched into ecstasy heard the voice of an angel saying to him peace be to thee mark here shall thy body rest the angel goes on to foretell the building of una stupenda ne più veduta città but the fable is hardly ingenious enough to deserve farther relation 
but whether saint mark was first bishop of aquileia or not saint theodore was the first patron of the city nor can he yet be considered as having entirely abdicated his early right as his statue standing on a crocodile still companions the winged lion on the opposing pillar of the piazzetta a church erected to this saint is said to have occupied before the ninth century the site of st mark's and the traveller dazzled by the brilliancy of the great square ought not to leave it without endeavouring to imagine its aspect in that early time when it was a green field cloister-like and quiet divided by a small canal with a line of trees on each side and extending between the two churches of st theodore and st geminian as the little piazza of torcello lies between its palazzo and cathedral but in the year eight hundred and thirteen when the seat of government was finally removed to the rialto a ducal palace built on the spot where the present one stands with a ducal chapel beside it gave a very different character to the square of st mark and fifteen years later the acquisition of the body of the saint and its deposition in the ducal chapel perhaps not yet completed occasioned the investiture of that chapel with all possible splendour st theodore was deposed from his patronship and his church destroyed to make room for the aggrandizement of the one attached to the ducal palace and thenceforward known as st mark's this first church was however destroyed by fire when the ducal palace was burned in the revolt against candiano in nine hundred and seventy six it was partly rebuilt by his successor pietro orseolo on a larger scale and with the assistance of byzantine architects the fabric was carried on under successive doges for nearly a hundred years the main building being completed in ten seventy one but its incrustation with marble not till considerably later it was consecrated on the eighth of october ten eighty five according to san Savino and the author of the chiesa ducale di san marco in ten ninety four according to lazari but certainly between ten eighty four and ten ninety six those years being the limits of the reign of vital falier i incline to the supposition that it was soon after his accession to the throne in ten eighty five though san Savino writes by mistake or de Lavo instead of vital falier but at all events before the close of the eleventh century the great consecration of the church took place it was again injured by fire in eleven o six but repaired and from that time to the fall of venice there was probably no doge who did not in some slight degree embellish or alter the fabric so that few parts of it can be pronounced boldly to be of any given date two periods of interference are however notable above the rest the first that in which the gothic school had superseded the byzantine towards the close of the fourteenth century when the pinnacles upper archivolts and window traceries were added to the exterior and the great screen with various chapels and tabernacle work to the interior the second when the renaissance school superseded the gothic and the pupils of titian and tintoret substituted over one half of the church their own compositions for the greek mosaics with which it was originally decorated happily though with no good will having left enough to enable us to imagine and lament what they destroyed of this irreparable loss we shall have more to say hereafter meantime i wish only to fix in the reader's mind the succession of periods of alteration as firmly and simply as possible we have seen that the main body of the church may be broadly stated to be of the eleventh century the gothic editions of the fourteenth and the restored mosaics of the seventeenth there is no difficulty in distinguishing at a glance the gothic portions from the byzantine but there is considerable difficulty in ascertaining how long during the course of the twelfth and thirteenth centuries additions were made to the byzantine church which cannot easily be distinguished from the work of the eleventh century being purposely executed in the same manner two of the most important pieces of evidence on this point are a mosaic in the south transept and another over the northern door of the façade the first representing the interior the second the exterior of the ancient church it has just been stated that the existing building was consecrated by the doge vital falier 
a peculiar solemnity was given to that act of consecration in the minds of the venetian people by what appears to have been one of the best arranged and most successful impostures ever attempted by the clergy of the romish church the body of st mark had without doubt perished in the conflagration of nine hundred and seventy six but the revenues of the church depended too much upon the devotion excited by these relics to permit the confession of their loss the following is the account given by Corner, and believed to this day by the Venetians, of the pretended miracle by which it was concealed. After the repairs undertaken by the Doge Orseolo, the place in which the body of the Holy Evangelist rested had been altogether forgotten, so that the Doge Vital Falier was entirely ignorant of the place of the venerable deposit this was no light affliction not only to the pious doge but to all the citizens and people so that at last moved by confidence in the divine mercy they determined to implore with prayer and fasting the manifestation of so great a treasure which did not now depend upon any human effort a general fast being therefore proclaimed and a solemn procession appointed for the twenty-fifth day of june while the people assembled in the church interceded with god in fervent prayers for the desired boon they beheld with as much amazement as joy a slight shaking in the marbles of a pillar near the place where the altar of the cross is now which presently falling to the earth exposed to the view of the rejoicing people the chest of bronze in which the body of the evangelist was laid of the main facts of this tale there is no doubt they were embellished afterwards as usual by many fanciful traditions as for instance that when the sarcophagus was discovered st mark extended his hand out of it with a gold ring on one of the fingers which he permitted a noble of the dolphin family to remove and a quaint and delightful story was further invented of this ring which i shall not repeat here as it is now as well known as any tale of the arabian nights but the fast and the discovery of the coffin by whatever means effected are facts and they are recorded in one of the best preserved mosaics of the north transept executed very certainly not long after the event had taken place closely resembling in its treatment that of the bayeux tapestry and showing in a conventional manner the interior of the church as it then was filled by the people first in prayer then in thanksgiving the pillar standing open before them and the doge in the midst of them distinguished by his crimson bonnet embroidered with gold but more unmistakably by the inscription dux over his head as uniformly is the case in the bayeux tapestry and most other pictorial works of the period the church is of course rudely represented and the two upper stories of it reduced to a small scale in order to form a background to the figures one of those bold pieces of picture history which we in our pride of perspective and a thousand things besides never dare attempt we should have put in a column or two of the real or perspective size and subdued it into a vague background the old workman crushed the church together that he might get it all in up to the cupolas and has therefore left us some useful notes of its ancient form though any one who is familiar with the method of drawing employed at the period will not push the evidence too far the two pulpits are there however as they are at this day and the fringe of mosaic flower work which then encompassed the whole church but which modern restorers have destroyed all but one fragment still left in the south aisle there is no attempt to represent the other mosaics on the roof the scale being too small to admit of their being represented with any success but some at least of those mosaics had been executed at that period and their absence in the representation of the entire church is especially to be observed in order to show that we must not trust to any negative evidence in such works m lazari has rashly concluded that the central archivolt of st mark's must be posterior to the year twelve o five because it does not appear in the representation of the exterior of the church over the northern door but he justly observes that this mosaic which is the other piece of evidence we possess respecting the ancient form of the building cannot itself be earlier than twelve o five since it represents the bronze horses which were brought from constantinople in that year and this one fact renders it very difficult to speak with confidence respecting the date of any part of the exterior of st mark's for we have above seen that it was consecrated in the eleventh century 
and yet here is one of its most important exterior decorations assuredly retouched if not entirely added in the thirteenth although its style would have led us to suppose it had been an original part of the fabric however for all our purposes it will be enough for the reader to remember that the earliest parts of the building belong to the eleventh twelfth and first part of the thirteenth century the gothic portions to the fourteenth some of the altars and embellishments to the fifteenth and sixteenth and the modern portion of the mosaics to the seventeenth this however i only wish him to recollect in order that i may speak generally of the byzantine architecture of st mark's without leading him to suppose the whole church to have been built and decorated by greek artists its later portions with the single exception of the seventeenth century mosaics have been so dexterously accommodated to the original fabric that the general effect is still that of a byzantine building and i shall not except when it is absolutely necessary direct attention to the discordant points or weary the reader with anatomical criticism whatever in st mark's arrests the eye or affects the feelings is either byzantine or has been modified by byzantine influence and our inquiry into its architectural merits need not therefore be disturbed by the anxieties of antiquarianism, or arrested by the obscurities of chronology. And now I wish that the reader, before I bring him into St. Mark's place, would imagine himself for a little time in a quiet English cathedral town, and walk with me to the west front of its cathedral. Let us go together up the more retired street, at the end of which we can see the pinnacles of one of the towers, and then through the low grey gateway, with its battlemented top and small latticed window in the centre, into the inner private-looking road or close, where nothing goes in but the carts of the tradesmen who supply the bishop and the chapter, and where there are little shaven grass-plots fenced in by neat rails, before old-fashioned groups of somewhat diminutive and excessively trim houses, with little oriel and bay windows jutting out here and there, and deep wooden cornices and eaves painted cream colour and white, and small porches to their doors in the shape of cockle-shells, or little crooked, thick, indescribable wooden gables warped a little on one side, and so forward till we come to larger houses also old-fashioned but of red brick and with gardens behind them and fruit walls which show here and there among the nectarines the vestiges of an old cloister arch or shaft and looking in front on the cathedral square itself laid out in rigid divisions of smooth grass and gravel walk yet not uncheerful especially on the sunny side where the canon's children are walking with their nursery maids and so taking care not to tread on the grass we will go along the straight walk to the west front and there stand for a time looking up at its deep pointed porches and the dark places between their pillars where there were statues once and where the fragments here and there of a stately figure are still left which has in it the likeness of a king perhaps indeed a king on earth perhaps a saintly king long ago in heaven and so higher and higher up to the great mouldering wall of rugged sculpture and confused arcades shattered and grey and grisly with heads of dragons and mocking fiends worn by the rain and swirling winds into yet unseemlier shape and coloured on their stony scales by the deep russet orange lichen melancholy gold and so higher still to the bleak towers so far above that the eye loses itself among the bosses of their traceries though they are rude and strong and only sees like a drift of eddying black points now closing now scattering and now settling suddenly into invisible places among the bosses and flowers the crowd of restless birds that fill the whole square with that strange clangour of theirs so harsh and yet so soothing like the cries of birds on a solitary coast between the cliffs and sea think for a little while of that scene and the meaning of all its small formalisms mixed with its serene sublimity estimate its secluded continuous drowsy felicities and its evidence of the sense and steady performance of such kind of duties as can be regulated by the cathedral clock and weigh the influence of those dark towers on all who have passed through the lonely square at their feet for centuries and on all who have seen them rising far away over the wooded plain or catching on their square masses the last rays of the sunset 
when the city at their feet was indicated only by the mist at the bend of the river and then let us quickly recollect that we are in venice and land at the extremity of the calle lunga san Mose, which may be considered as their answering to the secluded street that led us to our english cathedral gateway we find ourselves in a paved alley some seven feet wide where it is widest full of people and resonant with cries of itinerant salesmen a shriek in their beginning and dying away into a kind of brazen ringing all the worse for its confinement between the high houses of the passage along which we have to make our way overhead an inextricable confusion of rugged shutters and iron balconies and chimney flues pushed out on brackets to save room and arched windows with projecting sills of istrian stone and gleams of green leaves here and there where a fig-tree branch escapes over a lower wall from some inner cortile leading the eye up to the narrow stream of blue sky high over all on each side a row of shops as densely set as may be occupying in fact intervals between the square stone shafts about eight feet high which carry the first floors intervals of which one is narrow and serves as a door the other is in the more respectable shops wainscoted to the height of the counter and glazed above but in those of the poorer tradesmen left open to the ground and the wares laid on benches and tables in the open air the light in all cases entering at the front only and fading away in a few feet from the threshold into a gloom which the eye from without cannot penetrate but which is generally broken by a ray or two from a feeble lamp at the back of the shop suspended before a print of the virgin the less pious shopkeeper sometimes leaves his lamp unlighted and is contented with a penny print the more religious one has his print coloured and set in a little shrine with a gilded or figured fringe with perhaps a faded flower or two on each side and his lamp burning brilliantly here at the fruiterers where the dark green watermelons are heaped upon the counter like cannon-balls the madonna has a tabernacle of fresh laurel leaves but the pewterer next door has let his lamp out and there is nothing to be seen in his shop but the dull gleam of the studded patterns on the copper pans hanging from his roof in the darkness next comes a vendita fritole e licori where the virgin enthroned in a very humble manner beside a tallow candle on a back shelf presides over certain ambrosial morsels of a nature too ambiguous to be defined or enumerated but a few steps farther on at the regular wine shop of the calais where we are offered vino nostrani a soldi ventotto a trentadue the madonna is in great glory enthroned above ten or a dozen large red casks of three-year-old vintage and flanked by goodly ranks of bottles of maraschino and two crimson lamps and for the evening when the gondoliers will come to drink out under her auspices the money they have gained during the day she will have a whole chandelier a yard or two farther we pass the hostelry of the black eagle and glancing as we pass through the square door of marble deeply moulded in the outer wall we see the shadows of its pergola of vines resting on an ancient well with a pointed shield carved on its side and so presently emerge on to the bridge and campo san moise whence to the entrance into st mark's place called the bocca di piazza mouth of the square the venetian character is nearly destroyed first by the frightful facade of san moise which we will pause at another time to examine and then by the modernizing of the shops as they near the piazza and the mingling with the lower venetian populace of lounging groups of english and austrians we will push fast through them into the shadow of the pillars at the end of the bocca di piazza and then we forget them all for between those pillars there opens a great light and in the midst of it as we advance slowly the vast tower of st mark seems to lift itself visibly forth from the level field of chequered stones and on each side the countless arches prolong themselves into ranged symmetry as if the rugged and irregular houses that pressed together above us in the dark alley had been struck back into sudden obedience and lovely order and all their rude casements and broken walls had been transformed into arches charged with goodly sculpture 
and fluted shafts of delicate stone and well may they fall back for beyond those troops of ordered arches there rises a vision out of the earth and all the great square seems to have opened from it in a kind of awe that we may see it far away a multitude of pillars and white domes clustered into a long low pyramid of coloured light a treasure heap it seems partly of gold and partly of opal and mother of pearl hollowed beneath into five great vaulted porches sealed with fair mosaic and beset with sculpture of alabaster clear as amber and delicate as ivory sculpture fantastic and involved of palm trees and lilies and grapes and pomegranates and birds clinging and fluttering among the branches all twined together into an endless network of buds and plumes and in the midst of it the solemn forms of angels sceptred and robed to the feet and leaning to each other across the gates their figures indistinct among the gleaming of the golden ground through the leaves beside them interrupted and dim like the morning light as it faded back among the branches of eden when first its gates were angel guarded long ago and round the walls of the porches there are set pillars of variegated stones jasper and porphyry and deep green serpentine spotted with flakes of snow and marbles that half refuse and half yield to the sunshine cleopatra like their bluest veins to kiss the shadow as it steals back from them revealing line after line of azure undulation as a receding tide leaves the waved sand their capitals rich with interwoven tracery rooted knots of herbage and drifting leaves of acanthus and vine and mystical signs all beginning and ending in the cross and above them in the broad archivolts a continuous chain of language and of life angels and the signs of heaven and the labours of men each in its appointed season upon the earth and above these another range of glittering pinnacles mixed with white arches edged with scarlet flowers a confusion of delight amidst which the breasts of the greek horses are seen blazing in their breadth of golden strength and the st mark's lion lifted on a blue field covered with stars until at last as if in ecstasy the crests of the arches break into a marble foam and toss themselves far into the blue sky in flashes and wreaths of sculptured spray as if the breakers on the lido shore had been frost-bound before they fell and the sea nymphs had inlaid them all with coral and amethyst between that grim cathedral of england and this what an interval there is a type of it in the very birds that haunt them for instead of the restless crowd hoarse-voiced and sable-winged drifting on the bleak upper air the st mark's porches are full of doves that nestle among the marble foliage and mingle the soft iridescence of their living plumes changing at every motion with the tints hardly less lovely that have stood unchanged for seven hundred years and what effect has this splendour on those who pass beneath it you may walk from sunrise to sunset to and fro before the gateway of st mark's and you will not see an eye lifted to it nor a countenance brightened by it priest and layman soldier and civilian rich and poor pass by it alike regardlessly up to the very recesses of the porches the meanest tradesmen of the city push their counters nay the foundations of its pillars are themselves the seats not of them that sell doves for sacrifice but of the vendors of toys and caricatures round the whole square in front of the church there is almost a continuous line of cafes where the idle venetians of the middle classes lounge and read empty journals in its centre the austrian bands play during the time of vespers their martial music jarring with the organ notes the march drowning the miserere and the sullen crowd thickening round them a crowd which if it had its will would stiletto every soldier that pipes to it and in the recesses of the porches all day long knots of men of the lowest classes unemployed and listless 
lie basking in the sun like lizards and unregarded children every heavy glance of their young eyes full of desperation and stony depravity and their throats hoarse with cursing gamble and fight and snarl and sleep hour after hour clashing their bruised centesimi upon the marble ledges of the church porch and the images of christ and his angels look down upon it continually that we may not enter the church out of the midst of the horror of this let us turn aside under the portico which looks towards the sea and passing round within the two massive pillars brought from saint jean d'acre we shall find the gate of the baptistery let us enter there the heavy door closes behind us instantly and the light and the turbulence of the piazzetta are together shut out by it End of chapter 4, part 1chapter four part two of the stones of venice volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the stones of venice volume two by john ruskin chapter four st mark's part two we are in a low vaulted room vaulted not with arches but with small cupolas starred with gold and chequered with gloomy figures in the centre is a bronze font charged with rich bas-reliefs a small figure of the baptist standing above it in a single ray of light that glances across the narrow room dying as it falls from a window high in the wall and the first thing that it strikes and the only thing that it strikes brightly is a tomb we hardly know if it be a tomb indeed for it is like a narrow couch set beside the window low roofed and curtained so that it might seem but that it has some height above the pavement to have been drawn towards the window that the sleeper might be wakened early only there are two angels who have drawn the curtain back and are looking down upon him let us look also and thank that gentle light that rests upon his forehead for ever and dies away upon his breast the face is of a man in middle life but there are two deep furrows right across the forehead dividing it like the foundations of a tower the height of it above is bound by the fillet of the ducal cap the rest of the features are singularly small and delicate the lips sharp perhaps the sharpness of death being added to that of the natural lines but there is a sweet smile upon them and a deep serenity upon the whole countenance the roof of the canopy above has been blue filled with stars beneath in the centre of the tomb on which the figure rests is a seated figure of the virgin and the border of it all around is of flowers and soft leaves growing rich and deep as if in a field in summer it is the doge andrea dandolo a man early great among the great of venice and early lost she chose him for her king in his thirty-sixth year he died ten years later leaving behind him that history to which we owe half of what we know of her former fortunes look round at the room in which he lies the floor of it is of rich mosaic encompassed by a low seat of red marble and its walls are of alabaster but worn and shattered and darkly stained with age almost a ruin in places the slabs of marble have fallen away altogether and the rugged brickwork is seen through the rents but all beautiful the ravaging fissures fretting their way among the islands and channeled zones of the alabaster and the time stains on its translucent masses darkened into fields of rich golden brown like the colour of seaweed when the sun strikes on it through deep sea the light fades away into the recess of the chamber towards the altar and the eye can hardly trace the lines of the bas-relief behind it of the baptism of christ but on the vaulting of the roof the figures are distinct and there are seen upon it two great circles 
one surrounded by the principalities and powers in heavenly places of which milton has expressed the ancient division in the single massy line thrones dominations princedoms virtues powers and around the other the apostles christ the centre of both and upon the walls again and again repeated the gaunt figure of the baptist in every circumstance of his life and death and the streams of the jordan running down between their cloven rocks the axe laid to the root of a fruitless tree that springs upon their shore every tree that bringeth not good fruit shall be hewn down and cast into the fire yes verily to be baptized with fire or to be cast therein it is the choice set before all men the march notes still murmur through the grated window and mingle with the sounding in our ears of the sentence of judgment which the old greek has written on that baptistery wall venice has made her choice he who lies under that stony canopy would have taught her another choice in his day if she would have listened to him but he and his counsels have long been forgotten by her and the dust lies upon his lips through the heavy door whose bronze network closes the place of his rest let us enter the church itself it is lost in still deeper twilight to which the eye must be accustomed for some moments before the form of the building can be traced and then there opens before us a vast cave hewn out into the form of a cross and divided into shadowy aisles by many pillars round the domes of its roof the light enters only through narrow apertures like large stars and here and there a ray or two from some far-away casement wanders into the darkness and casts a narrow phosphoric stream upon the waves of marble that heave and fall in a thousand colours along the floor what else there is of light is from torches or silver lamps burning ceaselessly in the recesses of the chapels the roof sheeted with gold and the polished walls covered with alabaster give back at every curve and angle some feeble gleaming to the flames and the glories round the heads of the sculptured saints flash out upon us as we pass them and sink again into the gloom underfoot and overhead a continual succession of crowded imagery one picture passing into another as in a dream forms beautiful and terrible mixed together dragons and serpents and ravening beasts of prey and graceful birds that in the midst of them drink from running fountains and feed from vases of crystal the passions and the pleasures of human life symbolized together and the mystery of its redemption for the mazes of interwoven lines and changeful pictures lead always at last to the cross lifted and carved in every place and upon every stone sometimes with the serpent of eternity wrapped round it sometimes with doves beneath its arms and sweet herbage growing forth from its feet but conspicuous most of all on the great rood that crosses the church before the altar raised in bright blazonry against the shadow of the apse and although in the recesses of the aisles and chapels when the mist of the incense hangs heavily we may see continually a figure traced in faint lines upon the marble a woman standing with her eyes raised to heaven and the inscription above her mother of god she is not here the presiding deity it is the cross that is first seen and always burning in the centre of the temple and every dome and hollow of its roof has the figure of christ in the utmost height of it raised in power or returning in judgment nor is this interior without effect on the minds of the people at every hour of the day there are groups collected before the various shrines and solitary worshippers scattered through the darker places of the church evidently in prayer both deep and reverent and for the most part profoundly sorrowful the devotees at the greater number of the renowned shrines of romanism may be seen murmuring their appointed prayers with wandering eyes and unengaged gestures but the step of the stranger does not disturb those who kneel on the pavement of st mark's and hardly a moment passes from early morning to sunset 
in which we may not see some half-veiled figure enter beneath the arabian porch cast itself into long abasement on the floor of the temple and then rising slowly with more confirmed step and with a passionate kiss and clasp of the arms given to the feet of the crucifix by which the lamps burn always in the northern aisle leave the church as if comforted but we must not hastily conclude from this that the nobler characters of the building have at present any influence in fostering a devotional spirit there is distress enough in venice to bring many to their knees without excitement from external imagery and whatever there may be in the temper of the worship offered in st mark's more than can be accounted for by reference to the unhappy circumstances of the city is assuredly not owing either to the beauty of its architecture or to the impressiveness of the scripture histories embodied in its mosaics that it has a peculiar effect however slight on the popular mind may perhaps be safely conjectured from the number of worshippers which it attracts while the churches of st paul and the frari larger in size and more central in position are left comparatively empty but this effect is altogether to be ascribed to its richer assemblage of those sources of influence which address themselves to the commonest instincts of the human mind and which in all ages and countries have been more or less employed in the support of superstition darkness and mystery confused recesses of building artificial light employed in small quantity but maintained with a constancy which seems to give it a kind of sacredness preciousness of material easily comprehended by the vulgar eye close air loaded with a sweet and peculiar odour associated only with religious services solemn music and tangible idols or images having popular legends attached to them these the stage properties of superstition which have been from the beginning of the world and must be to the end of it employed by all nations whether openly savage or nominally civilized to produce a false awe in minds incapable of apprehending the true nature of the deity are assembled in st mark's to a degree as far as i know unexampled in any other european church the arts of the magus and the brahmin are exhausted in the animation of a paralyzed christianity and the popular sentiment which these arts excite is to be regarded by us with no more respect than we should have considered ourselves justified in rendering to the devotion of the worshippers at eleusis elora or edfu indeed these inferior means of exciting religious emotion were employed in the ancient church as they are at this day but not employed alone torchlight there was as there is now but the torchlight illumines scripture histories on the walls which every eye traced and every heart comprehended but which during my whole residence in venice i never saw one venetian regard for an instant i never heard from any one the most languid expression of interest in any feature of the church or perceived the slightest evidence of their understanding the meaning of its architecture and while therefore the english cathedral though no longer dedicated to the kind of services for which it was intended by its builders and much at variance in many of its characters with the temper of the people by whom it is now surrounded retains yet so much of its religious influence that no prominent feature of its architecture can be said to exist altogether in vain we have in st mark's a building apparently still employed in the ceremonies for which it was designed and yet of which the impressive attributes have altogether ceased to be comprehended by its votaries the beauty which it possesses is unfelt the language it uses is forgotten and in the midst of the city to whose service it has so long been consecrated and still filled by crowds of the descendants of those to whom it owes its magnificence it stands in reality more desolate than the ruins through which the sheep walk passes unbroken in our english valleys and the writing on its marble walls is less regarded and less powerful for the teaching of men than the letters which the shepherd follows with his finger where the moss is lightest on the tombs in the desecrated cloister it must therefore be altogether without reference to its present usefulness that we pursue our inquiry into the merits and meaning of the architecture of this marvellous building and it can only be after we have terminated that inquiry conducting it carefully on abstract grounds 
that we can pronounce with any certainty how far the present neglect of St. Mark's is significative of the decline of the Venetian character, or how far this church is to be considered as the relic of a barbarous age, incapable of attracting the admiration or influencing the feelings of a civilized community. The inquiry before us is twofold. Throughout the first volume, I carefully kept the study of expression distinct from that of abstract architectural perfection, telling the reader that in every building we should afterwards examine, he would have first to form a judgment of its construction and decorative merit, considering it merely as a work of art, and then to examine farther in what degree it fulfilled its expressional purposes. Accordingly, we have first to judge of St. Mark's merely as a piece of architecture, not as a church. Secondly, to estimate its fitness for its special duty as a place of worship, and the relationship in which it stands, as such, to those northern cathedrals that still retain so much of the power over the human heart which the Byzantine domes appear to have lost forever. In the two succeeding sections of this work, devoted respectively to the examination of the Gothic and Renaissance buildings in Venice, I have endeavoured to analyse and state, as briefly as possible, the true nature of each school, first in spirit, then in form. I wished to have given a similar analysis, in this section, of the nature of Byzantine architecture, but could not make my statements general, because I have never seen this kind of building on its native soil. Nevertheless, in the following sketch of the principles exemplified in St. Mark's, I believe that most of the leading features and motives of the style will be found clearly enough distinguished to enable the reader to judge of it with tolerable fairness, as compared with the better-known systems of European architecture in the Middle Ages. Now the first broad characteristic of the building, and the root nearly of every other important peculiarity in it, is its confessed incrustation. It is the purest example in Italy of the great school of architecture in which the ruling principle is the incrustation of brick with more precious materials, and it is necessary, before we proceed to criticise any one of its arrangements, that the reader should carefully consider the principles which are likely to have influenced, or might legitimately influence, the architects of such a school, as distinguished from those whose designs are to be executed in massive materials. It is true that among different nations and at different times we may find examples of every sort and degree of incrustation, from the mere setting of the larger and more compact stones by preference at the outside of the wall, to the miserable construction of that modern brick cornice with its coating of cement, which but the other day in London killed its unhappy workmen in its fall. But just as it is perfectly possible to have a clear idea of the opposing characteristics of two different species of plants or animals, though between the two there are varieties which it is difficult to assign either to the one or the other, so the reader may fix decisively in his mind the legitimate characteristics of the encrusted and the massive styles, though between the two there are varieties which confessedly unite the attributes of both. For instance, in many Roman remains, built of blocks of tufa and encrusted with marble, we have a style which, though truly solid, possesses some of the attributes of incrustation. And in the Cathedral of Florence, built of brick and coated with marble, the marble facing is so firmly and exquisitely set that the building, though in reality encrusted, assumes the attributes of solidity. But these intermediate examples need not in the least confuse our generally distinct ideas of the two families of buildings, the one in which the substance is alike throughout, and the forms and conditions of the ornament assume or prove that it is so, as in the best Greek buildings, and for the most part in our early Norman and Gothic, and the other in which the substance is of two kinds, one internal, the other external, and the system of decoration is founded on this duplicity, as preeminently in St. Mark's. I have used the word duplicity in no depreciatory sense. In Chapter 2 of The Seven Lamps, Section 18, I especially guarded this encrusted school from the imputation of insincerity, and I must do so now at greater length. It appears insincere at first to a northern builder, because, accustomed to build with solid blocks of freestone, he is in the habit of supposing the external superficies of a piece of masonry to be some criterion of its thickness. 
but as soon as he gets acquainted with the encrusted style he will find that the southern builders had no intention to deceive him he will see that every slab of facial marble is fastened to the next by a confessed rivet and that the joints of the armour are so visibly and openly accommodated to the contours of the substance within that he has no more right to complain of treachery than a savage would have who for the first time in his life seeing a man in armour had supposed him to be made of solid steel acquaint him with the customs of chivalry and with the uses of the coat of mail and he ceases to accuse of dishonesty either the panoply or the knight these laws and customs of the st mark's architectural chivalry it must be our business to develop first consider the natural circumstances which give rise to such a style suppose a nation of builders placed far from any quarries of available stone and having precarious access to the mainland where they exist compelled therefore either to build entirely with brick or to import whatever stone they use from great distances in ships of small tonnage and for the most part dependent for speed on the oar rather than the sail the labour and cost of carriage are just as great whether they import common or precious stone and therefore the natural tendency would always be to make each shipload as valuable as possible but in proportion to the preciousness of the stone is the limitation of its possible supply limitation not determined merely by cost but by the physical conditions of the material for of many marbles pieces above a certain size are not to be had for money there would also be a tendency in such circumstances to import as much stone as possible ready sculptured in order to save weight and therefore if the traffic of their merchants led them to places where there were ruins of ancient edifices to ship the available fragments of them home out of this supply of marble partly composed of pieces of so precious a quality that only a few tons of them could be on any terms obtained and partly of shafts capitals and other portions of foreign buildings the island architect has to fashion as best he may the anatomy of his edifice it is at his choice either to lodge his few blocks of precious marble here and there among his masses of brick and to cut out of the sculptured fragments such new forms as may be necessary for the observance of fixed proportions in the new building or else to cut the coloured stones into thin pieces of extent sufficient to face the whole surface of the walls and to adopt a method of construction irregular enough to admit the insertion of fragmentary sculptures rather with a view of displaying their intrinsic beauty than of setting them to any regular service in the support of the building an architect who cared only to display his own skill and had no respect for the works of others would assuredly have chosen the former alternative and would have sawn the old marbles into fragments in order to prevent all interference with his own designs but an architect who cared for the preservation of noble work whether his own or others and more regarded the beauty of his building than his own fame would have done what those old builders of st mark's did for us and saved every relic with which he was entrusted but these were not the only motives which influenced the venetians in the adoption of their method of architecture it might under all the circumstances above stated have been a question with other builders whether to import one shipload of costly jaspers or twenty of chalk flints and whether to build a small church faced with porphyry and paved with agate or to raise a vast cathedral in freestone but with the venetians it could not be a question for an instant they were exiles from ancient and beautiful cities and had been accustomed to build with their ruins not less in affection than in admiration they had thus not only grown familiar with the practice of inserting older fragments in modern buildings but they owed to that practice a great part of the splendour of their city and whatever charm of association might aid its change from a refuge into a home the practice which began in the affections of a fugitive nation was prolonged in the pride of a conquering one and beside the memorials of departed happiness were elevated the trophies of returning victory the ship of war brought home more marble in triumph than the merchant vessel in speculation and the front of st mark's became rather a shrine at which to dedicate the splendour of miscellaneous spoil than the organised expression of any fixed architectural law or religious emotion thus far however the justification of the style of this church depends on circumstances peculiar to the time of its erection and to the spot where it arose 
the merit of its method considered in the abstract rests on far broader grounds in the fifth chapter of the seven lamps section fourteen the reader will find the opinion of a modern architect of some reputation mr wood that the chief thing remarkable in this church is its extreme ugliness and he will find this opinion associated with another namely that the works of the caracci are far preferable to those of the venetian painters this second statement of feeling reveals to us one of the principal causes of the first namely that mr wood had not any perception of colour or delight in it the perception of colour is a gift just as definitely granted to one person and denied to another as an ear for music and the very first requisite for true judgment of st mark's is the perfection of that colour faculty which few people ever set themselves seriously to find out whether they possess or not for it is on its value as a piece of perfect and unchangeable colouring that the claims of this edifice to our respect are finally rested and a deaf man might as well pretend to pronounce judgment on the merits of a full orchestra as an architect trained in the composition of form only to discern the beauty of st mark's it possesses the charm of colour in common with the greater part of the architecture as well as of the manufactures of the east but the venetians deserve especial note as the only european people who appear to have sympathized to the full with the great instinct of the eastern races they indeed were compelled to bring artists from constantinople to design the mosaics of the vaults of st mark's and to group the colors of its porches but they rapidly took up and developed under more masculine conditions the system of which the greeks had shown them the example while the burghers and barons of the north were building their dark streets and grisly castles of oak and sandstone the merchants of venice were covering their palaces with porphyry and gold and at last when her mighty painters had created for her a colour more priceless than gold or porphyry even this the richest of her treasures she lavished upon walls whose foundations were beaten by the sea and the strong tide as it runs beneath the rialto is reddened to this day by the reflection of the frescoes of giorgione if therefore the reader does not care for colour i must protest against his endeavour to form any judgment whatever of this church of st mark's but if he both cares for and loves it let him remember that the school of encrusted architecture is the only one in which perfect and permanent chromatic decoration is possible and let him look upon every piece of jasper and alabaster given to the architect as a cake of very hard colour of which a certain portion is to be ground down or cut off to paint the walls with once understand this thoroughly and accept the condition that the body and availing strength of the edifice are to be in brick and that this under muscular power of brickwork is to be clothed with the defence and the brightness of the marble as the body of an animal is protected and adorned by its scales or its skin and all the consequent fitnesses and laws of the structure will be easily discernible these i shall state in their natural order end of chapter four part two chapter four part three of the stones of venice volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the stones of venice volume two by john ruskin chapter four st mark's part three law one that the plinths and cornices used for binding the armour are to be light and delicate a certain thickness at least two or three inches must be required in the covering pieces even when composed of the strongest stone and set on the least exposed parts in order to prevent the chance of fracture and to allow for the wear of time and the weight of this armour must not be trusted to cement the pieces must not be merely glued to the rough brick surface but connected with the mass which they protect by binding cornices and string courses and with each other so as to secure mutual support aided by the rivetings but by no means dependent upon them and for the full honesty and straightforwardness of the work it is necessary that these string courses and binding plinths should not be of such proportions as would fit them for taking any important part in the hard work of the inner structure 
or render them liable to be mistaken for the great cornices and plinths already explained as essential parts of the best solid building they must be delicate slight and visibly incapable of severer work than that assigned to them law two science of inner structure is to be abandoned as the body of the structure is confessedly of inferior and comparatively incoherent materials it would be absurd to attempt in it any expression of the higher refinements of construction it will be enough that by its mass we are assured of its sufficiency and strength and there is the less reason for endeavouring to diminish the extent of its surface by delicacy of adjustment because on the breadth of that surface we are to depend for the better display of the colour which is to be the chief source of our pleasure in the building the main body of the work therefore will be composed of solid walls and massive piers and whatever expression of finer structural science we may require will be thrown either into subordinate portions of it or entirely directed to the support of the external mail where in arches or vaults it might otherwise appear dangerously independent of the material within law three all shafts are to be solid wherever by the smallness of the parts we may be driven to abandon the encrusted structure at all it must be abandoned altogether the eye must never be left in the least doubt as to what is solid and what is coated whatever appears probably solid must be assuredly so and therefore it becomes an inviolable law that no shaft shall ever be encrusted not only does the whole virtue of a shaft depend on its consolidation but the labour of cutting and adjusting an encrusted coat to it would be greater than the saving of material is worth therefore the shaft of whatever size is always to be solid and because the encrusted character of the rest of the building renders it more difficult for the shafts to clear themselves from suspicion they must not in this encrusted style be in any place jointed no shaft must ever be used but of one block and this the more because the permission given to the builder to have his walls and piers as ponderous as he likes renders it quite unnecessary for him to use shafts of any fixed size in our norman and gothic where definite support is required at a definite point it becomes lawful to build up a tower of small stones in the shape of a shaft but the byzantine is allowed to have as much support as he wants from the walls in every direction and he has no right to ask for further license in the structure of his shafts let him by generosity in the substance of his pillars repay us for the permission we have given him to be superficial in his walls the builder in the chalk valleys of france and england may be blameless in kneading his clumsy pier out of broken flint and calcined lime but the venetian who has access to the riches of asia and the quarries of egypt must frame at least his shafts out of flawless stone and this for another reason yet although as we have said it is impossible to cover the walls of a large building with colour except on the condition of dividing the stone into plates there is always a certain appearance of meanness and niggardliness in the procedure it is necessary that the builder should justify himself from this suspicion and prove that it is not in mere economy or poverty but in the real impossibility of doing otherwise that he has sheeted his walls so thinly with the precious film now the shaft is exactly the portion of the edifice in which it is fittest to recover his honour in this respect for if blocks of jasper or porphyry be inserted in the walls the spectator cannot tell their thickness and cannot judge of the costliness of the sacrifice but the shaft he can measure with his eye in an instant and estimate the quantity of treasure both in the mass of its existing substance and in that which has been hewn away to bring it into its perfect and symmetrical form and thus the shafts of all buildings of this kind are justly regarded as an expression of their wealth and a form of treasure just as much as the jewels or gold in the sacred vessels they are in fact nothing else than large jewels the block of precious serpentine or jasper being valued according to its size and brilliancy of colour like a large emerald or ruby only the bulk required to bestow value on the one is to be measured in feet and tons and on the other in lines and carats the shafts must therefore be without exception of one block in all buildings of this kind for the attempt in any place to encrust or joint them would be a deception like that of introducing a false stone among jewellery
for a number of joints of any precious stone are of course not equal in value to a single piece of equal weight and would put an end at once to the spectator's confidence in the expression of wealth in any portion of the structure or of the spirit of sacrifice in those who raised it law four the shafts may sometimes be independent of the construction exactly in proportion to the importance which the shaft assumes as a large jewel is the diminution of its importance as a sustaining member for the delight which we receive in its abstract bulk and beauty of colour is altogether independent of any perception of its adaptation to mechanical necessities like other beautiful things in this world its end is to be beautiful and in proportion to its beauty it receives permission to be otherwise useless we do not blame emeralds and rubies because we cannot make them into heads of hammers nay so far from our admiration of the jewel shaft being dependent on its doing work for us it is very possible that a chief part of its preciousness may consist in a delicacy fragility and tenderness of material which must render it utterly unfit for hard work and therefore that we shall admire it the more because we perceive that if we were to put much weight upon it it would be crushed but at all events it is very clear that the primal object in the placing of such shafts must be the display of their beauty to the best advantage and that therefore all embedding of them in walls or crowding of them into groups in any position in which either their real size or any portion of their surface would be concealed is either inadmissible altogether or objectionable in proportion to their value that no symmetrical or scientific arrangements of pillars are therefore ever to be expected in buildings of this kind and that all such are even to be looked upon as positive errors and misapplications of materials but that on the contrary we must be constantly prepared to see and to see with admiration shafts of great size and importance set in places where their real service is little more than nominal and where the chief end of their existence is to catch the sunshine upon their polished sides and lead the eye into delighted wandering among the mazes of their azure veins law five the shafts may be of variable size since the value of each shaft depends upon its bulk and diminishes with the diminution of its mass in a greater ratio than the size itself diminishes as in the case of all other jewellery it is evident that we must not in general expect perfect symmetry and equality among the series of shafts any more than definiteness of application but that on the contrary an accurately observed symmetry ought to give us a kind of pain as proving that considerable and useless loss has been sustained by some of the shafts in being cut down to match with the rest it is true that symmetry is generally sought for in works of smaller jewellery but even there not a perfect symmetry and obtained under circumstances quite different from those which affect the placing of shafts in architecture first the symmetry is usually imperfect the stones that seem to match each other in a ring or necklace appear to do so only because they are so small that their differences are not easily measured by the eye but there is almost always such difference between them as would be strikingly apparent if it existed in the same proportion between two shafts nine or ten feet in height secondly the quantity of stones which pass through a jeweller's hands and the facility of exchange of such small objects enable the tradesman to select any number of stones of approximate size a selection however often requiring so much time that perfect symmetry in a group of very fine stones adds enormously to their value but the architect has neither the time nor the facilities of exchange he cannot lay aside one column in a corner of his church till in the course of traffic he obtain another that will match it he has not hundreds of shafts fastened up in bundles out of which he can match sizes at his ease he cannot send to a brother tradesman and exchange the useless stones for available ones to the convenience of both his blocks of stone or his ready-hewn shafts have been brought to him in limited number from immense distances no others are to be had and for those which he does not bring into use there is no demand elsewhere his only means of obtaining symmetry will therefore be in cutting down the finer masses to equality with the inferior ones and this we ought not to desire him often to do and therefore while sometimes in a baldacchino or an important chapel or shrine this costly symmetry may be necessary and admirable in proportion to its probable cost 
in the general fabric we must expect to see shafts introduced of size and proportion continually varying and such symmetry as may be obtained among them never altogether perfect and dependent for its charm frequently on strange complexities and unexpected rising and falling of weight and accent in its marble syllables bearing the same relation to a rigidly chiselled and proportioned architecture that the wild lyric rhythm of aeschylus or pindar bears to the finished measures of pope the application of the principles of jewellery to the smaller as well as the larger blocks will suggest to us another reason for the method of incrustation adopted in the walls it often happens that the beauty of the veining in some varieties of alabaster is so great that it becomes desirable to exhibit it by dividing the stone not merely to economize its substance but to display the changes in the disposition of its fantastic lines by reversing one of two thin plates successively taken from the stone and placing their corresponding edges in contact a perfectly symmetrical figure may be obtained which will enable the eye to comprehend more thoroughly the position of the veins and this is actually the method in which for the most part the alabasters of st mark are employed thus accomplishing a double good directing the spectator in the first place to close observation of the nature of the stone employed and in the second giving him a farther proof of the honesty of intention in the builder for wherever similar veining is discovered in two pieces the fact is declared that they have been cut from the same stone it would have been easy to disguise the similarity by using them in different parts of the building but on the contrary they are set edge to edge so that the whole system of the architecture may be discovered at a glance by any one acquainted with the nature of the stones employed nay but it is perhaps answered me not by an ordinary observer a person ignorant of the nature of alabaster might perhaps fancy all these symmetrical patterns to have been found in the stone itself and thus be doubly deceived supposing blocks to be solid and symmetrical which were in reality subdivided and irregular i grant it but be it remembered that in all things ignorance is liable to be deceived and has no right to accuse anything but itself as the source of the deception the style and the words are dishonest not which are liable to be misunderstood if subjected to no inquiry but which are deliberately calculated to lead inquiry astray there are perhaps no great or noble truths from those of religion downwards which present no mistakable aspect to casual or ignorant contemplation both the truth and the lie agree in hiding themselves at first but the lie continues to hide itself with effort as we approach to examine it and leads us if undiscovered into deeper lies the truth reveals itself in proportion to our patience and knowledge discovers itself kindly to our pleading and leads us as it is discovered into deeper truths law six the decoration must be shallow in cutting the method of construction being thus systematized it is evident that a certain style of decoration must arise out of it based on the primal condition that over the greater part of the edifice there can be no deep cutting the thin sheets of covering stones do not admit of it we must not cut them through to the bricks and whatever ornaments we engrave upon them cannot therefore be more than an inch deep at the utmost consider for an instant the enormous differences which this single condition compels between the sculptural decoration of the encrusted style and that of the solid stones of the north which may be hacked and hewn into whatever cavernous hollows and black recesses we choose struck into grim darknesses and grotesque projections and rugged ploughings up of sinuous furrows in which any form or thought may be wrought out on any scale mighty statues with robes of rock and crowned foreheads burning in the sun or venomous goblins and stealthy dragons shrunk into lurking places of untraceable shade think of this and of the play and freedom given to the sculptor's hand and temper to smite out and in hither and thither as he will and then consider what must be the different spirit of the design which is to be wrought on the smooth surface of a film of marble where every line and shadow must be drawn with the most tender pencilling and cautious reserve of resource where even the chisel must not strike hard lest it break through the delicate stone nor the mind be permitted in any impetuosity of conception inconsistent with the fine discipline of the hand 
consider that whatever animal or human form is to be suggested must be projected on a flat surface that all the features of the countenance the folds of the drapery the involutions of the limbs must be so reduced and subdued that the whole work becomes rather a piece of fine drawing than of sculpture and then follow out until you begin to perceive their endlessness the resulting differences of character which will be necessitated in every part of the ornamental designs of these encrusted churches as compared with that of the northern schools i shall endeavour to trace a few of them only the first would of course be a diminution of the builder's dependence upon human form as a source of ornament since exactly in proportion to the dignity of the form itself is the loss which it must sustain in being reduced to a shallow and linear bas-relief as well as the difficulty of expressing it at all under such conditions wherever sculpture can be solid the nobler characters of the human form at once lead the artist to aim at its representation rather than at that of inferior organisms but when all is to be reduced to outline the forms of flowers and lower animals are always more intelligible and are felt to approach much more to a satisfactory rendering of the objects intended than the outlines of the human body this inducement to seek for resources of ornament in the lower fields of creation was powerless in the minds of the great pagan nations ninevite greek or egyptian first because their thoughts were so concentrated on their own capacities and fates that they preferred the rudest suggestion of human form to the best of an inferior organism secondly because their constant practice in solid sculpture often colossal enabled them to bring a vast amount of science into the treatment of the lines whether of the low relief the monochrome vase or shallow hieroglyphic but when various ideas adverse to the representation of animal and especially of human form originating with the arabs and iconoclast greeks had begun at any rate to direct the builders minds to seek for decorative materials in inferior types and when diminished practice in solid sculpture had rendered it more difficult to find artists capable of satisfactorily reducing the high organisms to their elementary outlines the choice of subject for surface sculpture would be more and more uninterruptedly directed to floral organisms and human and animal form would become diminished in size frequency and general importance so that while in the northern solid architecture we constantly find the effect of its noblest features dependent on ranges of statues often colossal and full of abstract interest independent of their architectural service in the southern encrusted style we must expect to find the human form for the most part subordinate and diminutive and involved among designs of foliage and flowers in the manner of which endless examples had been furnished by the fantastic ornamentation of the romans from which the encrusted style had been directly derived farther in proportion to the degree in which his subject must be reduced to abstract outline will be the tendency in the sculptor to abandon naturalism of representation and subordinate every form to architectural service where the flower or animal can be hewn into bold relief there will always be a temptation to render the representation of it more complete than is necessary or even to introduce details and intricacies inconsistent with simplicity of distant effect very often a worse fault than this is committed and in the endeavour to give vitality to the stone the original ornamental purpose of the design is sacrificed or forgotten but when nothing of this kind can be attempted and a slight outline is all that the sculptor can command we may anticipate that this outline will be composed with exquisite grace and that the richness of its ornamental arrangement will atone for the feebleness of its power of portraiture on the porch of a northern cathedral we may seek for the images of the flowers that grow in the neighbouring fields and as we watch with wonder the grey stones that fret themselves into thorns and soften into blossoms we may care little that these knots of ornament as we retire from them to contemplate the whole building appear unconsidered or confused on the encrusted building we must expect no such deception of the eye or thoughts it may sometimes be difficult to determine from the involutions of its linear sculpture what were the natural forms which originally suggested them but we may confidently expect that the grace of their arrangement will always be complete that there will not be a line in them which could be taken away without injury nor one wanting which could be added with advantage farther while the sculptures of the encrusted school will thus be generally distinguished by care and purity rather than force 
and will be for the most part utterly wanting in depth of shadow there will be one means of obtaining darkness peculiarly simple and obvious and often in the sculptor's power wherever he can without danger leave a hollow behind his covering slabs or use them like glass to fill an aperture in the wall he can by piercing them with holes obtain points or spaces of intense blackness to contrast with the light tracing of the rest of his design and we may expect to find this artifice used the more extensively because while it will be an effective means of ornamentation on the exterior of the building it will be also the safest way of admitting light to the interior still totally excluding both rain and wind and it will naturally follow that the architect thus familiarized with the effect of black and sudden points of shadow will often seek to carry the same principle into other portions of his ornamentation and by deep drill holes or perhaps inlaid portions of black colour to refresh the eye where it may be wearied by the lightness of the general handling father exactly in proportion to the degree in which the force of sculpture is subdued will be the importance attached to colour as a means of effect or constituent of beauty i have above stated that the encrusted style was the only one in which perfect or permanent colour decoration was possible it is also the only one in which a true system of colour decoration was ever likely to be invented in order to understand this the reader must permit me to review with some care the nature of the principles of colouring adopted by the northern and southern nations i believe that from the beginning of the world there has never been a true or fine school of art in which colour was despised it has often been imperfectly attained and injudiciously applied but i believe it to be one of the essential signs of life in a school of art that it loves colour and i know it to be one of the first signs of death in the renaissance schools that they despised colour observe it is not now the question whether our northern cathedrals are better with colour or without perhaps the great monotone grey of nature and of time is a better colour than any that the human hand can give but that is nothing to our present business the simple fact is that the builders of those cathedrals laid upon them the brightest colours they could obtain and that there is not as far as i am aware in europe any monument of a truly noble school which has not been either painted all over or vigorously touched with paint mosaic and gilding in its prominent parts thus far egyptians greeks goths arabs and medieval christians all agree none of them when in their right senses ever think of doing without paint and therefore when i said above that the venetians were the only people who had thoroughly sympathized with the arabs in this respect i referred first to their intense love of colour which led them to lavish the most expensive decorations on ordinary dwelling-houses and secondly to that perfection of the colour instinct in them which enabled them to render whatever they did in this kind as just in principle as it was gorgeous in appliance it is this principle of theirs as distinguished from that of the northern builders which we have finally to examine in the second chapter of the first volume it was noticed that the architect of bourges cathedral liked hawthorn and that the porch of his cathedral was therefore decorated with a rich wreath of it but another of the predilections of that architect was there unnoticed namely that he did not at all like grey hawthorn but preferred it green and he painted it green accordingly as bright as he could the colour is still left in every sheltered interstice of the foliage he had in fact hardly the choice of any other colour he might have gilded the thorns by way of allegorising human life but if they were to be painted at all they could hardly be painted anything but green and green all over people would have been apt to object to any pursuit of abstract harmonies of colour which might have induced him to paint his hawthorn blue in the same way whenever the subject of the sculpture was definite its colour was of necessity definite also and in the hands of the northern builders it often became in consequence rather the means of explaining and animating the stories of their stonework rather than a matter of abstract decorative science flowers were painted red trees green and faces flesh colour the result of the whole being often far more entertaining than beautiful and also though in the lines of the mouldings and the decorations of shafts or vaults a richer and more abstract method of colouring was adopted aided by the rapid development of the best principles of colour in early glass painting the vigorous depths of shadow in the northern sculpture confused the architect's eye 
compelling him to use violent colours in the recesses if these were to be seen as colour at all, and thus injured his perception of more delicate colour harmonies, so that in innumerable instances it becomes very disputable whether monuments even of the best times were improved by the colour bestowed upon them or the contrary. But in the South, the flatness and comparatively vague forms of the sculpture, while they appeared to call for colour in order to enhance their interest, presented exactly the conditions which would set it off to the greatest advantage, breadth of surface displaying even the most delicate tints in the lights, and faintness of shadow joining with the most delicate and pearly greys of colour harmony. While the subject of the design being in nearly all cases reduced to mere intricacy of ornamental line, might be coloured in any way the architect chose without any loss of rationality where oak leaves and roses were carved into fresh relief and perfect bloom it was necessary to paint the one green and the other red but in portions of ornamentation where there was nothing which could be definitely construed into either an oak leaf or a rose but a mere labyrinth of beautiful lines becoming here something like a leaf and there something like a flower the whole tracery of the sculpture might be left white and grounded with gold or blue or treated in any other manner best harmonizing with the colours around it and as the necessary feeble character of the sculpture called for and was ready to display the best arrangements of colour, so the precious marbles in the architect's hands give him at once the best examples and the best means of colour. The best examples, for the tints of all natural stones are as exquisite in quality as endless in change, and the best means, for they are all permanent. Every motive thus concurred in urging him to the study of chromatic decoration, and every advantage was given him in the pursuit of it and this at the very moment when as presently to be noticed the naivete of barbaric christianity could only be forcibly appealed to by the help of coloured pictures so that both externally and internally the architectural construction became partly merged in pictorial effect and the whole edifice is to be regarded less as a temple wherein to pray than as itself a book of common prayer a vast illuminated missal, bound with alabaster instead of parchment, studded with porphyry pillars instead of jewels, and written within and without in letters of enamel and gold. End of chapter 4, part 3chapter 4, part 4 of The Stones of Venice, volume 2 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Stones of Venice, Volume 2 by John Ruskin. Chapter 4, St. Mark's, Part 4. Law 7. That the impression of the architecture is not to be dependent on size. And now there is but one final consequence to be deduced. The reader understands, I trust, by this time, that the claims of these several parts of the building upon his attention will depend upon their delicacy of design, their perfection of colour, their preciousness of material, and their legendary interest. All these qualities are independent of size, and partly even inconsistent with it. Neither delicacy of surface sculpture nor subtle gradations of colour can be appreciated by the eye at a distance and since we have seen that our sculpture is generally to be only an inch or two in depth, and that our colouring is in great part to be produced with the soft tints and veins of natural stones, it will follow necessarily that none of the parts of the building can be removed far from the eye, and therefore that the whole mass of it cannot be large. It is not even desirable that it should be so, for the temper in which the mind addresses itself to contemplate minute and beautiful details is altogether different from that in which it submits itself to vague impressions of space and size. And therefore we must not be disappointed, but grateful, when we find all the best work of the building concentrated within a space comparatively small, and that for the great cliff-like buttresses and mighty piers of the north shooting up into indiscernible height, we have here low walls spread before us like the pages of a book, and shafts whose capitals we may touch with our hand. The due consideration of the principles above stated will enable the traveller to judge with more candour and justice of the architecture of St. Mark's than usually it would have been possible for him to do 
while under the influence of the prejudices necessitated by familiarity with the very different schools of northern art i wish it were in my power to lay also before the general reader some exemplification of the manner in which these strange principles are developed in the lovely building but exactly in proportion to the nobility of any work is the difficulty of conveying a just impression of it and wherever i have occasion to bestow high praise there it is exactly most dangerous for me to endeavour to illustrate my meaning except by reference to the work itself and in fact the principal reason why architectural criticism is at this day so far behind all other is the impossibility of illustrating the best architecture faithfully of the various schools of painting examples are accessible to every one and reference to the works themselves is found sufficient for all purposes of criticism but there is nothing like st mark's or the ducal palace to be referred to in the national gallery and no faithful illustration of them is possible on the scale of such a volume as this and it is exceedingly difficult on any scale nothing is so rare in art as far as my own experience goes as a fair illustration of architecture perfect illustration of it does not exist for all good architecture depends upon the adaptation of its chiselling to the effect at a certain distance from the eye and to render the peculiar confusion in the midst of order and uncertainty in the midst of decision and mystery in the midst of trenchant lines which are the result of distance together with perfect expression of the peculiarities of the design requires the skill of the most admirable artist devoted to the work with the most severe conscientiousness neither the skill nor the determination having as yet been given to the subject and in the illustration of details every building of any pretensions to high architectural rank would require a volume of plates and those finished with extraordinary care with respect to the two buildings which are the principal subjects of the present volume st mark's and the ducal palace i have found it quite impossible to do them the slightest justice by any kind of portraiture and i abandoned the endeavour in the case of the latter with less regret because in the new crystal palace as the poetical public insist upon calling it though it is neither a palace nor of crystal there will be placed i believe a noble cast of one of its angles as for st mark's the effort was hopeless from the beginning for its effect depends not only upon the most delicate sculpture in every part but as we have just stated eminently on its colour also and that the most subtle variable inexpressible colour in the world the colour of glass of transparent alabaster of polished marble and lustrous gold it would be easier to illustrate a crest of scottish mountain with its purple heather and pale harebells at their fullest and fairest or a glade of jura forest with its floor of anemone and moss than a single portico of st mark's the fragment of one of its archivolts given at the bottom of the opposite plate is not to illustrate the thing itself but to illustrate the impossibility of illustration it is left a fragment in order to get it on a larger scale and yet even on this scale it is too small to show the sharp folds and points of the marble vine leaves with sufficient clearness the ground of it is gold the sculpture in the spandrels is not more than an inch and a half deep rarely so much it is in fact nothing more than an exquisite sketching of outlines in marble to about the same depth as the elgin frieze the draperies however being filled with close folds in the manner of the byzantine pictures folds especially necessary here as large masses could not be expressed in the shallow sculpture without becoming insipid but the disposition of these folds is always most beautiful and often opposed by broad and simple spaces like that obtained by the scroll in the hand of the prophet seen in the plate the balls in the archivolt project considerably and the interstices between their interwoven bands of marble are filled with colours like the illuminations of a manuscript violet crimson blue gold and green alternately but no green is ever used without an intermixture of blue pieces in the mosaic nor any blue without a little centre of pale green sometimes only a single piece of glass a quarter of an inch square so subtle was the feeling for colour which was thus to be satisfied the fact is that no two tesserae of the glass are exactly of the same tint the greens being all varied with blues the blues of different depths the reds of different clearness so that the effect of each mass of colour is full of variety like the stippled colour of a fruit piece the intermediate circles have golden stars set on an azure ground varied in the same manner 
and the small crosses seen in the intervals are alternately blue and subdued scarlet with two small circles of white set in the golden ground above and beneath them each only about half an inch across this work remember being on the outside of the building and twenty feet above the eye while the blue crosses have each a pale green centre of all this exquisitely mingled hue no plate however large or expensive could give any adequate conception but if the reader will supply in imagination to the engraving what he supplies to a common woodcut of a group of flowers the decision of the respective merits of modern and of byzantine architecture may be allowed to rest on this fragment of st mark's alone from the vine leaves of that archivolt though there is no direct imitation of nature in them but on the contrary a studious subjection to architectural purpose more particularly to be noticed hereafter we may yet receive the same kind of pleasure which we have in seeing true vine leaves and wreathed branches traced upon golden light its stars upon their azure ground ought to make us remember as its builder remembered the stars that ascend and fall in the great arch of the sky and i believe that stars and boughs and leaves and bright colours are everlastingly lovely and to be by all men beloved and moreover that church walls grimly seared with squared lines are not better nor nobler things than these i believe the man who designed and the men who delighted in that archivolt to have been wise happy and holy let the reader look back to the archivolt i have already given out of the streets of london and see what there is in it to make us any of the three let him remember that the men who design such work as that call st mark's a barbaric monstrosity and let him judge between us some farther details of the st mark's architecture and especially a general account of byzantine capitals and of the principal ones at the angles of the church will be found in the following chapter here i must pass on to the second part of our immediate subject namely the inquiry how far the exquisite and varied ornament of st mark's fits it as a temple for its sacred purpose and would be applicable in the churches of modern times we have here evidently two questions the first that wide and continually agitated one whether richness of ornament be right in churches at all the second whether the ornament of st mark's be of a truly ecclesiastical and christian character in the first chapter of the seven lamps of architecture i endeavoured to lay before the reader some reasons why churches ought to be richly adorned as being the only places in which the desire of offering a portion of all precious things to god could be legitimately expressed but i left wholly untouched the question whether the church as such stood in need of adornment or would be better fitted for its purposes by possessing it this question i would now ask the reader to deal with briefly and candidly the chief difficulty in deciding it has arisen from its being always presented to us in an unfair form it is asked of us or we ask of ourselves whether the sensation which we now feel in passing from our own modern dwelling-house through a newly built street into a cathedral of the thirteenth century be safe or desirable as a preparation for public worship but we never ask whether that sensation was at all calculated upon by the builders of the cathedral now i do not say that the contrast of the ancient with the modern building and the strangeness with which the earlier architectural forms fall upon the eye are at this day disadvantageous but i do say that their effect whatever it may be was entirely uncalculated upon by the old builder he endeavoured to make his work beautiful but never expected it to be strange and we incapacitate ourselves altogether from fair judgment of its intention if we forget that when it was built it rose in the midst of other work fanciful and beautiful as itself that every dwelling-house in the middle ages was rich with the same ornaments and quaint with the same grotesques which fretted the porches or animated the gargoyles of the cathedral that what we now regard with doubt and wonder as well as with delight was then the natural continuation into the principal edifice of the city of a style which was familiar to every eye throughout all its lanes and streets and that the architect had often no more idea of producing a peculiarly devotional impression by the richest colour and the most elaborate carving than the builder of a modern meeting-house has by his whitewashed walls and square-cut casements let the reader fix this great fact well in his mind and then follow out its important corollaries we attach in modern days a kind of sacredness to the pointed arch and the groined roof 
because while we look habitually out of square windows and live under flat ceilings we meet with the more beautiful forms in the ruins of our abbeys but when those abbeys were built the pointed arch was used for every shop door as well as for that of the cloister and the feudal baron and freebooter feasted as the monk sang under vaulted roofs not because the vaulting was thought especially appropriate to either the revel or psalm but because it was then the form in which a strong roof was easiest built we have destroyed the goodly architecture of our cities we have substituted one wholly devoid of beauty or meaning and then we reason respecting the strange effect upon our minds of the fragments which fortunately we have left in our churches as if those churches had always been designed to stand out in strong relief from all the buildings around them and gothic architecture had always been what it is now a religious language like monkish latin most readers know if they would arouse their knowledge that this was not so but they take no pains to reason the matter out they abandon themselves drowsily to the impression that gothic is a peculiarly ecclesiastical style and sometimes even that richness in church ornament is a condition or furtherance of the romish religion undoubtedly it has become so in modern times for there being no beauty in our recent architecture and much in the remains of the past and these remains being almost exclusively ecclesiastical the high church and romanist parties have not been slow in availing themselves of the natural instincts which were deprived of all food except from this source and have willingly promulgated the theory that because all the good architecture that is now left is expressive of high church or romanist doctrines all good architecture ever has been and must be so a piece of absurdity from which though here and there a country clergyman may innocently believe it i hope the common sense of the nation will soon manfully quit itself it needs but little inquiry into the spirit of the past to ascertain what once for all i would desire here clearly and forcibly to assert that wherever christian church architecture has been good and lovely it has been merely the perfect development of the common dwelling-house architecture of the period that when the pointed arch was used in the street it was used in the church when the round arch was used in the street it was used in the church when the pinnacle was set over the garret window it was set over the belfry tower when the flat roof was used for the drawing-room it was used for the nave there is no sacredness in round arches nor in pointed none in pinnacles nor in buttresses none in pillars nor in traceries churches were larger than most other buildings because they had to hold more people they were more adorned than most other buildings because they were safer from violence and were the fitting subjects of devotional offering but they were never built in any separate mystical and religious style they were built in the manner that was common and familiar to everybody at the time the flamboyant traceries that adorn the façade of rouen cathedral had once their fellows in every window of every house in the market-place the sculptures that adorn the porches of st mark's had once their match on the walls of every palace on the grand canal and the only difference between the church and the dwelling-house was that there existed a symbolical meaning in the distribution of the parts of all buildings meant for worship and that the painting or sculpture was in the one case less frequently of profane subject than in the other a more severe distinction cannot be drawn for secular history was constantly introduced into church architecture and sacred history or allusion generally formed at least one half of the ornament of the dwelling-house this fact is so important and so little considered that i must be pardoned for dwelling upon it at some length and accurately marking the limits of the assertion i have made i do not mean that every dwelling-house of medieval cities was as richly adorned and as exquisite in composition as the fronts of their cathedrals but that they presented features of the same kind often in parts quite as beautiful and that the churches were not separated by any change of style from the buildings round them as they are now but were merely more finished and full examples of a universal style rising out of the confused streets of the city as an oak tree does out of an oak copse not differing in leafage but in size and symmetry of course the quainter and smaller forms of turret and window necessary for domestic service the inferior materials often wood instead of stone and the fancy of the inhabitants which had free play in the design introduced oddnesses vulgarities and variations into house architecture which were prevented by the traditions the wealth and the skill of the monks and freemasons 
while on the other hand conditions of vaulting buttressing and arch and tower building were necessitated by the mere size of the cathedral of which it would be difficult to find examples elsewhere but there was nothing more in these features than the adaptation of mechanical skill to vaster requirements there was nothing intended to be or felt to be especially ecclesiastical in any of the forms so developed and the inhabitants of every village and city when they furnished funds for the decoration of their church desired merely to adorn the house of god as they adorned their own only a little more richly and with a somewhat graver temper in the subjects of the carving even this last difference is not always clearly discernible all manner of ribaldry occurs in the details of the ecclesiastical buildings of the north and at the time when the best of them were built to every man's house was a kind of temple a figure of the madonna or of christ almost always occupied a niche over the principal door and the old testament histories were curiously interpolated amidst the grotesques of the brackets and the gables and the reader will now perceive that the question respecting fitness of church decoration rests in reality on totally different grounds from those commonly made foundations of argument so long as our streets are walled with barren brick and our eyes rest continually in our daily life on objects utterly ugly or of inconsistent and meaningless design it may be a doubtful question whether the faculties of eye and mind which are capable of perceiving beauty having been left without food during the whole of our active life should be suddenly feasted upon entering a place of worship and colour and music and sculpture should delight the senses and stir the curiosity of men unaccustomed to such appeal at the moment when they are required to compose themselves for acts of devotion this i say may be a doubtful question but it cannot be a question at all that if once familiarized with beautiful form and color and accustomed to see in whatever human hands have executed for us even for the lowest services evidence of noble thought and admirable skill we shall desire to see this evidence also in whatever is built or labored for the house of prayer that the absence of the accustomed loveliness would disturb instead of assisting devotion and that we should feel it as vain to ask whether with our own house full of goodly craftsmanship we should worship god in a house destitute of it as to ask whether a pilgrim whose day's journey had led him through fair woods and by sweet waters must at evening turn aside into some barren place to pray then the second question submitted to us whether the ornament of st mark's be truly ecclesiastical and christian is evidently determined together with the first for if not only the permission of ornament at all but the beautiful execution of it be dependent on our being familiar with it in daily life it will follow that no style of noble architecture can be exclusively ecclesiastical it must be practised in the dwelling before it be perfected in the church and it is the test of a noble style that it shall be applicable to both for if essentially false and ignoble it may be made to fit the dwelling-house but never can be made to fit the church and just as there are many principles which will bear the light of the world's opinion yet will not bear the light of god's word while all principles which will bear the test of scripture will also bear that of practice so in architecture there are many forms which expediency and convenience may apparently justify or at least render endurable in daily use which will yet be found offensive the moment they are used for church service but there are none good for church service which cannot bear daily use thus the renaissance manner of building is a convenient style for dwelling-houses but the natural sense of all religious men causes them to turn from it with pain when it has been used in churches and this has given rise to the popular idea that the roman style is good for houses and the gothic for churches this is not so the roman style is essentially base and we can bear with it only so long as it gives us convenient windows and spacious rooms the moment the question of convenience is set aside and the expression or beauty of the style is tried by its being used in a church we find it fail but because the gothic and byzantine styles are fit for churches they are not therefore less fit for dwellings they are in the highest sense fit and good for both nor were they ever brought to perfection except where they were used for both but there is one character of byzantine work which according to the time at which it was employed may be considered as either fitting or unfitting it for distinctly ecclesiastical purposes 
I mean the essentially pictorial character of its decoration. We have already seen what large surfaces it leaves void of bold architectural features to be rendered interesting merely by surface ornament or sculpture. In this respect, Byzantine work differs essentially from pure Gothic styles, which are capable of filling every vacant space by features purely architectural, and may be rendered, if we please, altogether independent of pictorial aid. A Gothic church may be rendered impressive by mere successions of arches, accumulations of niches, and entanglements of tracery. But a Byzantine church requires expression and interesting decoration over vast plain surfaces. Decoration which becomes noble only by becoming pictorial, that is to say, by representing natural objects, men, animals, or flowers. And, therefore, the question whether the Byzantine style be fit for church service in modern days becomes involved in the inquiry what effect upon religion has been or may yet be produced by pictorial art, and especially by the art of the mosaicist. End of chapter 4, part 4《チャプター4》Part 5 of《Stones of Venice》Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《The Stones of Venice》Volume 2 by John Ruskin《Chapter 4 》St. Mark's Part 5 the more I have examined the subject, the more dangerous I have found it to dogmatize, respecting the character of the art which is likely at a given period to be most useful to the cause of religion. One great fact first meets me. I cannot answer for the experience of others, but I never yet met with a Christian whose heart was thoroughly set upon the world to come, and, so far as human judgment could pronounce, perfect and right before God, who cared about art at all. I have known several very noble Christian men who loved it intensely, but in them there was always traceable some entanglement of the thoughts with the matters of this world, causing them to fall into strange distresses and doubts, and often leading them into what they themselves would confess to be errors in understanding or even failures in duty. I do not say that these men may not, many of them, be in very deed nobler than those whose conduct is more consistent. They may be more tender in the tone of all their feelings, and farther-sighted in soul, and for that very reason exposed to greater trials and fears, than those whose hardier frame and naturally narrower vision enable them with less effort to give their hands to God and walk with Him. But still, the general fact is indeed so, that I have never known a man who seemed altogether right and calm in faith, who seriously cared about art and when casually moved by it, it is quite impossible to say beforehand by what class of art this impression will on such men be made. Very often it is by a theatrical commonplace, more frequently still by false sentiment. I believe that the four painters who have had and still have the most influence, such as it is, on the ordinary Protestant Christian mind, are Carlo Dolci, Guercino, Benjamin West, and John Martin. Raphael, much as he is talked about, is, I believe in very fact, rarely looked at by religious people, much less his master or any of the truly great religious men of old. But a smooth Magdalene of Carlo Dolci with a tear on each cheek, or a Guercino Christ or St. John, or a scripture illustration of West's, or a black cloud with a flash of lightning in it of Martin's, rarely fails of being verily, often deeply, felt for the time. There are indeed many very evident reasons for this, the chief one being that, as all truly great religious painters have been hearty Romanists, there are none of their works which do not embody in some portions of them definitely Romanist doctrines. The Protestant mind is instantly struck by these and offended by them, so as to be incapable of entering, or at least rendered indisposed to enter, farther into the heart of the work, or to the discovering those deeper characters of it which are not Romanist but Christian, in the everlasting sense and power of Christianity. Thus most Protestants, entering for the first time a paradise of Angelical, would be irrevocably offended by finding that the first person the painter wished them to speak to was St. Dominic, and would retire from such a heaven as speedily as possible, not giving themselves time to discover that, whether dressed in black or white or grey, 
and by whatever name in the calendar they might be called, the figures that filled that angelical heaven were indeed more saintly and pure and full of love in every feature than any that the human hand ever traced before or since. And thus Protestantism, having foolishly sought for the little help it requires at the hand of painting from the men who embodied no Catholic doctrine, has been reduced to receive it from those who believed neither Catholicism nor Protestantism, but who read the Bible in search of the picturesque. We thus refuse to regard the painters who passed their lives in prayer, but are perfectly ready to be taught by those who spent them in debauchery. There is perhaps no more popular Protestant picture than Salvator's Witch of Endor, of which the subject was chosen by the painter simply because, under the names of Saul and the sorceress, he could paint a captain of banditti and a Neapolitan hag. The fact seems to be that strength of religious feeling is capable of supplying for itself whatever is wanting in the rudest suggestions of art, and will either, on the one hand, purify what is coarse into inoffensiveness, or, on the other, raise what is feeble into impressiveness. Probably all art as such is unsatisfactory to it, and the effort which it makes to supply the void will be induced rather by association and accident than by the real merit of the work submitted to it. The likeness to a beloved friend, the correspondence with a habitual conception, the freedom from any strange or inoffensive particularity, and, above all, an interesting choice of incident, will win admiration for a picture when the noblest efforts of religious imagination would otherwise fail of power. How much more, when to the quick capacity of emotion is joined a childish trust that the picture does indeed represent a fact. It matters little whether the fact be well or ill told. The moment we believe the picture to be true, we complain little of its being ill-painted. Let it be considered for a moment whether the child, with its coloured print, inquiring eagerly and gravely which is Joseph and which is Benjamin, is not more capable of receiving a strong, even a sublime, impression from the rude symbol which it invests with reality by its own effort, than the connoisseur who admires the grouping of the three figures in Raphael's telling of the dreams, and whether also, when the human mind is in right religious tone, it has not always this childish power, I speak advisedly, this power, a noble one, and possessed more in youth than at any period of after life, but always, I think, restored in a measure by religion, of raising into sublimity and reality the rudest symbol which is given to it of accredited truth. Ever since the period of the Renaissance, however, the truth has not been accredited. The painter of religious subject is no longer regarded as the narrator of a fact, but as the inventor of an idea. We do not severely criticize the manner in which a true history is told, but we become harsh investigators of the faults of an invention, so that in the modern religious mind, the capacity of emotion which renders judgment uncertain is joined with an incredulity which renders it severe, and this ignorant emotion, joined with ignorant observance of faults, is the worst possible temper in which any art can be regarded, but more especially sacred art. For as religious faith renders emotion facile, so also it generally renders expression simple. That is to say, a truly religious painter will very often be ruder, quainter, simpler, and more faulty in his manner of working than a great irreligious one and it was in this artless utterance and simple acceptance on the part of both the workman and the beholder that all noble schools of art have been cradled it is in them that they must be cradled to the end of time it is impossible to calculate the enormous loss of power in modern days owing to the imperative requirement that art shall be methodical and learned for as long as the constitution of this world remains unaltered there will be more intellect in it than there can be education there will be many men capable of just sensation and vivid invention, who never will have time to cultivate or polish their natural powers. And all unpolished power is in the present state of society lost, in other things as well as in the arts, but in the arts especially. Nay, in nine cases out of ten, people mistake the polish for the power. Until a man has passed through a course of academy studentship, and can draw in an approved manner with French chalk, and knows foreshortening and perspective and something of anatomy, we do not think he can possibly be an artist. What is worse, we are very apt to think that we can make him an artist by teaching him anatomy and how to draw with French chalk. 
whereas the real gift in him is utterly independent of all such accomplishments and i believe there are many peasants on every estate and labourers in every town of europe who have imaginative powers of a high order which nevertheless cannot be used for our good because we do not choose to look at anything but what is expressed in a legal and scientific way i believe there is many a village mason who set to carve a series of scripture or any other histories would find many a strange and noble fancy in his head and set it down roughly enough indeed but in a way well worth our having but we are too grand to let him do this or to set up his clumsy work when it is done and accordingly the poor stonemason is kept hewing stones smooth at the corners and we build our church of the smooth square stones and consider ourselves wise i shall pursue this subject farther in another place but i allude to it here in order to meet the objections of those persons who suppose the mosaics of st mark's and others of the period to be utterly barbarous as representations of religious history let it be granted that they are so we are not for that reason to suppose they were ineffective in religious teaching i have above spoken of the whole church as a great book of common prayer the mosaics were its illuminations and the common people of the time were taught their scripture history by means of them more impressively perhaps though far less fully than ours are now by scripture reading they had no other bible and protestants do not often enough consider this could have no other we find it somewhat difficult to furnish our poor with printed bibles consider what the difficulty must have been when they could be given only in manuscript the walls of the church necessarily became the poor man's bible and a picture was more easily read upon the walls than a chapter under this view and considering them merely as the bible pictures of a great nation in its youth i shall finally invite the reader to examine the connection and subjects of these mosaics but in the meantime i have to deprecate the idea of their execution being in any sense barbarous i have conceded too much to modern prejudice in permitting them to be rated as mere childish efforts at coloured portraiture they have characters in them of a very noble kind nor are they by any means devoid of the remains of the science of the later roman empire the character of the features is almost always fine the expression stern and quiet and very solemn the attitudes and draperies always majestic in the single figures and in those of the groups which are not in violent action while the bright colouring and disregard of chiaroscuro cannot be regarded as imperfections since they are the only means by which the figures could be rendered clearly intelligible in the distance and darkness of the vaulting so far am i from considering them barbarous that i believe of all works of religious art whatsoever these and such as these have been the most effective they stand exactly midway between the debased manufacture of wooden and waxen images which is the support of romanist idolatry all over the world and the great art which leads the mind away from the religious subject to the art itself respecting neither of these branches of human skill is there nor can there be any question the manufacture of puppets however influential on the romanist mind of europe is certainly not deserving of consideration as one of the fine arts it matters literally nothing to a romanist what the image he worships is like take the vilest doll that is screwed together in a cheap toy shop trust it to the keeping of a large family of children let it be beaten about the house by them till it is reduced to a shapeless block then dress it in a satin frock and declare it to have fallen from heaven and it will satisfactorily answer all romanist purposes idolatry it cannot be too often repeated is no encourager of the fine arts but on the other hand the highest branches of the fine arts are no encouragers either of idolatry or of religion no picture of leonardo's or raphael's no statue of michelangelo's has ever been worshipped except by accident carelessly regarded and by ignorant persons there is less to attract in them than in commoner works carefully regarded and by intelligent persons they instantly divert the mind from their subject to their art so that admiration takes the place of devotion i do not say that the madonna di san sisto the madonna del cardellino and such others have not had considerable religious influence on certain minds but i say that on the mass of the people of europe they have had none whatever while by far the greater number of the most celebrated statues and pictures are never regarded with any other feelings than those of admiration of human beauty or reverence for human skill 
effective religious art therefore has always lain and i believe must always lie between the two extremes of barbarous idol fashioning on one side and magnificent craftsmanship on the other it consists partly in missal painting and such book illustrations as since the invention of printing have taken its place partly in glass painting partly in rude sculpture on the outsides of buildings partly in mosaics and partly in the frescoes and tempera pictures which in the fourteenth century formed the link between this powerful because imperfect religious art and the impotent perfection which succeeded it but of all these branches the most important are the inlaying and mosaic of the twelfth and thirteenth centuries represented in a central manner by these mosaics of st mark's missal painting could not from its minuteness produce the same sublime impressions and frequently merged itself in mere ornamentation of the page modern book illustration has been so little skilful as hardly to be worth naming sculpture though in some positions it becomes of great importance has always a tendency to lose itself in architectural effect and was probably seldom deciphered in all its parts by the common people still less the traditions annealed in the purple burning of the painted window finally tempera pictures and frescoes were often of limited size or of feeble colour but the great mosaics of the twelfth and thirteenth centuries covered the walls and roofs of the churches with inevitable lustre they could not be ignored or escaped from their size rendered them majestic their distance mysterious their colour attractive they did not pass into confused or inferior decorations neither were they adorned with any evidences of skill or science such as might withdraw the attention from their subjects they were before the eyes of the devotee at every interval of his worship vast shadowings forth of scenes to whose realization he looked forward or of spirits whose presence he invoked and the man must be little capable of receiving a religious impression of any kind who to this day does not acknowledge some feeling of awe as he looks up at the pale countenances and ghastly forms which haunt the dark roofs of the baptisteries of palmer and florence or remains altogether untouched by the majesty of the colossal images of apostles and of him who sent apostles that look down from the darkening gold of the domes of venice and pisa i shall in a future portion of this work endeavour to discover what probabilities there are of our being able to use this kind of art in modern churches but at present it remains for us to follow out the connection of the subjects represented in st mark's so as to fulfil our immediate object and form an adequate conception of the feelings of its builders and of its uses to those for whom it was built now there is one circumstance to which i must in the outset direct the reader's special attention as forming a notable distinction between ancient and modern days our eyes are now familiar and wearied with writing and if an inscription is put upon a building unless it be large and clear it is ten to one whether we ever trouble ourselves to decipher it but the old architect was sure of readers he knew that every one would be glad to decipher all that he wrote that they would rejoice in possessing the vaulted leaves of his stone manuscript and that the more he gave them the more grateful would the people be we must take some pains therefore when we enter st mark's to read all that is inscribed or we shall not penetrate into the feeling either of the builder or of his times a large atrium or portico is attached to two sides of the church a space which was specially reserved for unbaptized persons and new converts it was thought right that before their baptism these persons should be led to contemplate the great facts of the old testament history the history of the fall of man and of the lives of patriarchs up to the period of the covenant by moses the order of the subjects in this series being very nearly the same as in many northern churches but significantly closing with the fall of the manor in order to mark to the catechumen the insufficiency of the mosaic covenant for salvation our fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead and to turn his thoughts to the true bread of which that manna was the type then when after his baptism he was permitted to enter the church over its main entrance he saw on looking back a mosaic of christ enthroned with the virgin on one side and st mark on the other in attitudes of adoration christ is represented as holding a book open upon his knee on which is written i am the door by me if any man enter in he shall be saved 
On the red marble moulding which surrounds the mosaic is written, I am the gate of life. Let those who are mine enter by me. Above, on the red marble fillet which forms the cornice of the west end of the church, is written, with reference to the figure of Christ below, who he was, and from whom he came, and at what price he redeemed thee, and why he made thee, and gave thee all things, do thou consider. Now observe, this was not to be seen and read only by the catechumen when he first entered the church. Every one who at any time entered was supposed to look back and to read this writing. Their daily entrance into the church was thus made a daily memorial of their first entrance into the spiritual church, and we shall find that the rest of the book which was opened for them upon its walls continually led them in the same manner to regard the visible temple as in every part a type of the invisible church of God. Therefore, the mosaic of the first dome, which is over the head of the spectator as soon as he has entered by the great door, that door being the type of baptism, represents the effusion of the Holy Spirit, as the first consequence and seal of the entrance into the Church of God. In the centre of the cupola is the dove, enthroned in the Greek manner as the Lamb is enthroned, when the divinity of the second and third persons is to be insisted upon together with their peculiar offices. From the central symbol of the Holy Spirit, twelve streams of fire descend upon the heads of the twelve apostles, who are represented standing around the dome, and below them, between the windows which are pierced in its walls, are represented, by groups of two figures for each separate people, the various nations who heard the apostles speak, at Pentecost, every man in his own tongue. Finally, on the vaults, at the four angles which support the cupola, are pictured four angels, each bearing a tablet upon the end of a rod in his hand. On each of the tablets of the three first angels is inscribed the word Holy. On that of the fourth is written Lord. And the beginning of the hymn being thus put into the mouths of the four angels, the words of it are continued around the border of the dome, uniting praise to God for the gift of the Spirit, with welcome to the redeemed soul received into his church. Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And observe in this writing that the convert is required to regard the outpouring of the Holy Spirit especially as a work of sanctification. It is the holiness of God manifested in the giving of his Spirit to sanctify those who had become his children, which the four angels celebrate in their ceaseless praise, and it is on account of this holiness that the heaven and earth are said to be full of his glory. After thus hearing praise rendered to God by the angels for the salvation of the newly entered soul, it was thought fittest that the worshipper should be led to contemplate, in the most comprehensive forms possible, the past evidence and the future hopes of Christianity, as summed up in three facts without assurance of which all faith is vain, namely that Christ died, that he rose again, and that he ascended into heaven there to prepare a place for his elect. On the vault between the first and second cupolas are represented the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, with the usual series of intermediate scenes, the treason of Judas, the judgment of Pilate, the crowning with thorns, the descent into Hades, the visit of the women to the sepulchre, and the apparition to Mary Magdalene. The second cupola itself, which is the central and principal one of the church, is entirely occupied by the subject of the ascension. At the highest point of it, Christ is represented as rising into the blue heaven, borne up by four angels and throned upon a rainbow, the type of reconciliation. Beneath him, the twelve apostles are seen upon the Mount of Olives, with the Madonna, and, in the midst of them, the two men in white apparel who appeared at the moment of the Ascension, above whom, as uttered by them, are inscribed the words, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This Christ, the Son of God, as he is taken from you, shall so come the arbiter of the earth, trusted to do judgment and justice. Beneath the circle of the apostles, between the windows of the cupola, are represented the Christian virtues, as sequent upon the crucifixion of the flesh and the spiritual ascension together with Christ. 
Beneath them, on the vaults which support the angles of the cupola, are placed the four evangelists, because on their evidence our assurance of the fact of the ascension rests. And finally, beneath their feet, as symbols of sweetness and fullness of the gospel which they declared, are represented the four rivers of paradise, Pison, Gihon, Tigris, and Euphrates. The third cupola, that over the altar, represents the witness of the Old Testament to Christ, showing him enthroned in its centre, and surrounded by the patriarchs and prophets. But this dome was little seen by the people. Their contemplation was intended to be chiefly drawn to that of the centre of the church, and thus the mind of the worshipper was at once fixed on the main groundwork and hope of Christianity. Christ is risen, and Christ shall come. If he had time to explore the minor lateral chapels and cupolas, he could find in them the whole series of New Testament history, the events of the life of Christ, and the apostolic miracles in their order, and finally the scenery of the book of Revelation. But if he only entered, as often the common people do to this hour, snatching a few moments before beginning the labour of the day to offer up an ejaculatory prayer, and advanced but from the main entrance as far as the altar-screen, all the splendour of the glittering nave and variegated dome, if they smote upon his heart, as they might often, in strange contrast with his reed cabin among the shallows of the lagoon, smote on it only that they might proclaim the two great messages, Christ is risen, and Christ shall come. Daily, as the white cupolas rose like wreaths of sea-foam in the dawn, while the shadowy campanile and frowning palace were still withdrawn into the night, they rose with the Easter voice of triumph, Christ is risen. And daily, as they looked down upon the tumult of the people, deepening and eddying in the wide square that opened from their feet to the sea, they uttered above them the sentence of warning, Christ shall come. And this thought may surely dispose the reader to look with some change of temper upon the gorgeous building and wild blazonry of that shrine of St. Mark's, he now perceives that it was in the hearts of the old Venetian people far more than a place of worship. It was at once a type of the redeemed church of God, and a scroll for the written word of God. It was to be to them both an image of the bride, all glorious within, her clothing of wrought gold, and the actual table of the law and the testimony, written within and without. And whether honoured as the church or as the Bible, was it not fitting that neither the gold nor the crystal should be spared in the adornment of it, that, as the symbol of the bride, the building of the wall thereof should be of jasper, and the foundations of it garnished with all manner of precious stones, and that, as the channel of the word, that triumphant utterance of the psalmist should be true of it, I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. And shall we not look with changed temper down the long perspective of St. Mark's place, towards the sevenfold gates and glowing domes of its temple, when we know with what solemn purpose the shafts of it were lifted above the pavement of the populous square? Men met there from all countries of the earth for traffic or for pleasure. But above the crowd swaying forever to and fro in the restlessness of avarice or first of delight, was seen perpetually the glory of the temple, attesting to them, whether they would hear or whether they would forbear, that there was one treasure which the merchantman might buy without a price, and one delight better than all others in the word and the statutes of God. Not in the wantonness of wealth, not in vain ministry to the desire of the eyes or the pride of life, were those marbles hewn into transparent strength, and those arches arrayed in the colours of the iris. There is a message written in the dyes of them, that once was written in blood, and a sound in the echoes of their vaults, that one day shall fill the vault of heaven. He shall return, to do judgment and justice. The strength of Venice was given her so long as she remembered this. Her destruction found her when she had forgotten this, and it found her irrevocably, because she forgot it without excuse. Never had a city a more glorious Bible, among the nations of the north, a rude and shadowy sculpture filled their temples with confused and hardly legible imagery. But, for her, the skill and the treasures of the east had gilded every letter, 
and illumined every page till the book temple shone from afar off like the star of the magi in other cities the meetings of the people were often in places withdrawn from religious association subject to violence and to change and on the grass of the dangerous rampart and in the dust of the troubled street there were deeds done and counsels taken which if we cannot justify we may sometimes forgive but the sins of venice whether in her palace or in her piazza were done with the bible at her right hand the walls on which its testimony was written were separated but by a few inches of marble from those which guarded the secrets of her councils or confined the victims of her policy and when in her last hours she threw off all shame and all restraint and the great square of the city became filled with the madness of the whole earth be it remembered how much her sin was greater because it was done in the face of the house of god burning with the letters of his law mountebank and masker laughed their laugh and went their way and a silence has followed them not unforetold for amidst them all through century after century of gathering vanity and festering guilt that white dome of st mark's had uttered in the dead ear of venice know thou that for all these things god will bring thee into judgment End of chapter 4, part 5chapter five part one of the stones of venice volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by malone the stones of venice volume two by john ruskin byzantine palaces part one the account of the architecture of st mark's given in the previous chapter has i trust acquainted the reader sufficiently with the spirit of the byzantine style but he has probably as yet no clear idea of its generic forms nor would it be safe to define these after an examination of st mark's alone built as it was upon various models and at various periods but if we pass through the city looking for buildings which resemble st mark's first in the most important feature of incrustation secondly in the character of the mouldings we shall find a considerable number not indeed very attractive in their first address to the eye but agreeing perfectly both with each other and with the earliest portions of st mark's in every important detail and to be regarded therefore with profound interest as indeed the remains of an ancient city of venice altogether different in aspect from that which now exists from these remains we may with safety deduce general conclusions touching the forms of byzantine architecture as practiced in eastern italy during the eleventh twelfth and thirteenth centuries they agree in another respect as well as in style all are either ruins or fragments disguised by restoration not one of them is uninjured or unaltered and the impossibility of finding so much as an angle or a single story in perfect condition is a proof hardly less convincing than the method of their architecture that they were indeed raised during the earliest phases of the venetian power the mere fragments dispersed in narrow streets and recognizable by a single capital or the segment of an arch i shall not enumerate but of important remains there are six in the immediate neighborhood of the rialto one in the rio di Cafoscari, and one conspicuously placed opposite the great renaissance palace known as the vendramin caligari 
one of the few palaces still inhabited and well maintained, and noticeable, moreover, as having a garden beside it, rich with evergreens, and decorated by gilded railings and white statues that cast long streams of snowy reflection down into the deep water. The vista of canal beyond is terminated by the church of Santa Jeremia, another but less attractive work of the Renaissance. A mass of barren brickwork, with a dull leaden dome above, like those of our national gallery, so that the spectator has the richest and meanest of the late architecture of Venice before him at once. The richest, let him observe, a piece of private luxury. The poorest, that which was given to God. Then, looking to the left, he will see the fragment of the work of earlier ages, testifying against both, not less by its utter desolation than by the nobleness of the traces that are still left of it. It is a ghastly ruin, whatever is venerable or sad in its wreck being disguised by attempts to put it to present uses of the basest kind. It has been composed of arcades borne by marble shafts, and the walls of brick faced with marble, but the covering stones have been torn away from it like the shroud from a corpse, and its walls, rent into a thousand chasms, are filled and refilled with fresh brickwork, and the seams and hollows are choked with clay and whitewash, oozing and trickling over the marble, itself blanched into dusty decay by the frosts of centuries. Soft grass and wandering leafage have rooted themselves in the rents, but they are not suffered to grow in their own wild and gentle way, for the place is in a sort inhabited. Rotten partitions are nailed across its corridors, and miserable rooms contrived in its western wing, and here and there the weeds are indolently torn down, leaving their haggard fibers to struggle again into unwholesome growth when the spring next stirs them. And thus, in contest between death and life, the unsightly heap is festering to its fall. Of its history, little is recorded, and that little futile. That it once belonged to the Dukes of Ferrara, and was bought from them in the sixteenth century to be made a general receptacle for the goods of the Turkish merchants, whence it is now generally known as the Fondaco or Fontico di Turchi, are just as important to the antiquary as that in the year 1852 the municipality of Venice allowed its lower story to be used for a deposito di tabacchi. Neither of this, nor any other remains of the period, can we know anything but what their own stones will tell us. The reader will find in Appendix 11, written chiefly for the traveler's benefit, an account of the situation and present state of the other seven Byzantine palaces. Here I shall only give a general account of the most interesting points in their architecture. They all agree in being round-arched and encrusted with marble, but there are only six in which the original disposition of the parts is anywise traceable, namely those distinguished in the appendix as the Fondaco de Turchi, Casa Loredan, Casa Farsetti, Rio Foscari House, Terraced House, and Madonetta House. And these six agree further in having continuous arcades along their entire fronts, from one angle to the other and in having their arcades divided, in each case, into a center and wings, both by greater size in the midmost arches, and by the alternation of shafts in the center with pilasters, or with small shafts at the flanks. So far as their structure can be traced, 
They agree also in having tall and few arches in their lower stories, and shorter and more numerous arches above. But it happens, most unfortunately, that in the only two cases in which the second stories are left, the ground floors are modernized, and in the others where the sea stories are left, the second stories are modernized, so that we never have more than two tiers of the Byzantine arches, one above the other. These, however, are quite enough to show the first main point on which I wish to insist, namely, the subtlety of the feeling for proportion in the Greek architects, and I hope that even the general reader will not allow himself to be frightened by the look of a few measurements, for, if he will only take the little pains necessary to compare them, he will, I am almost certain, find the result not devoid of interest. I had intended originally to give elevations of all these palaces, but have not had time to prepare plates requiring so much labor and care. I must therefore explain the position of their parts in the simplest way in my power. The Fondaco de Turki has sixteen arches in its sea story, and twenty-six above them in its first story. The whole, based on a magnificent foundation, built of blocks of red marble, some of them seven feet long by a foot and a half thick, and raised to a height of about five feet above high water mark. At this level, the elevation of one half of the building, from its flank to the central pillars of its arcades, is rudely given in figure four in the previous page. It is only drawn to show the arrangement of the parts as the sculptures, which are indicated by the circles and upright oblongs between the arches, are too delicate to be shown in a sketch three times the size of this. The building once was crowned with an Arabian parapet, but it was taken down some years since, and I am aware of no authentic representation of its details. The greater part of the sculptures between the arches, indicated in the woodcut only by blank circles, have also fallen, or been removed. But enough remain on the two flanks to justify the representation given in the diagram of their original arrangement. And now observe the dimensions. The small arches of the wings in the ground story, A, 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 measure in breadth from shaft to shaft, four feet, five inches, interval B, seven feet, six and a half inches, interval C, seven feet, eleven inches, intervals D, E, F, and so on, eight feet, one inch. The difference between the width of the arches B and C is necessitated by the small recess of the cornice on the left hand, as compared with that of the great capitals. But this sudden difference of half a foot between the two extreme arches of the center offended the builder's eye, so he diminished the next one unnecessarily two inches, and thus obtained the gradual cadence to the flanks from eight feet down to four and a half in a series of continually increasing steps of course, the effect cannot be shown in the diagram, as the first difference is less than the thickness of its lines. In the upper story, the capitals are all nearly of the same height, and there was no occasion for the difference between the extreme arches. Its twenty-six arches are placed, four small ones above each lateral three of the lower arcade, and eighteen larger above the central ten thus throwing the shafts into all manner of relative positions, and completely confusing the eye in any effort to count them. But there is an exquisite symmetry running through their apparent confusion, for it will be seen that the four arches in each flank are arranged in two groups, of which one has a large single shaft in the center, and the other a pilaster and two small shafts, 
The way in which the large shaft is used as an echo of those in the central arcade, dovetailing them, as it were, into the system of the pilasters, just as a great painter passing from one tone of color to another repeats over a small space that which he has left, is highly characteristic of the Byzantine care in composition. There are other evidences of it in the arrangement of the capitals, which will be noticed below in the seventh chapter. The lateral arches of this upper arcade measure three feet two inches across, and the central three feet eleven inches, so that the arches in the building are altogether of six magnitudes. Next, let us take the Casa Loredan. The mode of arrangement of its pillars is precisely like that of the Fondaco de Turchi, so that I shall merely indicate them by vertical lines in order to be able to letter the intervals. It has five arches in the center of the lower story and two in each of its wings. The midmost interval A of the central five is six feet one inch. The two on each side, B, B, five feet two inches. The two extremes, C, C, four feet nine inches. Inner arches of the wings, D, D, four feet four inches. Outer arches of the wings, E, E, four feet six inches. The gradation of these dimensions is visible at a glance, the boldest step being here taken nearest the center, while in the Fodaco it is furthest from the center. The first loss here is of eleven inches, the second of five, the third of five, and then there is a most subtle increase of two inches in the extreme arches, as if to contradict the principle of diminution and stop the falling away of the building by firm resistance at its flanks. I could not get the measures of the upper story accurately, the palace having been closed all the time I was in Venice. But it has seven central arches above the five below, and three at the flanks above the two below, the groups being separated by double shafts. Again, in the Casa Farsetti, the lower story has a center of five arches and wings of two. Referring, therefore, to the last figure, which will answer for this palace also, the measures of the intervals are A, 8 feet 0 inches, B, 5 feet 10 inches, C, 5 feet 4 inches, D and E, 5 feet 3 inches. It is, however, possible that the interval C and the wing arches may have been intended to be similar, for one of the wing arches measures five feet four inches. We have thus a simpler proportion than any we have hitherto met with, only two losses taking place, the first of two feet two inches, the second of six inches. The upper story has a central group of seven arches, whose widths are four feet one inch. The next arch on each side, three feet, five inches. The three arches of each wing, three feet, six inches. Here again we have a most curious instance of the subtlety of eye, which was not satisfied without a third dimension, but could be satisfied with a difference of an inch on three feet and a half. In the terraced house, the ground floor is modernized, but the first story is composed of a center of five arches, with wings of two, measuring as follows. The midmost arches of the central group, four feet, zero inches. Outermost arch of the central group, four feet, six inches. Innermost arch of the wing, four feet, ten inches. Outermost arch of the wing, five feet, zero inches. Here the greatest step is towards the center, but the increase, which is usual, is towards the outside, the gain being successively six, four, and two inches. I could not obtain the measures of the second story, in which only the central group is left, 
but the two outermost arches are visibly larger than the others, thus beginning a correspondent proportion to the one below, of which the lateral quantities have been destroyed by restorations. Finally, in the Rio Foscari house, the central arch is the principal feature, and the four lateral ones form one magnificent wing, the dimensions being from the center to the side, central arch nine feet nine inches, second arch three feet eight inches, third arch three feet ten inches, fourth arch three feet ten inches, fifth arch three feet eight inches. The difference of two inches or nearly three feet in the two midmost arches being all that was necessary to satisfy the builder's eye. I need not point out to the reader that these singular and minute harmonies of proportion indicate, beyond all dispute, not only that the buildings in which they are found are of one school, but, so far as these subtle coincidences of measurement can still be traced in them, in their original form. No modern builder has any idea of connecting his arches in this manner, and restorations in Venice are carried on with two violent hands to admit of the supposition that such refinements would be even noticed in the progress of demolition, much less imitated in heedless reproduction. And as if to direct our attention especially to this character, as indicative of Byzantine workmanship. The most interesting example of all will be found in the arches of the front of St. Mark's itself, whose proportions I have not noticed before, in order that they might here be compared with those of the contemporary palaces. The doors actually employed for entrance in the western façade are, as usual, five, arranged at A, in the annex woodcut, figure 5. But the Byzantine builder could not be satisfied with so simple a group, and he introduced, therefore, two minor arches at the extremities, as at B, by adding two small porticos, which are of no use whatever except to consummate the proportions of the façade and themselves to exhibit the most exquisite proportions and arrangement of shaft and archivolt with which I am acquainted in the entire range of European architecture. In these minor particulars I cannot here enter, but observe the dimensions of the range of arches in the façade, as thus completed by the flanking porticos. The space of its central archivolt is 31 feet 8 inches the two on each side about 19 feet 8 inches, the two succeeding about 20 feet 4 inches, small arches at flanks 6 feet 0 inches. I need not make any comment upon the subtle difference of 8 inches on 20 feet between the second and third dimensions. If the reader will be at the pains to compare the whole evidence now laid before him, with that deduced above from the apse of Murano, he cannot but confess that it amounts to an irrefragable proof of an intense perception of harmony in the relation of quantities on the part of the Byzantine architects, a perception which we have at present lost so utterly as hardly to be able even to conceive it. And let it not be said, as it was of the late discoveries of subtle curvature in the Parthenon, that what is not to be demonstrated without laborious measurement cannot have influence on the beauty of the design. The eye is continually influenced by what it cannot detect. Nay, it is not going too far to say that it is most influenced by what it detects least. Let the painter define, if he can, the variations of lines on which depend the changes of expression in the human countenance. The greater he is, the more he will feel their subtlety, and the intense difficulty of perceiving all their relations, or answering for the consequences of a variation of a hair's breadth in a single curve. 
Indeed, there is nothing truly noble either in color or in form, but its power depends on circumstances infinitely too intricate to be explained, and almost too subtle to be traced. And as for these Byzantine buildings, we only do not feel them because we do not watch them. Otherwise, we should as much enjoy the variety of proportion in their arches as we do at present that of the natural architecture of flowers and leaves. Any of us can feel in an instant the grace of the leaf group B in the next figure. And yet that grace is simply owing to its being proportioned like the façade of St. Mark's, each leaflet answering to an arch, the smallest at the root to those of the porticos. I have tried to give the proportion quite accurately in B, but as the difference between the second and third leaflets is hardly discernible on so small a scale, it is somewhat exaggerated in A. Nature is often far more subtle in her proportions. In looking at some of the nobler species of lilies, full in the front of the flower, we may fancy for a moment that they form a symmetrical six-petaled star, but on examining them more closely we shall find that they are thrown into a group of three magnitudes by the expansion of two of the inner petals above the stamens to a breadth greater than any of the four others, while the third inner petal, on which the stamens rest, contracts itself into the narrowest of the six and the three under petals remain of one intermediate magnitude, as seen in the next figure. I must not, however, weary the reader with this subject, which has always been a favorite one with me, and is apt to lead too far. We will return to the palaces on the Grand Canal. Admitting, then, that their fragments are proved by the minute correspondences of their arrangement, to be still in their original positions, they indicate to us a form, whether of palace or dwelling house, in which there were universally central galleries or loggias, opening into apartments on each wing, the amount of light admitted being immense, and the general proportions of the building, slender, light, and graceful in the utmost degree, it being, in fact, little more than an aggregate of shafts and arches. Of the interior disposition of these palaces, there is in no instance the slightest trace left, nor am I well enough acquainted with the existing architecture of the East to risk any conjecture on this subject. I pursue the statement of the facts which still are ascertainable respecting their external forms. In every one of the buildings above mentioned, except the Rio Foscari house, which has only one great entrance between its wings, the central arcades are sustained, at least in one story, and generally in both, on bold, detached, cylindrical shafts with rich capitals, while the arches of the wings are carried on smaller shafts assisted by portions of wall which become pilasters of greater or less width. And now I must remind the reader of what was pointed out above, that there are two great orders of capitals in the world, that one of these is convex in its contour, the other concave, and that richness of ornament, with all freedom of fancy, is for the most part found in the one, and severity of ornament, with stern discipline of the fancy, in the other. Of these two families of capitals, both occur in the Byzantine period, but the concave group is the longest lived, and extends itself into the Gothic times. In the account which I gave them in the first volume, they were illustrated by giving two portions of a simple curve, that of a salvia leaf. We must now investigate their characters more in detail and these may be best generally represented by considering both families as formed upon the types of flowers, the one upon that of the water lily, the other upon that of the convolvolus. There was no intention in the Byzantine architects to imitate 
either one or the other of these flowers, but as I have already so often repeated, all beautiful works of art must either intentionally imitate or accidentally resemble natural forms, and the direct comparison with the natural forms which these capitals most resemble is the likeliest mode of fixing their distinctions in the reader's mind. The one of them, the convex family, is modeled according to the commonest shapes of that great group of flowers which form rounded cups, like that of the water lily, the leaves springing horizontally from the stalk and closing together upwards. The rose is of this family, but her cup is filled with the luxuriance of her leaves. The crocus, campanula, ranunculus, and enemy, and most all the loveliest children of the field, are formed upon the same type. The other family resembles the convolvulus, trumpet flower, and such others in which the lower part of the bell is slender and the lip curves upwards at the top. There are fewer flowers constructed on this than the convex model, but in the organization of trees and clusters of herbage it is seen continually. Of course, both of these conditions are modified when applied to capitals by the enormously greater thickness of the stalk or shaft, but in other respects the parallelism is close and accurate, and the reader had better at once fix the flower outlines in his mind and remember them as representing the only two orders of capitals that the world has ever seen, or can see. The examples of the concave family in the Byzantine times are found principally either in large capitals, founded on the Greek Corinthian, used chiefly for the nave pillars of churches, or in the small lateral shafts of the palaces. It appears somewhat singular that the pure Corinthian form should have been reserved almost exclusively for nave pillars, as at Torcello, Murano, and St. Mark's. It occurs indeed, together with almost every other form, on the exterior of St. Mark's also, but never so definitely as in the nave and transept shafts. Of the conditions assumed by it at Torcello, enough has been said and one of the most delicate of the varieties occurring in St. Mark's is given in Plate 8, Figure 15. Remarkable for the cutting of the sharp thistle-like leaves into open relief, so that the light sometimes shines through them from behind, and for the beautiful curling of the extremities of the leaves outwards, joining each other at the top, as in an undivided flower. The other characteristic examples of the concave groups in the Byzantine times are as simple as those resulting from the Corinthian are rich. They occur on the small shafts at the flanks of the Fondaco dei Turchi, the Casa Farsetti, Casa Loredan, Terraced House, and the upper story of the Maronetta House. In forms so exactly similar that the two figures one and two in plate eight may sufficiently represent them all. They consist merely of portions cut out of the plinths or string courses which run along all the faces of these palaces by four truncations in the form of arrowy leaves. Figure one, Fondaco de Turchi. And the whole rounded a little at the bottom so as to fit the shaft. When they occur between two arches, they assume the form of the group figure two, terraced house. Figure three is from the central arches of the Casa Farsetti, and is only given because either it is a later restoration or a form absolutely unique in the Byzantine period. The concave group, however, was not naturally pleasing to the Byzantine mind. Its own favorite capital was of the bold convex or cushion shape, so conspicuous in all the buildings of the period that I have devoted plate seven opposite entirely to its illustration. The form in which it is first used is practically obtained from a square block laid on the head of the shaft, figure one in plate seven, by first cutting off the lower corners, as in figure two, 
and then rounding the edges, as in figure 3. This gives us the bell stone. On this is laid a simple abacus, as seen in figure 4, which is the actual form used in the upper arcade of Murano, and the framework of the capital is complete. Figure 5 shows the general manner and effect of its decoration on the same scale. The other figures, 6 and 7, both form the apse of Murano, 8, from the terraced house, and 9, from the baptistry of St. Mark's, show the method of chiseling the surfaces in capitals of average richness, such as occur everywhere, for there is no limit to the fantasy and beauty of the more elaborate examples. In consequence of the peculiar affection, entertained for these massive forms by the Byzantines, they were apt, when they used any condition of capital founded on the Corinthian, to modify the concave profile by making it bulge out at the bottom. Figure 1a, plate 10, is the profile of a capital of the pure concave family, and observe it needs a fillet or cord around the neck of the capital to show where it separates from the shaft. Figure 4a, on the other hand, is the profile of the pure convex group, which not only needs no such projecting fillet, but would be encumbered by it, while figure 2a is the profile of one of the Byzantine capitals, Fondaco de Turki, lower arcade, founded on Corinthian, of which the main sweep is concave, but which bends below into the convex bell shape where it joins the shaft. And lastly, figure 3a is the profile of the nave shafts of St. Mark's, where, though very delicately granted, the concession to the Byzantine temper is twofold, first at the spring of the curve from the base, and secondly the top, where it again becomes convex though the expression of the Corinthian bell is still given to it by the bold concave leaves. These, then, being the general modifications of Byzantine profiles, I have thrown together in plate 8 opposite some of the most characteristic examples of the decoration of the concave and transitional types. Their localities are given in the note below, and the following are the principal points to be observed respecting them. The purest concave forms, one and two, were never decorated in the earliest times, except sometimes by an incision or rib down the center of their truncations on the angles. Figures four, five, six, and seven show some of the modes of application of a, a peculiarly broad-lobed acanthus leaf very characteristic of native Venetian work. Four and five are from the same building, two out of a group of four, and show the boldness of the variety admitted in the management even of the capitals most closely derived from the Corinthian. I never saw one of these Venetian capitals in all respects like another. The trefoils into which the leaves fall at the extremities are, however, for the most part similar, though variously disposed and generally niche themselves one under the other, as very characteristically in figure 7. The form 8 occurs in St. Mark's only, and there very frequently. 9 at Venice occurs, I think, in St. Mark's only, but it is a favorite early Lombardic form. 10, 11, and 12 are all highly characteristic. 10 occurs with more fantastic interweaving upon its sides in the upper stories of St. Mark's. 11 is derived in the Casa Loredan from the great lily capitals of St. Mark's, of which more presently. 13 and 15 are peculiar to St. Mark's. 14 is a lovely condition occurring both there and in the Fondaco de Torqui. The modes in which the separate portions of the leaves are executed in these and other Byzantine capitals will be noticed more at length hereafter. Here I only wish the reader to observe two things. 
both with respect to these and the capitals of the concave family on the former plate. First, the life. Secondly, the breadth of these capitals as compared with Greek forms. End of section 11. Reading by Malone. Chapter 5, Part 2 of The Stones of Venice, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Malone. The Stones of Venice, Volume 2, by John Ruskin. Byzantine Palaces. I say, first, the life. Not only is every one of these capitals differently fancied, but there are many of them which have no two sides alike. Figure 5, for instance, varies on every side in the arrangement of the pendant leaf in its center. Figure 6 has a different plant on each side of its four upper angles. The birds are each cut with a different play of plumage in figures 9 and 12 and the vine leaves are every one varied in their proportion in figure 13. But this is not all. The differences in the character of ornamentation between them and the Greek capitals all show a greater love of nature. The leaves are, every one of them, more founded on realities, sketched, however rudely, more directly from the truth and are continually treated in a manner which shows the mind of the workman to have been among the living herbage, not among Greek precedents. The hard outlines in which, for the sake of perfect intelligibility, I have left this plate, have deprived the examples of the vitality of their light and shade. But the reader can nevertheless observe the ideas of life occurring perpetually. At the top of figure 4, for instance, the small leaves turn sideways. In figure 5, the formal volutes of the old Corinthian transformed into a branching tendril. In figure 6, the bunch of grapes thrown carelessly in at the right-hand corner, in defiance of all symmetry. In figure 7, the volutes knitted into wreaths of ivy. In figure 14, the leaves drifted, as it were, by a whirlwind around the capital by which they rise, while figures 13 and 15 are as completely living leaves as any of the Gothic time. These designs may or may not be graceful. What grace or beauty they have is not to be rendered in mere outline, but they are indisputably more natural than any Greek ones, and therefore healthier and tending to greatness. In the second place, note in all these examples the excessive breadth of the masses, however afterwards they may be filled with detail. Whether we examine the contour of the simpler convex bells, or those of the leaves which bend outwards from the richer and more Corinthian types, we find they are all outlined by grand and simple curves, and that the whole of their minute fretwork and thistlework is cast into a gigantic mold which subdues all their multitudinous points and foldings to its own inevitable dominion. And the fact is that in the sweeping lines and broad surfaces of these Byzantine sculptures we obtain, so far as I know, for the first time in the history of art, the germ of that unity of perfect ease in every separate part, with perfect subjection to an enclosing form or directing impulse, which was brought to its most intense expression in the compositions of the two men in whom the art of Italy consummated itself and expired, Tintoret and Michelangelo. I would not attach too much importance to the mere habit of working on the rounded surface of the stone, which is often as much the result of haste or rudeness as of the desire for breadth, though the result obtained is not the less beautiful. 
But in the capital from the Fondaco de Turki, figure 6, it will be seen that while the sculptor had taken the utmost care to make his leaves free, graceful, and sharp in effect, he was dissatisfied with their separation, and could not rest until he had enclosed them with an unbroken line, like that of a pointed arch. And the same thing is done in many different ways in other capitals of the same building, and in many of St. Mark's. But one such instance would have been enough to prove, if the loveliness of the profiles themselves did not do so, that the sculptor understood and loved the laws of generalization, and that the feeling which bound his prickly leaves, as they waved or drifted round the ridges of his capital, into those broad masses of unbroken flow, was indeed one with that which made Michelangelo encompass the principal figure in his creation of Adam, with the broad curve of its cloudy drapery. It may seem strange to assert any connection between so great a conception and these rudely hewn fragments of ruined marble, but all the highest principles of art are as universal as they are majestic, and there is nothing too small to receive their influence. They rule at once the waves of the mountain outline and the sinuosities of the minutest lichen that stains its shattered stones. We have not yet spoken of the three braided and checkered capitals numbered 10, 11, and 12. They are representations of a group with which many most interesting associations are connected. It was noticed in the last chapter that the method of covering the exterior of buildings with thin pieces of marble was likely to lead to a system of lighting the interior by minute perforation. In order to obtain both light and air, without admitting any unbroken body of sunshine in warm countries, it became a constant habit of the Arabian architects to pierce minute and star-like openings in slabs of stone and to employ the stones so pierced where the Gothic architects employ traceries. Internally, the form of stars assumed by the light as it entered was, in itself, an exquisite decoration. But externally, it was felt necessary to add some slight ornament upon the surface of the perforated stone. And it was soon found that, as the small perforations had a tendency to look scattered and spotty, the most effective treatment of the intermediate surfaces would be one which bound them together, and gave unity and repose to the pierced and disturbed stone. Universally, therefore, those intermediate spaces were carved into the semblance of interwoven fillets which alternately sank beneath and rose above each other as they met. This system of braided or woven ornament was not confined to the Arabs. It is universally pleasing to the instinct of mankind. I believe that nearly all early ornamentation is full of it, more especially perhaps Scandinavian and Anglo-Saxon, and illuminated manuscripts depend upon it for their loveliest effects of intricate color, up to the close of the 13th century. There are several very interesting metaphysical reasons for this strange and unfailing delight, felt in a thing so simple. It is not often that any idea of utility has power to enhance the true impressions of beauty. But it is possible that the enormous importance of the art of weaving to mankind may give some interest, if not actual attractiveness, to any type or image of the invention to which we owe at once our comfort and our pride. But the more profound reason lies in the innate love of mystery and unity, in the joy that the human mind has in contemplating any kind of maze or entanglement so long as it can discern, through its confusion, any guiding clue or connecting plan. A pleasure increased and solemnized by some dim feeling of the setting forth by such symbols of the intricacy and alternate rise and fall, subjection and supremacy of human fortune. 
the weave the warp and weave the woof of fate and time. But be this as it may, the fact is that we are never tired of contemplating this woven involution, and that in some degree, the sublime pleasure which we have in watching the branches of trees, the intertwining of the grass, and the tracery of the higher clouds is owing to it, not less than that which we receive from the fine meshes of the robe, the braiding of the hair, and the various glittering of the linked net or wreathed chain. Byzantine ornamentation, like that of almost all nations in a state of progress, is full of this kind of work. But it occurs most conspicuously, though most simply, in the minute traceries which surround their most solid capitals, sometimes merely in a reticulated veil, as in the tenth figure in the plate, sometimes resembling a basket, on the edges of which are perched birds or other animals. The diamonded ornament in the eleventh figure is substituted for it in the Casa Loridan, and marks a somewhat later time and a tendency to the ordinary Gothic checker. But the capitals which show it most definitely are those already so often spoken of as the lily capitals of St. Mark's, of which the northern one is carefully drawn in Plate 9. These capitals, called barbarous by our architects, are without exception the most subtle pieces of composition in broad contour which I have ever met with in architecture. Their profile is given in the opposite Plate 10, Figure 3b. The inner line of the figure being that of the stone behind the lily, the outer that of the external network taken through the side of the capital. While figure 3c is the outer profile at its angle, and the reader will easily understand that the passing of the one of these lines into the other is productive of the most exquisite and wonderful series of curvatures possible within such compass, no two views of the capital giving the same contour. Upon these profoundly studied outlines, as remarkable for their grace and complexity as the general mass of the capital is for solid strength and proportion to its necessary service, the braided work is wrought with more than usual care, perhaps as suggested by the Marchese Selvatico, with some idea of imitating those nets of checkerwork and wreaths of chainwork on the chapters of Solomon's Temple, which are, I suppose, the first instances on record of ornamentation of this kind thus applied. The braided work encloses on each of the four sides of the capital a flower whose form, derived from that of the lily, though as usual modified, in every instance of its occurrence, in some minor particulars, is generally seen as represented in figure 11 of plate 8. It is never without the two square or oblong objects at the extremity of the tendrils issuing from its root, set like vessels to catch the dew from the points of its leaves, but I do not understand their meaning. The abacus of the capital has already been given at A, plate 16, volume 1, but no amount of illustrations or eulogium would be enough to make the reader understand the perfect beauty of the thing itself, as the sun steals from interstice to interstice of its marble veil, and touches with the white luster of its rays at midday the pointed leaves of its thirsty lilies. In all the capitals heretofore spoken of, the form of the head of the bell has been square, and its varieties of outline have been obtained in the transition from the square of the abacus to the circular outline of the shafts. A far more complex series of forms results from the division of the bell by recesses into separate lobes or leaves, like those of a rose or tulip, which are each in their turn covered with flower work or hollowed into reticulation. The example figure 10, plate 7, from St. Mark's will give some idea of the simplest of these conditions. 
perhaps the most exquisite in Venice on the whole, is the central capital of the upper arcade of the Fondaco de Turchi. Such are the principal generic conditions of the Byzantine capital. But the reader must always remember that the examples given are single instances, and those are not the most beautiful, but the most intelligible, chosen out of thousands. The designs of the capitals of St. Mark's alone would form a volume. Of the archivolts which these capitals generally sustain, details are given in the appendix and in the notice of Venetian doors in chapter 7. In the private palaces, the ranges of archivolt are, for the most part, very simple, with dentilled moldings, and all the ornamental effect is entrusted to pieces of sculpture set in the wall above or between the arches, in the manner shown in plate 15, below, chapter 7. These pieces of sculpture are either crosses, upright oblongs, or circles. Of all the three forms, an example is given in plate 11, opposite. The cross was apparently an invariable ornament, placed either in the center of the arch vault of the doorway, or in the center of the first story above the windows. On each side of it, the circular and oblong ornaments were used in various alternation. In too many instances, the wall marbles have been torn away from the earliest Byzantine palaces, so that the crosses are left on their archivolts only. The best examples of the cross set above the windows are found in the houses of the transitional period, one in the Campo Santa Montana Formosa, another in which a cross is placed between every window is still well preserved in the Campo Santa Maria Mater Domini, another on the Grand Canal in the Parish of the Apostoli has two crosses, one on each side of the first story, and a bas-relief of Christ enthroned in the center. And finally, that form in which the larger cross in the plate was taken in the house once belonged to Marco Polo at San Giovanni Grisostomo. This cross, though graceful and rich, and given because it happens to be one of the best preserved, is uncharacteristic in one respect. For, instead of the central rows at the meeting of the arms, we usually find a hand raised in the attitude of blessing between the sun and moon, as in the two smaller crosses seen in the plate. In nearly all representations of the crucifixion over the whole of Europe at the period in question, the sun and moon are introduced one on each side of the cross, the sun generally in paintings as a red star, but I do not think with any purpose of indicating the darkness at the time of agony especially because, had this been the intention, the moon ought not to have been visible, since it could not have been in the heavens during the day at the time of Passover. I believe rather that the two luminaries are set there in order to express the entire dependence of the heavens and the earth upon the work of the redemption. And this view is confirmed by our frequently finding the sun and moon set in the same manner beside the figure of Christ, as in the center of the great archivolt of St. Mark's, or beside the hand signifying benediction without any cross, in some or other early archivolts, while again, not unfrequently, they are absent from the symbol of the cross itself, and its saving power over the whole of creation is indicated only by fresh leaves springing from its foot or doves feeding beside it. And also, in illuminated Bibles, we find the series of pictures representing the creation terminate in the crucifixion, as the work by which all the families of created beings subsist, no less than that in sympathy with which the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. This habit of placing the symbol of the Christian faith in the centers of their palaces was, as I above said, universal in early Venice. It does not cease till about the middle of the 14th century. The other sculptures, which were set above or between the arches, consist 
almost invariably of groups of birds or beasts, either standing opposite to each other with a small pillar or spray of leafage between them, or else tearing and devouring each other. The multitude of these sculptures, especially of the small ones enclosed in circles, as in figures 5 and 6, plate 11, which are now scattered through the city of Venice, is enormous, but they are seldom to be seen in their original positions. When the Byzantine palaces were destroyed, these fragments were generally preserved and inserted again in the walls of the new buildings, with more or less attempt at symmetry, fragments of friezes and mouldings being often used in the same manner, so that the mode of their original employment can only be seen in St. Mark's, the Fondaco de Turchi, Braided House, and one or two others. The most remarkable point about them is that the groups of beasts or birds on each side of the small pillars bear the closest possible resemblance to the group of lions over the gate of Mycenae. And the whole of the ornamentation of that gate, as far as I can judge of it from drawings, is so like Byzantine sculpture that I cannot help sometimes suspecting the original conjecture of the French antiquarians that it was a work of Middle Ages, to be not altogether indefensible. By far the best among the sculptures at Venice are those consisting of groups thus arranged. The first figure, in Plate Eleven is one of those used on St. Mark's, and with its chain of wreathen work round it, is very characteristic of the finest kind except that the immediate trunk or pillar often branches into luxuriant leafage, usually of the vine, so that the whole ornament seems almost composed from the words of Ezekiel. A great eagle with great wings, long-winged, full of feathers, which had diverse colors, came into Lebanon and took the highest branch of the cedar. He cropped off the top of his young twigs, and carried it into a city of traffic. He set it in a city of merchants. He took also of the seed of the land, then it grew, and became a spreading vine of low stature, whose branches turned towards him, and the roots thereof were under him. The groups of contending and devouring animals are always much ruder in cutting, and take somewhat the place in Byzantine sculpture which the lower grotesques do in the Gothic. True, though clumsy, grotesques being sometimes mingled among them as four bodies joined to one head in the center, but never showing any attempt at variety of invention, except only in the effective disposition of the light and shade, and in the vigor and thoughtfulness of the touches which indicate the plumes of the birds or foldings of the leaves. Care, however, is always taken to secure variety enough to keep the eye entertained, no two sides of these Byzantine ornaments being in all respects the same. For instance, in the chain work round the first figure in plate 11, there are two circles enclosing squares on the left-hand side of the arch at the top, but two smaller circles and a diamond on the other, enclosing one square and two small circular spots or bosses. And in the line of chain at the bottom there is a circle on the right and a diamond on the left, and so down to the working of the smallest details. I have represented this upper sculpture as dark, in order to give some idea of the general effect of these ornaments when seen in shadow against light, an effect much calculated upon by the designer and obtained by the use of a golden ground formed of glass mosaic inserted into the hollows of the marble. Each square of glass has the leaf gold upon its surface protected by another thin film of glass above it, so that no time or weather can affect its luster, until the pieces of glass are bodily torn from their setting. The smooth, glazed surface of the golden ground is washed by every shower of rain, but the marble usually darkens into an amber color in process of time. And when the whole ornament is cast into shadow, the golden surface, being perfectly reflective, refuses the darkness 
and shows itself in bright and burnished light behind the dark traceries of the ornament. Where the marble has retained its perfect whiteness, on the other hand, and is seen in sunshine, it is shown as a snowy tracery on a golden ground, and the alternations and intermingling of these two effects form one of the chief enchantments of Byzantine ornamentation. How far the system of grounding with gold in color, universal in St. Mark's, was carried out in the sculptures of the private palaces, it is now impossible to say. The wrecks of them which remain, as above noticed, show few of their ornamental sculptures in their original position. And from those marbles which were employed in succeeding buildings during the Gothic period, the fragments of their mosaic grounds would naturally rather have been removed than restored. Mosaic, while the most secure of all decorations, if carefully watched and refastened when it loosens, may, if neglected and exposed to weather, in process of time disappear so as to leave no vestige of its existence. However this may have been, the assured facts are that both the shafts of the pillars and the facing of the old building were of veined or variously colored marble. The capitals and sculptures were either, as they now appear, of pure white marble, relieved upon the veined ground, or, which is infinitely the more probable, grounded in the richer palaces with mosaic of gold, in the inferior ones with blue color, and only the leaves and edges of the sculpture gilded. These brighter hues were opposed by bands of deeper color, generally alternate russet and green, in the archivolts, bands which still remain in the Casa Loredan and Fondaco de Torquay, and in a house in the Corte del Remer near the Rialto, as well as in St. Mark's, and by circular discs of green serpentine and porphyry, which, together with the circular sculptures, appear to have been an ornament peculiarly grateful to the Eastern mind, derived probably, in the first instance, from the suspension of shields upon the wall, as in the majesty of ancient Tyre. The men of Arvid, with thine army, were upon thy walls round about, and Gamadans were in thy towers. They hang their shields upon thy walls round about, they have made thy beauty perfect. The sweet and solemn harmony of purple with various green, the same, by the way, to which the hills of Scotland owe their best loveliness, remained a favorite court of color with the Venetians, and was constantly used even in the later palaces, but never could have been seen in so great perfection as when opposed to the pale and delicate sculpture of the Byzantine time. Such, then, was that first and fairest Venice, which rose out of the barrenness of the lagoon and the sorrow of her people, a city of graceful arcades and gleaming walls, veined with azure and warm with gold, and fretted with white sculpture like frost upon forest branches turned to marble. And yet in this beauty of her youth she was no city of thoughtless pleasure, there is still a sadness of heart upon her, and a depth of devotion in which lay all her strength. I do not insist upon the probable religious signification of many of the sculptures which are now difficult of interpretation, but the temper which made the cross the principal ornament of every building is not to be misunderstood, nor can we fail to perceive in many of the minor sculptural subjects meanings perfectly familiar to the mind of early Christianity. The peacock, used in preference to every other bird, is the well-known symbol of the resurrection, and when drinking from a fountain, plate 11, figure 1, or from a font, plate 11, figure 5, is, I doubt not, also a type of the new life received in faithful baptism. The vine, used in preference to all other trees, was equally recognized as, in all cases, a type either of Christ himself or of those who were in a state of visible or professed union with him. 
the dove at its foot represents the coming of the comforter, and even the groups of contending animals had probably a distinct and universally apprehended reference to the powers of evil. But I lay no stress on these more occult meanings. The principal circumstance which marks the seriousness of early Venetian mind is perhaps the last in which the reader would suppose it was traceable, that of love of bright and pure color, which, in a modified form, was afterwards the root of all the triumph of the Venetian schools of painting, but which, in its utmost simplicity, was characteristic of the Byzantine period only, and of which, therefore, in the close of our review of that period, it will be well that we should truly estimate the significance. The fact is, we none of us enough appreciate the nobleness and sacredness of color. Nothing is more common than to hear it spoken of as a subordinate beauty, nay, even as the mere source of a sensual pleasure, and we might almost believe that we were daily among men who could strip for aught the prospect yields to them their verdure from the fields, and take the radiance from the clouds with which the sun is setting shrouds. But it is not so. Even expressions are used for the most part in thoughtlessness, and if the speakers would only take the pains to imagine what the world and their own existence would become if the blue were taken from the sky, and the gold from the sunshine, and the verdure from the leaves, and the crimson from the blood, which is the life of man, the flush from the cheek, the darkness from the eye, the radiance from the hair. If they could but see for an instant white human creatures living in a white world, they would soon feel what they owe to color. The fact is that of all God's gifts to the sight of man, color is the holiest, the most divine, the most solemn. We speak rashly of gay color and sad color, for color cannot at once be good and gay. All good color is in some degree pensive, and the loveliest is melancholy, and the purest and most thoughtful minds are those which love color the most. I know that this will sound strange in many ears, and will be especially startling to those who have considered the subject chiefly with reference to painting. For the great Venetian schools of color are not usually understood to be either pure or pensive, and the idea of its preeminence is associated in nearly every mind with the coarseness of Rubens and the sensualities of Correggio and Titian. But a more comprehensive view of art will soon correct this impression. It will be discovered, in the first place, that the more faithful and earnest the religion of the painter, the more pure and prevalent is the system of his color. It will be found, in the second place, that where color becomes a primal intention with a painter otherwise mean or sensual, it instantly elevates him and becomes the one sacred and saving element in his work. The very depth of the stoop to which the Venetian painters and Rubens sometimes condescend is a consequence of their feeling confidence in the power of their color to keep them from falling. They hold on by it, as by a chain let down from heaven. With one hand, though they may sometimes seem to gather dust and ashes with the other. And, in the last place, it will be found that so surely as a painter is irreligious, thoughtless, or obscene in disposition, so surely is his coloring cold, gloomy, and valueless. The opposite poles of art in this respect are Fra Angelico and Salvatore Rosa, of whom the one was a man who smiled seldom, wept often, and prayed constantly, and never harbored an impure thought. His pictures are simply so many pieces of jewelry, the colors of the draperies being perfectly pure, as various as those of a painted window, chastened only by paleness and relieved upon a gold ground. Salvatore was a dissipated jester and satirist, a man who spent his life in masking and revelry, but his pictures are full of horror 
and their color is for the most part gloomy gray. Truly, it would seem as if art had so much of eternity in it that it must take its dye from the close rather than the course of life. In such laughter the heart of man is sorrowful, and the end of that mirth is heaviness. These are no singular instances. I know no law more severely without exception than this of the connection of pure color with profound and noble thought. The late Flemish pictures, shallow in conception and obscene in subject, are always sober in color. But the early religious painting of the Flemings is as brilliant in hue as it is holy in thought. The Bellinis, Franches, Perugias, painted in crimson and blue and gold, the Caracci's, Guidos, and Rembrandt's in brown and gray. The builders of our great cathedrals veil their casements and wrap their pillars with one robe of purple splendor. The builders of the luxurious Renaissance left their palaces filled only with cold white light and in the paleness of their native stone. Nor does it seem difficult to discern a noble reason for this universal law. In that heavenly circle, which binds the statutes of color upon the front of the sky, when it became the sign of the covenant of peace, the pure hues of divided light were sanctified to the human heart forever. Nor this, it would seem, by a mere arbitrary appointment, but in consequence of the foreordained and marvelous constitution of those hues into a sevenfold, or more strictly still, a threefold order, typical of the divine nature itself. Observe also the name Shem, or Splendor, given to that son of Noah in whom this covenant with mankind was to be fulfilled and see how that name was justified by every one of the Asiatic races which descended from him. Not without meaning was the love of Israel to his chosen son expressed by the coat of many colors. Not without deep sense of the sacredness of that symbol of purity did the lost daughter of David tear it from her breast. With such robes were the king's daughters that were virgins apparelled. We know it to have been by divine command that the Israelite, rescued from servitude, veiled the tabernacle with its rain of purple and scarlet, while the under sunshine flashed through the fall of the color from its tenons of gold. But was it less by divine guidance that the mead, as he struggled out of anarchy, encompassed his king with the sevenfold burning of the battlements of Ekbatana, of which one circle was golden like the sun, and another silver like the moon. And then came the great sacred cord of color, blue, purple, and scarlet, and then a circle white like the day, and another dark like night, so that the city rose like a great mural rainbow a sign of peace amidst the contending of lawless races and guarded with color and shadow that seem to symbolize the great order which rules over day and night and time, the first organization of the mighty statutes, the law of the Medes and Persians that altereth not. Let us not dream that it is owing to the accidents of tradition or education that those races possess the supremacy over color which has always been felt, though but lately acknowledged among men. However their dominion might be broken, their virtue extinguished, or their religion defiled, they retain alike the instinct and the power, the instinct which made even their idolatry more glorious than that of others bursting forth in fire-worship from pyramid, cave, and mountain, taking the stars for the rulers of its fortune and the sun for the god of its life. The power which so dazzled and subdued the rough crusader into forgetfulness of sorrow and of shame that Europe put on the splendor which she had learnt of the Saracen as her sackcloth of mourning for what she suffered from his sword. 
the power which she confesses to this day in the utmost thoughtlessness of her pride or her beauty as it treads the costly carpet or veils itself with a variegated cashmere and in the emulation of the concourse of her workmen who but a few months back perceived or at least admitted for the first time the preeminence which has been determined from the birth of mankind and on whose charter nature herself has set a mysterious seal granting to the western races descended from that son of noah whose name was extension the treasures of the sullen rock and stubborn ore and gnarled forest which were to accomplish their destiny across all distance of earth and depth of sea while she matured the jewel in the sand and rounded the pearl in the shell to adorn the diadem of him whose name was splendor and observe further how in the oriental mind a peculiar seriousness is associated with this attribute of the love of color a seriousness rising out of repose and out of the depth and breadth of the imagination as contrasted with the activity and consequent capability of surprise and of laughter characteristic of the western mind as a man on a journey must look to his steps always and view things narrowly and quickly while one at rest may command a wider view though an unchanging one from which the pleasure he receives must be one of contemplation rather than of amusement or surprise wherever the pure oriental spirit manifests itself definitely i believe its work is serious and the meeting of the influences of the eastern and western races is perhaps marked in europe more by the dying away of the grotesque laughter of the goth than by any other sign i shall have more to say on this head in other places of this volume but the point i wish at present to impress upon the reader is that the bright hues of the early architecture of venice were no sign of gaiety of heart and that the investiture with the mantle of many colors by which she is known above all other cities of italy and of europe was not granted to her in the fever of her festivity but in the solemnity of her early and earnest religion she became in after times the revel of the earth the mask of italy and therefore is she now desolate but her glorious robe of gold and purple was given her when she first rose a vestal from the sea not when she became drunk with the wine of her fornication and we have never yet looked with enough reverence upon the separate gift which was thus bestowed upon her we have never enough considered what an inheritance she has left us in the works of those mighty painters who were the chief of her children that inheritance is indeed less than it ought to have been and other than it ought to have been for before titian and tintoret arose the men in whom her work and her glory should have been together consummated she had already ceased to lead her sons in the way of truth and life and they erred much and fell short of that which was appointed for them there is no subject of thought more melancholy more wonderful than the way in which god permits so often his best gifts to be trodden under foot of men his richest treasures to be wasted by the moth and the mightiest influences of his spirit given but once in the world's history to be quenched and shortened by miseries of chance and guilt i do not wonder at what men suffer but i wonder often at what they lose we may see how good rises out of pain and evil but the dead naked eyeless loss what good comes of that the fruit struck to the earth before its ripeness the glowing life in goodly purpose dissolved away in sudden death the words half spoken choked upon the lips with clay forever or stranger than all the whole majesty of humanity raised to its fullness in every gift and power necessary for a given purpose at a given moment centered in one man 
and all this perfected blessing permitted to be refused, perverted, crushed, cast aside by those who need it most. The city which is not set on a hill, the candle that giveth light to none that are in the house. These are the heaviest mysteries of this strange world, and it seems to me those which mark its curse the most. And it is true that the power with which this Venice had been entrusted was perverted, when at its highest, in a thousand miserable ways, still it was possessed by her alone. To her all hearts have turned, which could be moved by its manifestation, and none without being made stronger and nobler by what her hand had wrought. That mighty landscape of dark mountains that guard the horizon with their purple towers and solemn forests, that gather their weight of leaves bronzed with sunshine, not with age, into those gloomy masses fixed in heaven, which storm and frost have no power no more to shake or shed. That mighty humanity, so perfect and so proud, that hides no weakness beneath the mantle, and gains no greatness from the diadem. The majesty of thoughtful form, on which the dust of gold and flame of jewels are dashed as the sea spray upon the rock, and still the great manhood seems to stand bare against the blue sky. That mighty mythology, which fills the daily walks of men with spiritual companionship, and beholds the protecting angels break with their burning presence through the arrow flights of battle. Measure the compass of that field of creation. Weigh the value of the inheritance that Venice thus left to the nations of Europe, and then judge if so vast, so beneficent a power could indeed have been rooted in dissipation or decay. It was when she wore the ephod of the priest not the motley of the masker, that the fire fell upon her from heaven, and she saw the first rays of it through the rain of her own tears, when, as the barbaric deluge ebbed from the hills of Italy, the circuit of her palaces and the orb of her fortunes rose together like the iris painted upon the cloud. End of chapter 5, part 2 Reading by Malone Chapter 6, Part 1 Of The Stones of Venice, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion The Stones of Venice, Volume 2, by John Ruskin The Nature of Gothic, Part 1 If the reader will look back to the division of our subject which was made in the first chapter of the first volume, he will find that we are now about to enter upon the examination of that school of Venetian architecture which forms an intermediate step between the Byzantine and Gothic forms, but which I find may be conveniently considered in its connection with the latter style. In order that we may discern the tendency of each step of this change, it will be wise in the outset to endeavour to form some general idea of its final result. We know already what the Byzantine architecture is from which the transition was made, but we ought to know something of the Gothic architecture into which it led. I shall endeavour, therefore, to give the reader in this chapter an idea, at once broad and definite, of the true nature of Gothic architecture, properly so called, not of that of Venice only, but of universal Gothic, for it will be one of the most interesting parts of our subsequent inquiry, to find out how far Venetian architecture reached the universal or perfect type of Gothic, and how far it either fell short of it, or assumed foreign and independent forms. The principal difficulty in doing this arises from the fact that every building of the Gothic period differs in some important respect from every other, and many include features which, if they occurred in other buildings, would not be considered Gothic at all, 
so that all we have to reason upon is merely, if I may be allowed so to express it, a greater or less degree of gothicness in each building we examine. And it is this gothicness, the character which, according as it is found more or less in a building, makes it more or less gothic, of which I want to define the nature, and I feel the same kind of difficulty in doing so which would be encountered by any one who undertook to explain, for instance, the nature of redness, without any actual red thing to point to, but only orange and purple things. Suppose he had only a piece of heather and a dead oak leaf to do it with. He might say, the colour which is mixed with the yellow in this oak leaf and with the blue in this heather would be red if you had it separate. But it would be difficult, nevertheless, to make the abstraction perfectly intelligible. And it is so in a far greater degree to make the abstraction of the Gothic character intelligible, because that character itself is made up of many mingled ideas, and can consist only in their union. That is to say, pointed arches do not constitute Gothic, nor vaulted roofs, nor flying buttresses, nor grotesque sculptures. But all or some of these things, and many other things with them, when they come together so as to have life. Observe also that, in the definition proposed, I shall only endeavour to analyse the idea which I suppose already to exist in the reader's mind. We all have some notion, most of us a very determined one, of the meaning of the term Gothic. But I know that many persons have this idea in their minds without being able to define it. That is to say, understanding generally that Westminster Abbey is Gothic and St. Paul's is not that Strasbourg Cathedral is Gothic and St. Peter's is not. They have, nevertheless, no clear notion of what it is that they recognise in the one or miss in the other, such as would enable them to say how far the work at Westminster or Strasbourg is good and pure of its kind, still less to say of any nondescript building, like St. James's Palace or Windsor Castle, how much right Gothic element there is in it and how much wanting and I believe this inquiry to be a pleasant and profitable one, and that there will be found something more than usually interesting in tracing out this grey, shadowy, many pinnacled image of the Gothic spirit within us, and discerning what fellowship there is between it and our northern hearts. And if, at any point of the inquiry, I should interfere with any of the reader's previously formed conceptions, and use the term Gothic in any sense which he would not willingly attach to it, I do not ask him to accept, but only to examine and understand my interpretation, as necessary to the intelligibility of what follows in the rest of the work. We have, then, the Gothic character submitted to our analysis, just as the rough mineral is submitted to that of the chemist, entangled with many other foreign substances, itself perhaps in no place pure, or ever to be obtained or seen in purity for more than an instant, but nevertheless a thing of definite and separate nature, however inextricable or confused in appearance. Now observe, the chemist defines his mineral by two separate kinds of character, one external, its crystalline form, hardness, luster, etc., the other internal, the proportions and nature of its constituent atoms, Exactly in the same manner, we shall find that Gothic architecture has external forms and internal elements. Its elements are certain mental tendencies of the builders, legibly expressed in it as fancifulness, love of variety, love of richness, and many others. Its external forms are pointed arches, vaulted roofs, etc. And unless both the elements and the forms are there, we have no right to call the style Gothic. It is not enough that it has the form, if it have not also the power and life. It is not enough that it has the power, if it have not the form. We must therefore inquire into each of these characters successively, and determine first what is the mental expression, and secondly what is the material form of Gothic architecture properly so called. First, mental power or expression. What characters have we to discover did the Gothic builders love, or instinctively express in their work, as distinguished from all other builders? 
let us go back for a moment to our chemistry and note that in defining a mineral by its constituent parts it is not one nor another of them that can make up the mineral but the union of all for instance it is neither in charcoal nor in oxygen nor in lime that there is the making of chalk but in the combination of all three in certain measures they are all found in very different things from chalk and there is nothing like chalk either in charcoal or in oxygen but they are nevertheless necessary to its existence so in the various mental characters which make up the soul of gothic it is not one nor another that produces it but their union in certain measures each one of them is found in many other architectures besides gothic but gothic cannot exist where they are not found or at least where their place is not in some way supplied only there is in this great difference between the composition of the mineral and of the architectural style that if we withdraw one of its elements from the stone its form is utterly changed and its existence as such and such a mineral is destroyed but if we withdraw one of its mental elements from the gothic style it is only a little less gothic than it was before and the union of two or three of its elements is enough already to bestow a certain gothicness of character which gains in intensity as we add the others and loses as we again withdraw them i believe then that the characteristic or moral elements of gothic are the following placed in the order of their importance one savageness two changefulness three naturalism four grotesqueness five rigidity six redundance these characters are here expressed as belonging to the building as belonging to the builder they would be expressed thus one savageness or rudeness two love of change three love of nature four disturbed imagination five obstinacy six generosity and I repeat that the withdrawal of any one or any two will not at once destroy the Gothic character of a building, but the removal of a majority of them will. I shall proceed to examine them in their order. 1. Savageness. I am not sure when the word Gothic was first generically applied to the architecture of the North, but I presume that, whatever the date of its original usage, it was intended to apply reproach and express the barbaric character of the nations among whom that architecture arose it never implied that they were literally of gothic lineage far less that their architecture had been originally invented by the goths themselves but it did imply that they and their buildings together exhibited a degree of sternness and rudeness which in contradiction to the character of southern and eastern nations appeared like a perpetual reflection of the contrast between the goth and the roman in their first encounter and when that fallen roman in the utmost impotence of his luxury and insolence of his guilt became the model for the imitation of civilized europe at the close of the so-called dark ages the word gothic became a term of unmitigated contempt not unmixed with aversion from that contempt by the exertion of the antiquaries and architects of this century gothic architecture has been sufficiently vindicated and perhaps some among us in our admiration of the magnificent science of its structure and sacredness of its expression might desire that the term of ancient reproach should be withdrawn and some other of more apparent honourableness adopted in its place there is no chance as there is no need of such a substitution as far as the epithet was used scornfully it was used falsely but there is no reproach in the word rightly understood on the contrary there is a profound truth which the instinct of mankind almost unconsciously recognizes it is true greatly and deeply true that the architecture of the north is rude and wild but it is not true that for this reason we are to condemn it or despise far otherwise i believe it is in this very character that it deserves our profoundest reverence the charts of the world which have been drawn up by modern science have thrown into a narrow space the expression of a vast amount of knowledge 
but I have never yet seen any one pictorial enough to enable the spectator to imagine the kind of contrast in physical character which exists between northern and southern countries. We know the differences in detail, but we have not that broad glance and grasp which would enable us to feel them in their fullness. We know that gentians grow on the Alps and olives on the Apennines, but we do not enough conceive for ourselves that variegated mosaic of the world's surface which a bird sees in its migration, that difference between the district of the gentian and of the olive which the stork and swallow see far off as they lean upon the Sirocco wind. Let us, for a moment, try to raise ourselves even above the level of their flight, and imagine the Mediterranean lying beneath us like an irregular lake, and all its ancient promontories sleeping in the sun, here and there an angry spot of thunder, a grey stain of storm moving upon the burning field, and here and there a fixed wreath of white volcano smoke, surrounded by its circle of ashes, but for the most part a great peacefulness of light. Syria and Greece, Italy and Spain, laid like pieces of a golden pavement into the sea blue, chased, as we stoop nearer to them, with bossy beaten work of mountain chains, and glowing softly with terraced gardens, and flowers heavy with frankincense, mixed among masses of laurel, and orange and plumy palm, that abate with their grey-green shadows the burning of the marble rocks, and of the ledges of the porphyry sloping under lucent sand. Then let us pass farther towards the north, until we see the orient colours change gradually into a vast belt of rainy green, where the pastures of Switzerland, and the popular valleys of France, and the dark forests of the Danube and the Carpathians stretch from the mouths of the Loire to those of the Volga, seen through clefts in grey swirls of rain-cloud, and flaky veils of the mists of the brooks, spreading low along the pasture-lands, and then, farther north still, to see the earth heave into mighty masses of leaden rock and heathy moor, bordering with a broad waste of gloomy purple that belt of field and wood, and splintering into irregular and grisly islands amidst the northern seas, beaten by storm and chilled by ice drift, and tormented by furious pulses of contending tide, until the roots of the last forests fail from among the hill ravines, and the hunger of the north wind bites their peaks into barrenness, and at last the wall of ice, durable like iron, sets, death-like, its white teeth against us out of the polar twilight. And having once traversed in thought its gradation of the zoned iris of the earth in all its material vastness, let us go down nearer to it, and watch the parallel change in the belt of animal life, the multitudes of swift and brilliant creatures that glance in the air and sea, or tread the sands of the southern zone, striped zebras and spotted leopards, glistening serpents, and birds arrayed in purple and scarlet. Let us contrast their delicacy and brilliancy of colour and swiftness of motion with the frost-cramped strength and shaggy covering and dusky plumage of the northern tribes. Contrast the Arabian horse with the Shetland, the tiger and leopard with the wolf and bear, the antelope with the elk, the bird of paradise with the osprey, and then, submissively acknowledging the great laws by which the earth and all that it bears are ruled throughout their being, let us not condemn, but rejoice at the expression by man of his own rest in the statutes of the lands that gave him birth. Let us watch him with reverence as he sets side by side the burning gems and smooths with soft sculpture the jasper pillars that are to reflect a ceaseless sunshine and rise into a cloudless sky. But not with less reverence let us stand by him when, with rough strength and hurried stroke, he smites an uncouth animation out of the rocks which he has torn from among the moss of the moorland and heaves into the darkened air the pile of iron buttress and rugged wall, instinct with the work of an imagination as wild and wayward as the northern sea, creations of ungainly shape and rigid limb, but full of wolfish life, fierce as the winds that beat, and changeful as the clouds that shade them. There is, I repeat, no degradation, no reproach in this, but all dignity and honourableness, and we should err grievously in refusing either to recognise as an essential character of the existing architecture of the North, 
or to admit as a desirable character in that which it yet may be, this wildness of thought and roughness of work, this look of mountain brotherhood between the cathedral and the Alp, this magnificence of sturdy power, put forth only the more energetically because the fine finger-touch was chilled away by the frosty wind, and the eye dimmed by the mauve mist, or blinded by the hail. This outspeaking of the strong spirit of men, who may not gather redundant fruitage from the earth, nor bask in the dreamy benignity of sunshine, but must break the rock for bread, and cleave the forest for fire, and show, even in what they did for their delight, some of the hard habits of the arm and heart that grew on them as they swung the axe or pressed the plough. If, however, the savageness of Gothic architecture, merely as an expression of its origin among northern nations, may be considered, in some sort, a noble character, it possesses a higher nobility still, when considered as an index, not of climate, but of religious principle. In the thirteenth and fourteenth paragraph of chapter twenty-one of the first volume of this work, it was noticed that the systems of architectural ornament, properly so called, might be divided into three. One, servile ornament, in which the execution or power of the inferior workman is entirely subjugated to the intellect of the higher. Two, constitutional ornament, in which the executive inferior power is, to a certain point, emancipated and independent, having a will of its own, yet confessing its inferiority and rendering obedience to higher powers, and three, revolutionary ornament, in which no executive inferiority is admitted at all. I must here explain the nature of these divisions at somewhat greater length. Of servile ornament, the principal schools are the Greek, Ninevite, and Egyptian, but their servility is of different kinds. The Greek master workman was far advanced in knowledge and power above the Assyrian or Egyptian. Neither he nor those for whom he worked could endure the appearance of imperfection in anything, and, therefore, what ornament he appointed to be done by those beneath him was composed of mere geometrical forms, balls, ridges, and perfectly symmetrical foliage, which could be executed with absolute precision by line and rule, and were as perfect in their way when completed as his own figure sculpture. The Assyrian and Egyptian, on the contrary, less cognizant of accurate form in anything, were content to allow their figure sculpture to be executed by inferior workmen, but lowered the method of its treatment to a standard which every workman could reach, and then trained him by discipline so rigid that there was no chance of his falling beneath the standard appointed. The Greek gave to the lower workman no subject which he could not perfectly execute. The Assyrian gave him subjects which he could only execute imperfectly, but fixed a legal standard for his imperfection. The workman was, in both systems, a slave. But in the medieval, or especially Christian, system of ornament, this slavery is done away with altogether. Christianity having recognized, in small things as well as great, the individual value of every soul. But it not only recognizes its value, it confesses its imperfection, in only bestowing dignity upon the acknowledgement of unworthiness. The admission of lost power and fallen nature, which the Greek or Ninevite felt to be intensely painful, and, as far as might be, altogether refused, the Christian makes daily and hourly, contemplating the fact of it without fear, as tending, in the end, to God's greater glory. Therefore, to every spirit which Christianity summons to her service, her exhortation is, Do what you can, and confess frankly what you are unable to do. Neither let your effort be shortened for fear of failure, nor your confession silenced for fear of shame. And it is, perhaps, the principal admirableness of the Gothic schools of architecture, that they thus receive the results of the labour of inferior minds, and out of fragments full of imperfection, and betraying that imperfection in every touch, indulgently raise up a stately and unaccusable whole. But the modern English mind has this much in common with that of the Greek, that it intensely desires, in all things, the utmost completion or perfection compatible with their nature. 
This is a noble character in the abstract, but becomes ignoble when it causes us to forget the relative dignities of that nature itself and to prefer the perfectness of the lower nature to the imperfection of the higher, not considering that as judged by such a rule, all the brute animals would be preferable to man, because more perfect in their functions and kind, and yet are always held inferior to him. So also in the works of man, those which are more perfect in their kind are always inferior to those which are, in their nature, liable to more faults and shortcomings. For the finer the nature, the more flaws it will show through the clearness of it, and it is a law of the universe, that the best things shall seldomest be seen in their best form. The wild grass grows well and strongly, one year with another, but the wheat is, according to the greater nobleness of its nature, liable to the bitterer blight. And therefore, while in all things that we see or do, we are to desire for perfection and strive for it, we are nevertheless not to set the meaner thing in its narrow accomplishment above the nobler thing in its mighty progress, not to esteem smooth minuteness above shattered majesty, not to prefer mean victory to honourable defeat, not to lower the level of our aim that we may the more surely enjoy the complacency of success. But above all, in our dealings with the souls of other men, we are to take care how we check, by severe requirement or narrow caution, efforts which might otherwise lead to a noble issue, and, still more, how we withhold our admiration from great excellences, because they are mingled with rough faults. Now, in the make and nature of every man, however rude or simple, whom we employ in manual labour, there are some powers for better things, some tardy imagination, torpid capacity of emotion, tottering steps of thought, there are, even at the worst, and in most cases it is all our own fault that they are tardy or torpid, but they cannot be strengthened unless we are content to take them in their feebleness, and unless we prize and honour them in their imperfection above the best and most perfect manual skill. And this is what we have to do with all our labourers, to look for the thoughtful part of them, and get that out of them, whatever we lose for it, whatever faults and errors we are obliged to take with it. For the best that is in them cannot manifest itself but in company with much error. Understand this clearly. You can teach a man to draw a straight line and to cut one, to strike a curved line and to carve it, and to copy and carve any number of given lines or forms with admirable speed and perfect precision, and you find his work perfect of its kind. But if you ask him to think about any of those forms, to consider if he cannot find any better in his own head, he stops, his execution becomes hesitating, he thinks, and ten to one he thinks wrong, ten to one he makes a mistake in the first touch he gives to his work as a thinking being but you have made a man of him for all that. He was only a machine before, an animated tool. And observe, you are put to stern choice in this matter. You must either make a tool of the creature or a man of him. You cannot make both. Men were not intended to work with the accuracy of tools, be precise and perfect in all their actions. If you will have that precision out of them, and make their figures measure degrees like cogwheels, and their arms strike curves like compasses, you must unhumanize them. All the energy of their spirits must be given to make cogs and compasses of themselves. All their attention and strength must go to the accomplishment of the mean act. The eye of the soul must be bent upon the finger point and the soul's force must fill all the invisible nerves that guide it, ten hours a day, that it may not err from its steely precision, and so soul and sight be worn away, and the whole human being be lost at last, a heap of sawdust, so far as its intellectual work in this world is concerned, saved only by its heart, which cannot go into the form of cogs and compasses, but expands, after the ten hours are over, into fireside humanity. 
On the other hand, if you will make a man of the working creature, you cannot make at all. Let him but begin to imagine, to think, to try and do anything worth doing, and the engine turned precision is lost at once. Out come his roughness, all his dullness, all his incapability. Shame upon shame, failure upon failure, pause after pause. But out comes the whole majesty of him also. And we know the height of it only, when we see the clouds settling upon him. And whether the clouds be bright or dark, there will be transfiguration behind and within them. End of section 12 Chapter 6, Part 2 of The Stones of Venice, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion The Stones of Venice, Volume 2 by John Ruskin The Nature of Gothic, Part 2 And now, reader, look round this English room of yours, about which you have been proud so often, because the work of it was so good and strong, and the ornaments of it so finished. Examine again all those accurate mouldings, and perfect polishings, and unerring adjustments of the seasoned wood and tempered steel. Many a time you have exulted over them, and thought how great England was, because her slightest work was done so thoroughly. Alas, if read rightly, these perfectnesses are signs of a slavery in our England a thousand times more bitter and more degrading than that of the scourged African or helot Greek. Men may be beaten, chained, tormented, yoked like cattle, slaughtered like summer flies, and yet remain in one sense, and the best sense, free. But to smother their souls within them, to blight and hew into rotting pollards the suckling branches of their human intelligence, to make the flesh and skin which, after the worm's work on it, is to see God, into leathern thongs to yoke machinery with. This it is to be slave-masters indeed, and there might be more freedom in England, though her feudal lord's lightest words were worth men's lives, and though the blood of the vexed husbandman dropped in the furrows of her fields, than there is while the animation of her multitudes is sent like fuel to feed the factory smoke, and the strength of them is given daily to be wasted into the fineness of a web, or racked into the exactness of a line. And, on the other hand, go forth again to gaze upon the old cathedral front, where you have smiled so often at the fantastic ignorance of the old sculptors. Examine once more those ugly goblins and formless monsters, and stern statues, anatomy-less and rigid. But do not mock at them, for they are signs of the life and liberty of every workman who struck the stone, a freedom of thought and rank in scale of being, such as no laws, no charters, no charities can secure, but which it must be the first aim of all Europe at this day to regain for her children. Let me not be thought to speak wildly or extravagantly. It is verily this degradation of the operative into a machine which, more than any other evil of the times, is leading the mass of the nations everywhere into vain, incoherent, destructive struggling for a freedom of which they cannot explain the nature to themselves. Their universal outcry against wealth and against nobility is not forced from them either by the pressure of famine or the sting of mortified pride. These do much, and have done much in all ages, but the foundations of society were never yet shaken as they are at this day. It is not that men are ill-fed, but that they have no pleasure in the work by which they make their bread, and therefore look to wealth as the only means of pleasure. It is not that men are pained by the scorn of the upper classes, but they cannot endure their own, for they feel that the kind of labour to which they are condemned is verily a degrading one, and makes them less than men. Never had the upper classes so much sympathy with the lower, 
or charity for them as they have at this day and yet never were they so much hated by them for of old the separation between the noble and the poor was merely a wall built by law now it is a veritable difference in level of standing a precipice between upper and lower grounds in the field of humanity and there is pestilential air at the bottom of it i know not if a day is ever to come when the nature of right freedom will be understood and when men will see that to obey another man to labour for him yield reverence to him or to his place is not slavery it is often the best kind of liberty liberty from care the man who says to one go and he goeth and to another come and he cometh has in most cases more sense of restraint and difficulty than the man who obeys him the movements of the one are hindered by the burden on his shoulder of the other by the bridle on his lips there is no way by which the burden may be lightened but we need not suffer from the bridle if we do not champ at it to yield reverence to another to hold ourselves and our lives at his disposal is not slavery often it is the noblest state in which a man can live in this world there is indeed a reverence which is servile that is to say irrational or selfish but there is also noble reverence that is to say reasonable and loving and a man is never so noble as when he is reverent in this kind nay even if the feeling pass the bounds of mere reason so that it be loving a man is raised by it which had in reality most of the serf nature in him the irish peasant who was lying in wait yesterday for his landlord with his musket muzzle thrust through the ragged hedge or that old mountain servant who two hundred years ago at invercathing gave up his own life and the lives of his seven sons for his chief and as each fell calling forth his brother to the death another for hector and therefore in all ages and all countries reverence has been paid and sacrifice made by men to each other not only without complaint but rejoicingly and famine and peril and sword and all evil and all shame have been borne willingly in the causes of masters and kings for all these gifts of the heart ennobled the men who gave not less than the men who received them and nature prompted and god rewarded the sacrifice but to feel their souls withering within them unthanked to find their whole being sunk into an unrecognized abyss to be counted off into a heap of mechanism numbered with its wheels and weighed with its hammer strokes this nature bade not this god blesses not this humanity for no long time is able to endure we have much studied and much perfected of late the great civilized invention of the division of labor only we give it a false name it is not truly speaking the labor that is divided but the men divided into mere segments of men broken into small fragments and crumbs of life so that all the little piece of intelligence that is left in a man is not enough to make a pin or a nail but exhausts itself in making the point of a pin or the head of a nail now it is a good and desirable thing truly to make many pins in a day but if we could only see with what crystal sand their points were polished sand of human soul much to be magnified before it can be discerned for what it is we should think there might be some loss in it also and the great cry that rises from all our manufacturing cities louder than their furnace blast is all in very deed for this that we manufacture everything there except men. We blanch cotton and strengthen steel and refine sugar and shape pottery, but to brighten, to strengthen, to refine or to form a single living spirit never enters into our estimate of advantages. And all the evil to which that cry is urging our myriads can be met only in one way, not by teaching nor preaching, for to teach them is but to show them their misery and to preach to them, if we do nothing more than preach, is to mock at it. It can be met only by a right understanding, on the part of all classes, of what kinds of labour are good for men, raising them and making them happy, 
by a determined sacrifice of such convenience or beauty or cheapness as is to be got only by the degradation of the workman and by equally determined demand for the products and results of healthy and ennobling labour and how it will be asked are these products to be recognized and this demand to be regulated easily by the observance of three broad and simple rules one never encourage the manufacture of any article not absolutely necessary in the production of which invention has no share two never demand an exact finish for its own sake but only for some practical or noble end three never encourage imitation or copying of any kind except for the sake of preserving record of great works the second of these principles is the only one which directly rises out of the consideration of our immediate subject but i shall briefly explain the meaning and extent of the first also reserving the enforcement of the third for another place one never encourage the manufacture of anything not necessary in the production of which invention has no share for instance glass beads are utterly unnecessary and there is no design or thought employed in their manufacture they are formed by first drawing out the glass into rods these rods are chopped up into fragments of the size of beads by the human hand and the fragments are then rounded in the furnace the men who chop up the rods sit at their work all day their hands vibrating with a perpetual and exquisitely timed palsy and the beads dropping beneath their vibration like hail neither they nor the men who draw out the rods or fuse the fragments have the smallest occasion for the use of any single human faculty and every young lady therefore who buys glass beads is engaged in the slave trade and a much more cruel one than that which we have so long been endeavouring to put down but glass cups and vessels may become the subjects of exquisite invention and if in buying these we pay for their invention that is to say for the beautiful form or colour or engraving and not for mere finish of execution we are doing good to humanity so again the cutting of precious stones in all ordinary cases requires little exertion of any mental faculty some tact and judgment in avoiding flaws and so on but nothing to bring out the whole mind every person who wears cut jewels merely for the sake of their value is therefore a slave driver but the working of the goldsmith and the various designing of grouped jewellery and enamel work may become the subject of the most noble human intelligence therefore money spent in the purchase of well-designed plate of precious engraved vases cameos or enamels does good to humanity and in work of this kind jewels may be employed to heighten its splendour and their cutting is then a price paid for the attainment of a noble end and thus perfectly allowable i shall perhaps press this law farther elsewhere but our immediate concern is chiefly with the second namely never to demand an exact finish when it does not lead to a noble end for observe i have only dwelt upon the rudeness of gothic or any other kind of imperfectness as admirable where it was impossible to get design or thought without it if you are to have the thought of a rough and untaught man you must have it in a rough and untaught way but from an educated man who can without effort express his thoughts in an educated way take the graceful expression and be thankful only get the thought and do not silence the peasant because he cannot speak good grammar or until you have taught him his grammar grammar and refinement are good things both only be sure of the better thing first and thus in art delicate finish is desirable from the greatest masters and is always given by them in some places michael angelo leonardo phidias perugino turner all finished with the most exquisite care and the finish they give always leads to the fuller accomplishment of their noble purposes but lower men than these cannot finish for it requires consummate knowledge to finish consummately and then we must take their thoughts as they are able to give them so the rule is simple 
always look for invention first, and after that for such execution as will help the invention, and as the inventor is capable of without painful effort, and no more. Above all, demand no refinement of execution where there is no thought, for that is slave's work, unredeemed. Rather choose rough work than smooth work, so only that the practical purpose be answered. And never imagine there is reason to be proud of anything that may be accomplished by patience and sandpaper. I shall only give one example, which however will show the reader what I mean, from the manufacture already alluded to, that of glass. Our modern glass is exquisitely clear in its substance, true in its form, accurate in its cutting. We are proud of this. We ought to be ashamed of it. The old Venice glass was muddy, inaccurate in all its forms, and clumsily cut, if at all. And the old Venetian was justly proud of it. For there is this difference between the English and Venetian workmen, that the former thinks only of accurately matching his patterns, and getting his curves perfectly true and his edges perfectly sharp, and becomes a mere machine for rounding curves and sharpening edges, while the old Venetian cared not a whit whether his edges were sharp or not, but he invented a new design for every glass that he made, and never moulded a handle or a lip without a new fancy in it. And therefore, though some Venetian glass is ugly and clumsy enough, when made by clumsy and uninventive workmen, other Venetian glass is so lovely in its forms that no price is too great for it, and we never see the same form in it twice. Now you cannot have the finish and the varied form too. If the workman is thinking about his edges, he cannot be thinking of his design. If of his design, he cannot think of his edges. Choose whether you will pay for the lovely form or the perfect finish, and choose at the same moment whether you will make the worker a man or a grindstone. Nay, but the reader interrupts me. If the workman can design beautifully, I would not have him kept at the furnace. Let him be taken away and made a gentleman, and have a studio, and design his glass there, and I will have it blown and cut for him by common workmen, so that I will have my design and my finish too. All ideas of this kind are founded upon two mistaken suppositions. The first that one man's thoughts can be, or ought to be, executed by another man's hands. The second, that manual labour is a degradation when it is governed by intellect. On a large scale, and in work determinable by line and rule, it is indeed both possible and necessary that the thoughts of one man should be carried out by the labour of others. In this sense I have already defined the best architecture to be the expression of the mind of manhood by the hands of childhood. But on a smaller scale, and in a design which cannot be mathematically defined, one man's thoughts can never be expressed by another. And the difference between the spirit of touch of the man who is inventing, and of the man who is obeying directions, is often all the difference between a great and a common work of art. How wide the separation is between original and second-hand execution, I shall endeavour to show elsewhere. It is not so much to our purpose here as to mark the other and more fatal error of despising manual labour when governed by intellect, for it is no less fatal an error to despise it when thus regulated by intellect, than to value it for its own sake. We are always in these days endeavouring to separate the two. We want one man to be always thinking, and another to be always working, and we call one a gentleman, and the other an operative. Whereas the workman ought often to be thinking, and the thinker often to be working, and both should be gentlemen, in the best sense. As it is, we make both ungentle, the one envying, the other despising his brother, and the mass of society is made up of morbid thinkers and miserable workers. Now it is only by labour that thought can be made healthy, and only by thought that labour can be made happy and the two cannot be separated with impunity. It would be well if all of us were good handicraftsmen in some kind, and the dishonour of manual labour done away with altogether, 
so that though there should still be a trenchant distinction of race between nobles and commoners, there should not, among the latter, be a trenchant distinction of employment, as between idle and working men, or between men of liberal and illiberal professions. All professions should be liberal, and there should be less pride felt in peculiarity of employment, and more in excellence of achievement. And yet more, in each several profession, no master should be too proud to do its hardest work. The painter should grind his own colours, the architect work in the mason's yard with his men, the master manufacturer be himself a more skilful operative than any man in his mills, and the distinction between one man and another be only in experience and skill, and the authority and wealth which these must naturally and justly obtain. I should be led far from the matter in hand if I were to pursue this interesting subject. Enough, I trust, has been said to show the reader that the rudeness or imperfection which at first rendered the term Gothic one of reproach is indeed, when rightly understood, one of the most noble characters of Christian architecture, and not only a noble, but an essential one. It seems a fantastic paradox, but it is nevertheless a most important truth, that no architecture can be truly noble which is not imperfect, and this is easily demonstrable for since the architect whom we will suppose capable of doing all in perfection cannot execute the whole with his own hands he must either make slaves of his workmen in the old greek and present english fashion and level his work to a slave's capacities which is to degrade it or else he must take his workmen as he finds them and let them show their weaknesses together with their strength which will involve the gothic imperfection but render the whole work as noble as the intellect of the age can make it but the principle may be stated more broadly still i have confined the illustration of it to architecture but i must not leave it as if true of architecture only hitherto i have used the words imperfect and perfect merely to distinguish between work grossly unskilful and work executed with average precision and science and I have been pleading that any degree of unskilfulness should be admitted, so only that the labourer's mind had room for expression. But, accurately speaking, no good work, whatever, can be perfect, and the demand for perfection is always a sign of a misunderstanding of the ends of art. This for two reasons, both based on everlasting laws. The first, that no great man ever stops working till he has reached his point of failure. That is to say, his mind is always far in advance of his powers of execution, and the latter will now and then give way in trying to follow it. Besides that, he will always give to the inferior portions of his work only such inferior attention as they require, and according to his greatness he becomes so accustomed to the feeling of dissatisfaction with the best he can do, that in moments of lassitude or anger with himself he will not care though the beholder be dissatisfied also. I believe there has only been one man who would not acknowledge this necessity, and strove always to reach perfection. Leonardo The end of his vain effort being merely that he would take ten years to a picture and leave it unfinished. And therefore, if we are to have great men working at all, or less men doing their best, the work will be imperfect, however beautiful. Of human work, none but what is bad can be perfect, in its own bad way. The second reason is that imperfection is in some sort essential to all that we know of life. It is the sign of life in a mortal body, that is to say, of a state of progress and change. Nothing that lives is, or can be, rigidly perfect. Part of it is decaying, part nascent. The foxglove blossom, a third part bud, a third part past, a third part in full bloom, is a type of the life of this world. And in all things that live, there are certain irregularities and deficiencies which are not only signs of life, but sources of beauty. No human face is exactly the same in its lines on each side, no leaf perfect in its lobes, no branch in its symmetry. All admit irregularity as they imply change, and to banish imperfection is to destroy expression, to check exertion, to paralyse vitality. 
all things are literally better, lovelier, and more beloved for the imperfections which have been divinely appointed. That the law of human life may be effort, and the law of human judgment, mercy. Accept this, then, for a universal law, that neither architecture nor any other noble work of man can be good unless it be imperfect, and let us be prepared for the otherwise strange fact, which we shall discern clearly as we approach the period of the Renaissance, that the first cause of the fall of the arts of Europe was a relentless requirement of perfection, incapable alike either of being silenced by veneration for greatness, or softened into forgiveness of simplicity. Thus far, then, of the rudeness or savageness, which is the first mental element of Gothic architecture. It is an element in many other healthy architectures also, as in Byzantine and Romanesque, but true Gothic cannot exist without it. The second mental element above named was changefulness, or variety. I have already enforced the allowing independent operation to the inferior workman, simply as a duty to him, and as ennobling the architecture by rendering it more Christian. We have now to consider what reward we obtain for the performance of this duty, namely the perpetual variety of every feature of the building. Whenever the workman is utterly enslaved, the parts of the building must of course be absolutely like each other, for the perfection of his execution can only be reached by exercising him in doing one thing, and giving him nothing else to do. The degree in which the workman is degraded may be thus known at a glance, by observing whether the several parts of the building are similar or not. And if, as in Greek work, all the capitals are alike, and all the mouldings unvaried, then the degradation is complete. If, as in Egyptian or Ninevite work, though the manner of executing certain figures is always the same, the order of design is perpetually varied, the degradation is less total. If, as in Gothic work, there is perpetual change, both in design and execution, the workman must have been altogether set free. How much the beholder gains from the liberty of the labourer may perhaps be questioned in England, where one of the strongest instincts in nearly every mind is that love of order which makes us desire that our house windows should pair like our carriage horses and allows us to yield our faith unhesitatingly to architectural theories which fix a form for everything and forbid variation from it i would not impeach love of order it is one of the most useful elements of the english mind it helps us in our commerce and in all purely practical matters, and it is in many cases one of the foundation stones of morality. Only do not let us suppose that love of order is love of art. It is true that order, in its highest sense, is one of the necessities of art, just as time is a necessity of music. But love of order has no more to do with our right enjoyment of architecture or painting than love of punctuality with the appreciation of an opera. Experience, I fear, teaches us that accurate and methodical habits in daily life are seldom characteristic of those who either quickly perceive or richly possess the creative powers of art. There is, however, nothing inconsistent between the two instincts, and nothing to hinder us from retaining our business habits and yet fully allowing and enjoying the noblest gifts of invention. We already do so in every other branch of art except architecture, and we only do not so there because we have been taught that it would be wrong. Our architects gravely inform us that, as there are four rules of arithmetic, there are five orders of architecture. We, in our simplicity, think that this sounds consistent and believe them. They inform us also that there is one proper form for Corinthian capitals, another for Doric, and another for Ionic. We, considering that there is also a proper form for the letters A, B, and C, think that this also sounds consistent, and accept the proposition. Understanding, therefore, that one form of the said capitals is proper, and no other, 
and having a conscientious horror of all impropriety, we allow the architect to provide us with the said capitals, of the proper form, in such and such a quantity, and in all other points to take care that the legal forms are observed, which, having done, we rest in forced confidence that we are well housed. But our higher instincts are not deceived. We take no pleasure in the building provided for us, resembling that which we take in a new book or a new picture. We may be proud of its size, complacent in its correctness, and happy in its convenience. We may take the same pleasure in its symmetry and workmanship as in a well-ordered room or a skilful piece of manufacture. And this we suppose to be all the pleasure that architecture was ever intended to give us. The idea of reading a building, as we would read Milton or Dante, and getting the same kind of delight out of the stones as out of the stanzas, never enters our minds for a moment. And for good reason. There is indeed rhythm in the verses, quite as strict as the symmetries or rhythm of the architecture, and a thousand times more beautiful. But there is something other than rhythm. The verses were neither made to order nor to match, as the capitals were, and we have therefore a kind of pleasure in them other than a sense of propriety. But it requires a strong effort of common sense to shake ourselves quit of all that we have been taught for the last two centuries, and wake to the perception of a truth just as simple and certain as it is new. That great art, whether expressing itself in words, colours or stones, does not say the same thing over and over again. That the merit of architectural, as of every other art, consists in its saying new and different things that to repeat itself is no more a characteristic of genius in marble than it is of genius in print, and that we may, without offending any laws of good taste, require of an architect, as we do of a novelist, that he should be not only correct, but entertaining. Yet all this is true and self-evident, only hidden from us, as many other self-evident things are, by false teaching. Nothing is a great work of art, for the production of which either rules or models can be given. Exactly so far as architecture works on known rules and from given models, it is not an art, but a manufacture, and it is, of the two procedures, rather less rational, because more easy, to copy capitals or mouldings from Phidias and call ourselves architects, than to copy heads and hands from Titian and call ourselves painters. End of section 13